Good evening, everyone, and welcome along to the VCO Cup of Nations. It's the second edition of this partnership between VCO and Williams Esports. And tonight, it's for the pro racing drivers, the real world drivers that uh, perhaps haven't got quite so much to do during yet another a lockdown of this spoiling uh, and forever pandemic. I hope wherever you are, you're safe and uh, well and enjoying uh, tonight's very interesting action. We're going to have lots of different racing for you uh, with a variety of talents across our grid. Some incredible famous names from the world of motorsport. Uh, all battling and representing their nations. Uh, we'll get into the exact format uh, a little bit to discuss exactly how it will all work out. But a variety of different cars, a variety of different tracks, uh, disciplines evening uh, will be tested for our drivers. Some of the disciplines that perhaps they will never have raced in before. Uh, joining me is uh, Arjuna from Race Spot TV to explain through the whole of tonight's action. And I really, really cannot wait to get the racing started. My name is Ben Constantjuras, part of VCO, and I am very, very honoured to be welcoming you along to this absolutely epic adventure. Uh, as I say, Cup of Nations in its second edition. We saw uh, just five or six months ago now, the first edition with sim racing pros qualifying and then getting a chance to represent their nation. Tonight though, we have picked our pros to represent their nations. Of course, there are some motorsport events going on around the world, which has slightly affected the choices uh, and the participation of some of the people who we would like to have seen. Um, and we still, though, have an incredibly, incredibly impressive lineup for you. Um, so, Arjuna, incredible to have such amazing names uh, and amazing nations all racing out on some of the best tracks and best cars that iRacing can offer. Yeah, it's going to be a really exciting day. We've slimmed it down from the two-day format to just one day. And we've got some of the best real-world drivers ready to head out onto track. Split up into two stages. We've got the group stages and the finals. But first up, it's two road races. First up, it's going to be a very interesting race. We'll get that graphic up on screen for you in just one moment's time. That first race will be the Audi R8 at Spa-Francorchamps. Then our second group race is going to be the Holden V8 Supercar at the Long Beach Circuit. These are short races, just 15 minutes in length, and that all builds up for the pole race. Only the top teams in the group stages, Ben, will advance to that pole race, and that sets the grid order for the finals. All 14 nations will advance to the finals, where three very exciting races will determine the Cup of Nations champion. Absolutely. A little bit of complex format for you uh, but as we go through the evening we'll hopefully try to make it as clear as possible now those listings those combinations between car and track have not actually uh, been public for very long so the drivers haven't had very much of a chance to practice the two combinations they knew the cars they knew the tracks and to be honest when you see IndyCar and you see the Indy 500 Indianapolis Motor Speedway you kind of put two and two together and you know that you're going to race there in an oval situation and you probably can guess the WRX will be raced at hell uh, but for the rest they weren't quite sure the Audi R8 at Spa, uh, Audi R8 at Le Mans and of course the Williams F1 car at Monza. Uh, challenging vehicles especially the Williams F1 car even if these guys have had real Formula 1 experience it's a different beast when you're racing online. Yeah and you know I'm thinking about this you know, event in a very different kind of way. It's not just about the pace from, you know, the drivers that they've shown in the real world, Ben. It's about that adjustment into the sim. And if you ask me, Team USA is going to be the one to watch out for. All three of their drivers have signed up with sim racing organizations as well. Jack Crawford with Altus Esports, Phil Dinez with BS Competition, and of course, Sage Karam with Coanda Sim Sport. They will be the ones to watch out for. Lots of sim experience there but a lot of other drivers that have used the last 12 months to really build that sim experience. Yeah, so let's quickly run through the drivers we've got for you. Um, it, for America then, Sage Caron, Phil Dennis, and Jack Crawford. As you say, a very, very strong lineup. Uh, the top two from each nation will score points. So the third placed driver, or if you have more than uh, two drivers uh, will not score points to make it fair for those teams that only have two drivers. Uh, Spain are represented by four drivers, Danny Yucadella, 
uh, over time has been really impressive across all the different platforms, in fact. Uh, Alex Palou, Alex Alcarez and Miguel Molina are all four of those representing Spain. Then Canada uh, is represented by Daniel Morad, Alex Elis and Robert Wickens, who has, over time, not only had to adjust to sim racing, he's also had to adjust to the very particular uh, setup that he has to be able to control his car, uh, braking effectively with a handbrake and lots of adjustment and sort of technical things going on for Robert to be able to participate at the highest level. Uh, Austria is represented by Thomas Preening and Mirko Bortolotti. Now that's an interesting one because Mirko is definitely an Italian racing driver. Yes, he's had Red Bull sponsorship and yes, he races for Team Grasser. I presume that somewhere along the line he's got an Austrian uh, parentage, but whenever I've ever commented on him, he's very much been Italian and, and used that to an advantage to represent Ferrari for a time in the Ferrari Academy. So that's Team Austria. Team Finland has Jesse Krohn Elias with a 7,000 I rating, so pretty, pretty uh, uh, talented, although he hasn't really shown his true form in the VCO Pro Series that we've had running. Uh, a very strong representation from Switzerland, Raphael Marcello and Louis Delatraz, the virtual 24-hour Le Mans winners. Uh, they are very, very good friends. They help each other when they can on various different uh, racing formats. And they represent Switzerland, just a two. So that means they will always be scoring points. Uh, Team Australia is Matt Campbell and Nick Foster with Bart Horston. Uh, now, Matt Campbell shows very well at tracks that he knows. Tracks that he doesn't know, he definitely struggles. So it'll be interesting to see how he gets on. Um, and then we go to Team GB. Will Stevens, Tom Ingram, Bradley Philpott, and Stefan Wilson. Now, Will Stevens, I would say, is the strongest uh, of that lineup, although Bradley Philpott is a very, very talented sim racer. Uh, so maybe not as talented or not as strong or experienced Tom Ingram and Stefan Wilson, but we have seen uh, them pop into various uh, races over the time and, and had a good. Good fun of things. They've been doing a lot of practice. I've seen their servers up quite a lot this last week on iRacing. So hopefully they've got themselves a good performance. As the checker flag flies uh, for what I think is the end of qualifying, let's quite quickly get through the rest of the entries. Bites Gavissa, female entrant for Team Netherlands, Bent Viskel, Job Van Oetert and Richard Verschaw. Very, very strong uh, lineup for Team Netherlands. Bites is actually very, very good uh, in uh, I racing. So that was the practice session. So we're going to get into qualifying now. Uh, Rubens Barrichello, Pietro Fittipaldi, Tony Canaan Fittipaldi representing Brazil in a way that is effectively motor racing royalty. Uh, if you if you put Bruno Senna in there, you tick every single box. Canaan, a Fittipaldi, a Barrichello. There's actually six representations uh, for Brazil. Two late entries with Eduardo Barrichello, son of, uh, joining and Neto Nascimento, also for Team Brazil. Uh, Ralph Hyman, Callan O'Keefe, and Gennaro Bonafede are for Team South Africa. Gennaro, by the way, is the head of BMW M in South Africa and also a GT3 racer over there. So uh, has raced for Vulcan Horse, I think, uh, in the Kyle Army nine hours. So not necessarily got that strong an eye rating. But sometimes that doesn't matter. Sometimes people are very good. They just doesn't. They just don't do hosted sessions where they actually uh, end up, uh, or official sessions where they end up getting extra I rated. Uh, Mark, uh, Mike, sorry, Mike Rockefeller, Marius Zug, and Jens Klingman represent Germany. Uh, of course, we would have expected to see the likes of Timo Glock in there, but it, uh, unfortunately, uh, he is busy with other things. But Mike Rockefeller was very, very strong when he joined Jimmy Broadbent in the VCO Pro Sim series. Uh, so. He hasn't got huge experience in my racing. He's concentrated a lot on other platforms, but it'll be interesting to see how he gets on. Because he was, as I say, pretty strong when he joined Jimmy a few weeks back. Two more teams then. Uh, Portugal is represented by Rafael Lobato, Manuel Alves, and Francisco Mora. Uh, then we have Norway, represented by Christian Krones, Hendrik Kronstad, and Isla Agren. Expected to see them very strong, particularly in the pole race, which is when we go off-road. Uh, so those are all of the teams, and we'll see them racing all of the time, uh, Arjuna. But then we have groups as well. They're divided into groups, and they score points for their individual groups. Yeah, and you, you did mention it a bit earlier as well. In these group stages, only the top two cars from each nation will score points. So we're in qualifying right now. Cars setting their lap times for this first race. 
But at the end of the day, it's only the two best drivers within your team. And I think it places a little bit more pressure on the, some of the teams that maybe only have two of their drivers in the race. It will be a bit more pressure on them. And I don't know necessarily here, Ben, if we're going to see a bit of team games being played. There have been a lot of inter-team communication as you know, drivers from different disciplines get together and who may not have necessarily worked together in the past try and come together. They've been doing a lot of practice during the week, so it'll be a very interesting challenge here for some of the smaller teams. Yeah, absolutely. And the reason why these pro drivers do sim racing at the very basic level is to feed their competitive spirit, of course, but they also just love it. They have great fun. And these kind of team events where you get a chance to sit in the, and practice together and, and get together is filling that void that we don't really have right now in the world of being able to be sociable and, and being able to uh, share good moments. So we're having to do it online. And uh, this, I think, this is why this kind of got fast forwarded so quickly because there is a demand from the pro drivers, not necessarily to race in pro series against sim races because they just cannot match. But when it's a pro racer versus a pro racer, then it's a different story. And, you know, this grid is not full of... Uh, kids who race in Formula 4 uh, but are amazing on iRacing. We've got some strong, strong names, uh, a really impressive lineup. The likes of uh, Rubens Barrichello and Tony Kanaan, great mates and loving being together. As we ride on board with Matt Campbell, you'll notice there is no other cars on track. This is lone qualifying, so everybody gets a chance to do their very, very best. Yeah, and you know, one of the fun things that I've kind of been thinking about this as well is you, you just said it, like the Pro Sim series, VCO Pro Sim, has been great to see that combination of real teams and then the virtual drivers coming together. But it's unfortunately because of the amount of professionalism that's come into sim racing nowadays, it's very difficult for the real drivers to be able to compete with the, you know, sim professionals, as I'm now going to call them. For someone like Matt Campbell, a Bathurst 12 hours winner, a Le Mans 24 hours winner, this is just a bit of fun here to, you know, as everyone's stuck inside, uh, just celebrate a little bit and head out onto track, one of the best tracks in the iRacing service as well, Ben, to just drive this wonderful Audi R8 GT3. Yeah, so Matt Campbell at the moment hasn't managed to get himself a clear lap, of course. The usual thing with iRacing, if you just make that slight error and go off track, you pick up an off track and it does mean that your lap is discounted. So uh, we expect that many of the cars will have crossed the line once, uh, but they won't necessarily ha have registered a time. Campbell does vote. He goes up into third position. Uh, four and a half tenths off Phil Dennis, who really is very, very strong at iRacing. Uh, uh, Dennis behind, uh, sorry, ahead of Sage Karam, proving, as you speculated at the very beginning, Arjana, that uh, Team USA is definitely the team to beat. Yeah, they've got some really, really quick drivers. And Sage Karam, you talked about Rallycross. He has competed in a season of America's Rallycross, didn't finish lower than second, has a lot of experience with Coanda Simsport as well. The slightly unknown driver in their equation is Jack Crawford. He recently signed up with Alter Sea Sports. He's done a lot of sim races over the last couple of months and is building up that sim experience. On board with Dinez, though, down in towards this second sector at Spa. Look how t tidy the car is right now. He's really understood, Ben, just how important balancing the car weight and keeping the car smooth is on this virtual service. Yeah, so we're in the Audi R8 GT3 car, so they have the option to play around with their traction control. The, uh, the setups are all fixed for these cars, so there's not endless tweaking going on. And I suppose maybe, therefore, their traction control settings would also be fixed. I'm not quite sure uh, how that exactly works. Um, but you're, if you're in the real world, the pro drivers tend to turn their traction control off on ABS down to a minimum because they do believe it's faster to drive these cars. Uh, if you can without any assists. It's kind of the same thing here on iRacing as well. You want to try and avoid getting into the traction control and the ABS. A race car ABS, especially for the gentleman drivers, Ben, is a very sophisticated system, not so sophisticated on the iRacing service. So you usually see that turn down to the minimum and drivers sometimes locking the wheels very slightly. Through Blanchemont though, I'm curious to see how stable the car looks here. Dinez very comfortable. Usually on the iRacing service, that's a big problem spot, Ben. Looks like for this race, might not be so bad. 
Yeah, absolutely. Certainly the cars that are Shin Limited slip and slide around there and there's a very evil off track on the right hand side. But uh, Phil looked very much in control and had a wide berth of the exit curb. He's finished his second lap. Not many others have. A lot of other drivers, their second laps were not better. So they ended up bailing out, either stopping or heading to pit lane. Uh, and we are still waiting for quite a few cars to finish their second lap. So let's see if we see any more larger uh, improvements in 13th position for uh, Team GB. Uh, that is Stefan Wilson getting very untidy through the Fanier chicane, losing the rear end. Uh, sorry, that's uh, no name uh, or speaker's corner. Uh, actually, does it actually have a proper name now? I, can't, I think they actually did give it a name finally. Um, it was the only corner on the circuit spa that didn't have a name, whilst every other corner at spa has had about 15. Um, because corner, because it's the only corner that the speaker, the old commentary box could see. Um, although that commentary box has now become VIP uh, hospitality. And uh, the commentary box now can only see the chicane because it's uh, basically over the start and finish straight. But uh, Stefan Wilson still pushing on. Looks like he may well have got an improvement in his hand for uh, this second lap. As I say, so many have already stayed at the pitted or not been able to improve on their second lap. Jesse Crone is still out there, uh, as is Christian Krones. So those two have just finished their laps and actually did not improve. Uh, but Stefan Wilson, therefore, the last, I think, of our drivers uh, out on track waiting for an improvement. Actually, Jens Klingman also out there, did not set a lap time on his attempt. So he needs to do a very clean second attempt. Stephen Wilson then comes to the line, and is it an improvement? No, it wasn't in the end. He stays down in 14th spot. Yeah, half a second slower. A bit surprising here, given relatively cool track temperatures that qualifying times aren't improving. You do need to keep it on the black stuff. Coming through this left-hander here, you don't want to run too wide. He manages to stay just within the track limits, but it is very easy, Ben, to get a number of off-tracks here. I remember doing a 24-hour race with a, ooh, as Klingman gets onto the grass and loses it through Puan, that's the end of qualifying for him. Yeah, and that means he will start in 34th and last. No lap time set for Jens Klingman or for, I don't know, Miguel Molina did set a lap time, uh, but he uh, will start right at the tail of the field. We should really be talking about these guys uh, as nations rather as drivers uh, i will endeavor to do that as we go through like the old a1 gp days where you, the team team this and team that rather than uh, drivers themselves but at, uh, in a moment once uh, it does actually look like christian Krones is still going i don't know quite why uh, he would be it looks like he's done a third lap uh, so he's now stopped and that means that qualifying is now officially over and we can turn our attention to the first race of the evening now this is the group stage uh, so the top two in each team will score points for their nation and the others are just there for making up the numbers, basically. Uh, two group stages and then we go into the pole race. Phil Dennis and Sage Karam share the front row for Team America and then it's Daniel Yukadella for Spain, Matt Campbell for Australia, Ellis Sepanen for Finland and Raul Hyman for South Africa in P6. P7, second of the Spanish cars, Alex Palou, then Bart Horstein for Australia. The first of the Canadian cars is Alex Elise. And then Team Germany first car is Maris Zug with Will Stevens for Team GB and Jack Crawford down in 12th for Team USA. Still less than a second separating all these cars. Richard Vachur, the first of the Netherlands drivers. Stefan Wilson in 14th. Nick Foster for Australia, 15th. Team Finland with Jesse Krohn in 16th position. Daniel Morad, 17th and Christian Krones in 18th spot. Look how tight that is. It's going to be a really interesting midfield battle. Tom Ingram for Team GB, 19th. Robert Wickens, 20th. Bradley Philpott, third best GB driver, 21st. Bent Viscal, 22nd. And then Alex Alcraz for Team Spain, 23rd. Gennaro Bonafede in 24th for Team South Africa. And we continue down to the bottom half of the field then. Baitskavita for the Netherlands in 25th. Rafael Lobato for Portugal in 26th. Jovan Oterit, 27th for Team Netherlands. Francisco Mora for Portugal, 28th. Job, well, I'm surprised by Job, but uh, so far down. Hendrik Krostad for Norway, 29th. Mike Rockenfeller for Germany in 30th position. And the last four, Manuel Alves for Portugal. Alia Algren for Norway. Miguel Molina for Spain. And no time set for Jens Klingman in 34th. He will be looking to move up through the field, but not so much pressure on his shoulders because Rocky and Marius Zug are ahead. It's going to be a rolling start. 
and we're going to have 15 minutes only around this spa circuit a fraught and frantic first race for you the cars begin to roll not a lot of time to get your temperature into the brakes and into the tires literally you've just got the chicane to deal with Team USA locking out the front row of the grid. Then we've got Team Spain and Team GB. Team Finland and South Africa. As I say, just 15 minutes to get this done. It's going to be very tough for those guys in the second half of the field to make up ground. And if you do make a mistake, it's going to prove very, very costly. Team USA locking out the front row. They can almost block as they go down to La Source for the first time. And we are racing in the VCO Cup of Nations Pro Race 2021. And USA first and second going into La Source. Will they get challenged from behind? They're already through. And there is a challenge from Daniel Yukodeta into second position ahead of Sage Karam. And I think Team GB looking to follow through as well. In, oh, it's team, sorry, it's not Team G, it's Team uh, uh, Australia, isn't it? With Matt Campbell in fourth position. Oh, looks like Daniel Candela actually pulled, bailed out of it. So Yucadela now, having bailed out of the bottom of Eau Rouge, will now have no momentum all the way up the Camel Strait. And into third position comes Matt Campbell then. In the inside, and that should be an easy move done as they continue to sort themselves out through Lecom for the first time. Oh, small issue coming into Lacom though. Not sure who is involved. Stefan Wilson, the car dropping down the timing screen. There's some crazy two, three, and four wide action going on right now. Look at that. Working through this part of the corner in towards Malmody here. Still, the action continues to rage on. A little bit wide there for the 51 car. And that is Team GB in what was 11th position. I wonder if that's Bradley Philpott uh, team. Car 51. Will Stevens it is indeed. As you say, lots of squabbling going on further back. The guys at the front are trying to check out, but uh, those that have not necessarily qualified particularly well are now trying to sort themselves and get themselves up through the field. It's at the head of the field, though. Phil Dennis that leads. Sage Karam has got himself up into second position. And Matt Campbell is in third. Danny Yukandela fourth. Then Elias Sepain in fifth. And then the second of the Spanish cars, Alex Palou in sixth position. So Spain looking good. Uh, in this first lap not necessarily as good as team usa but uh, with yukadella and palu fourth and sixth that's good points for this first race and the defending champions germany the highest place runner right now i believe is marius zug back in ninth we of course saw klingman having to start all the way at the back bend not how they needed to start their title defense now let's not forget that these guys are racing for groups at the moment oh sage garam gets very loose into the chicane Probably not got full temperature into the tyres. He has to run wide through the chicane and that puts him under pressure from Matt Campbell in the slipstream, looking to the inside, but to Karen blocks that, switches to the outside, tries to get better momentum perhaps down the hill and then into Eau Rouge. He's already got the overlap and I think that will be an easy move done by the time he gets to Eau Rouge and then up Radiot. But there's still an open app and still Sage Karam fights on side by side into the first part of Eau Rouge. Sage Karam goes very, very wide to keep the car facing the right direction. But he's going to be swallowed up now. He's passed by Junkadella, passed by Sepainen, passed by Palou. And even more, Marius Zug now comes past. And that's appalling. Of course, he's got a slowdown, hasn't he? Yeah, and that's why he's slowing all the way to a dead halt. Not as bad as it would have been on lap number one, but Sage Karam down to ninth. And Team USA looking very good coming into this one. One and two, now starting to struggle a little bit more. Who has got bright yellow green wheels there? Somebody has got themselves very shiny, uh, shiny rims. No one else has got them. They're all on black, but for some reason... Oh, it's a spinner. Who is that? One of the Spanish cars. And is that... It's, it's Alex from Palou. the front. It is Alex Palou. Oh, so Alex Palou spinning and uh, collecting a few others. There's collisions further back. Ben Fiskel, who was very, very strong uh, in the VCO Pro Sim Series collision. And there's a Portuguese car looking like it may retire. Richard Vershaw already has made a pit stop uh, for Team Netherlands. So a bit of chaos there. And Palou looking so strong for Spain now basically hands the responsibility to Danny Yukandela. 
take a look then at some of these replays. Oh, up the top of Eau Rouge. That's a big incident there. Not sure which Finnish car spinning up the top of the hill, but there's been a number of cars struggling now. And Phil Dinez has run away at the front of this field by 2.5 seconds. Danny Yunkadea being chased down by Matt Campbell. Yeah, Yunkadea getting past Campbell. Uh, I don't think we actually saw how that happened. Uh, but certainly now Campbell really on the attack once more. Is there space into the bus stop chicane? It's a really difficult place to pass because if you slot it down the right-hand side, then you're on the outside for the left-hand side and difficult to make the move done, but he doesn't want to get swallowed up by Team Finner. Now, this is what happened further back in the field. We're watching Team Germany and... Oh, G Team Germany got into the Portuguese car. They two, two of them went spinning around and they were all basically avoiding the car that was parked up in the middle of the road. I think that was Jens Klingman that ends up going round and round and round. Uh, it just shows you how important qualifying is, Ben, to try and make sure that you're closer to the front because these races are going to be all-out brawls for 15 minutes. Yeah, now let's not forget, and I was about to start it a little earlier, that we are racing in groups right now. So Team USA is not racing Team Spain. Very odd. But they're not, as Matt Campbell goes down the inside. Slipstream, easy move. Team Australia back up to second, ahead of Danny Yucundela in the Spanish car. Now, Team uh, Australia are in the same group as Team USA. Uh, so they are, sharing, uh, they are sharing the same group and therefore would be losing points to Team USA in a way that Team Spain is not. So even these, these guys are fighting. It's not massively... Uh, not massively critical for either of these two drivers in this particular race. And if they do have team managers, that would be the thing that I'll be on the radio to right now. Please do not fight too much. Do not compromise your points. You are in a good position. Team Finland racing Team Spain. So that would be for position if Sepainen could get onto the tail of Danny Ucadella right now. Uh, disaster for Team USA, though. Sage Karam has had a big issue. A couple of moments before that, Jack Crawford has had a huge, huge issue. Take a look at this VCO replay through this right-hand corner. We saw trouble here the lap before. Ooh, contact with the 58. Sage Karam hard into the wall. 58, Nick Foster. So he's the one with the, uh, the shiny rims. And uh, the classic Audi R8 iRacing rear wing. Uh, pops in for many cars at the back of the field. It does mean that Sage Karam, I don't think, will be scoring points for Team USA, and there's still plenty of squabbling going on. Oh, Team GB side by side. Make sure you don't take each other out. Team Canada flying through the inside. So that is uh, Alex Palou. Um, oh, no, sorry, Daniel Morad, of course it is. Alex Palou for Team Spain trying to recover. And then the two Brits in there. Now, that is Phil Pot and Ingram, who are scoring points. Oh, and Palou gets booted out the way by the second of the Canada cars. And more. And that was... No, sorry, it's Wickens ahead and Morad behind. So Wickens was part of that first group and Morad the second group. Just an unfortunate one there, Ben. Under breaking, Morad trying to send it as deep as possible. It looks like that... <laughs> Spanish R8 GT3 looks to have some significant damage down the hill though on the run down into Eau Rouge and Radion. This Canadian car tries to challenge once again. Yeah, now Canada Group C. So they're racing Switzerland, the Netherlands and Germany in these uh, group stages. And so actually Canada looking really good with Edison 6th and Wickens in 8th position right now. Australia looking good with Campbell and Horston scoring good points for a team Australia. And uh, yeah, poor old Alex Palou very strong in the early stages of the race but uh, now two incidents for him uh, and we've had visitors uh, into the pits for Richard Vershaw and Ben Fiskel they're actually staying in the pits so I think that's out of the race for them Mike Rockenfeller uh, seemingly with a bit of uh, I think connection issues because Rocky has been to the pits five times in three laps well, in front of Morad, Robert Wickens has just taken two positions away from Team GB. What an opportunity he found himself with, and he took full advantage of that one. These point situations are really just playing out very weirdly. Here's that replay, though, of Daniel Morad. He's going to come in from behind, make that contact, and nothing the Spanish car could do. Well, he wasn't stopping, was he? I think he... he oh, there was contact further back. Portugal getting into uh, was that another Team GB car as well. So I think the second half of this field is rather badly damaged. Uh, they're all running with their, their famous R8 uh, dodgy wings. They'll have steering that isn't straight. They'll have uh, complete lack of straight line speed as well going down the Campbell Strait. 
uh, and ultimately the car will not feel very good. We'll see these cars again, by the way, a little bit later on when they're racing at Le Mans. Now, is this the same? Is it the same car? It says Audi R8 on my sheet, but I imagine we're actually using. Oh no, we are using the same car. Okay, so uh, we'll see these guys again slipstreaming around Le Mans. Team, uh, Team Australia looking really strong here. This is Bart Horston on the back of Elias Sapanen trying to get past and make it uh, Australia 3-4. You tipped America and uh, Phil Dennis is checked out at the front, by the way. He's 3.7 seconds to the good, but oh, Australia is looking good too at the moment. Yeah, and in this group, Sage Karen, by the way, has had another crash. He's not going to score any points in this race. 25th position and falling for the Coanda driver. Meanwhile, some crazy action out of La Source as well. Still fighting between Daniel Morad and Will Stevens on the run down the hill. They're going to have to decide who's going to get up their single file first, side by side, and Daniel Morad tucks back into line. A little bit wide there from Team GB trying to keep the momentum up but providing a beautiful slipstream for Canada uh, and for the South African car as well side by side are they going to try and make it three wide going into Lecom no nope. the South African car bails out of it there's a little bit of contact a little bit of kissing the Canada car comes flying across and over and out goes the Canada car big crash and that is going to very much be uh, an escape back to the pits and that is very very sad but uh, we've seen Plenty of chaos already from that team car, and uh, it ends upside down. And he's still upside down right now, uh, hanging in the tire wall. Daniel Morad, uh, hanging by his virtual seatbelt, as it were. He's got his own Twitch stream. I'm sure you'll be able to go find a very entertaining view on that. Meanwhile, though, Ben, I'm trying to figure out what this means in our group situation. You've pointed it out on a number of occasions. These cars aren't fighting with each other. They're fighting for these group points. And we'll get that standings up on your screens in just a few moments' time. Yeah, I'm just hesitant to uh, go too deeply into that because it is a little bit, uh, a little bit complex uh, to kind of explain without the visualization. So we'll, uh, we'll keep that to ourselves. But effectively, uh, we have three different groups, Team USA in Group A, Team Spain in Group B, and Team Canada in Group C, I would say, is the best looking as we've got... Uh, this is the contact from before. And uh, I think Daniel Morad was kind of trying to come back and kind of punish the Team GB car of Will Stevens for, for being a little bit elbowy. Uh, and it failed miserably for him. And uh, now that is Stefan Wilson, is it? Facing the wrong direction? I think it was. No, it's Tom Ingram. Uh, and Ingram's had a very odd... That's a very odd place to have an accident going through the uh, Blanchemel corner. That should really be just flat out. Well, let's see if we can get an onboard replay here. I did say in qualifying that the Audi sometimes has a tendency to get a bit loose through the very high-speed Blanchemont corner, down to 20th then for Tom Ingram. I'm just trying to figure out this point situation because, quite frankly, Ben, there's been so much action that we've missed about 90% of the stuff on track. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Tom Ingram, not particularly used to rear-wheel drive, uh, has had very many years uh, racing front-wheel drive. Oh, I thought there might have been another car involved, South African car, and it was, oh, it was, it nearly saved it from hitting the barrier, but eventually the rear end uh, ended up getting sucked in. And it, that's what happens when you try and go side by side through Blanchemont. And now, because of his uh, total lack uh, of straight line speed, because of the damage, he is being swallowed up by the pack, as is the car just in front of him. More chaos, more cars off the track. Jesse Krohn, and of course, for Team Finland, there are only two drivers, so Krohn will be scoring points. Uh, for Team F Finland, regardless of where he finishes, whereas the likes of Tom Ingram uh, is not because they are now relying upon uh, Will Stevens and Bradley Philpott to score their points. There are the group points right now. Team Australia leading Group A. Team Finland narrowly leading Group B ahead of Spain. And they're actually very, very close Group B. And then Group C is led by Canada right now. Yeah, so it's a very interesting championship picture here. And you notice as well just how close these groups are. From the teams that are out there fighting it hard on track, it is very, very close. And we're only one race into this group stage. There's only two races, Ben. Remember, 15 more minutes of chaos to come at Long Beach after this. And uh, I think that's the correct way. I was surprised to see so much chaos in this race, uh, bearing in mind we're at Spa. Uh, and we've only got one minute left, by the way. So uh, where is our leader? Our leader must be on to his last lap. Uh, 
this is a track that people know and a car that's raced a lot. I was expecting them to be a little cleaner than what we will see in the next group race, which will be Long Beach in a Holden Commodore. And that is going to be chaos. There is no room for error. There could be a lot of squeezing into barriers. And I imagine some serious, serious accidents from the majority of the field. Although, to be fair, it's been good racing, if perhaps a little bit rubby. Well, I think the good thing is that these guys have been able to maybe lean on each other a bit more than they can in the real world, where damage has a cost, uh, both physical and uh, to your wallet as well. But heading into Long Beach, that will be a standing start, Ben. So we're not going to have too much shenanigans on a, a pace lap trying to get through that very tricky final hairpin. But it does mean that standing start is going to be very tricky. And this is a battle for fourth place overall. Yeah, absolutely. Team Finland uh, with Sepanen. Still holding off uh, Bart Horston. Bart Horston has been trying to get past throughout this race, uh, but Sepanen very, very defensive. Now, again, they are not racing each other uh, effectively in our group stages. Um, as, oh, there's another spinner further back. That would have been from P14. Uh, so, which car is now descending our timing screen? Stefan right? Wilson, I think. Oh, Stefan Wilson, okay. He was the third GB car. So, uh, actually, we don't have to worry too much about that. Uh, he's not losing points. Uh, the Looking at the, my timing screen, the worst of the teams, uh, if you like, is, well, um, t Team Austria? Oh no! Oh, oh, big issue there. Jack and Crawford that's... being put in the wall again. A guy not. I oh, know he is scoring points for Team USA, so that is damage to Team USA's point hopes. And I think it was collision. Was it collision with that Netherlands car? That would be Bytskavissa, I imagine, with her pink wheels. Um, yes, I think it is. Well, whatever the situation, or whichever the other car is, rather uh, the main point here, Sage Caron's had to return back to the pit lane is going to be a kind of contrasting tale. Phil Dinez is going to take the win then, Ben, but what a day here in Spa. Phil Dinez then takes the full points for Team USA in the first race of our VCO uh, Cup of Nations Pro event. And that is contrasting fortunes to his teammates, that's for sure. But Horston gets... Uh, no, doesn't get second place. Danny Yukundela gets second place. Campbell third. Horsting did get ahead of Sepanen on that last lap. So Team Australia third and fourth. Finland fifth. Then Ellis for Canada in sixth. Zug for uh, Germany in seventh. And we still got battling further back with uh, Team GB here coming across the line. And a lot of those cars are cars that are not scoring points. Although Rafael Lobato there uh, is the first point scorer for Portugal down in uh, 19th position. So uh, he, uh, well, not scoring that many points. There are, car there are other teams that are really, really lacking. In fact, looking at our leaderboard, I don't think we even saw anybody from Team Australia or Team Switzerland. That's a bit of a shame. Uh, or Team Brazil. No Team Brazil at all. Uh, right, Phil Dennis takes the victory ahead of Danny Ucadella. Matt Campbell, Bart Horston, Elis Sapanen, Alex Elise, then Marius Zug for Germany, Bradley Philpott, the first of the Brits, then Canada again, second car for Robert Wickens, and the second car for Team GB is Will Stevens. For Team South Africa, in 11th position and 12th position and then it's the Netherlands with John Van Oetteren in 13th, Christian Kronis 14th, Stefan Wilson in 15th GB, he will not score points for the team, neither will Nick Foster, Jack Crawford does score points for Australia down in 17th, No, nothing for Tom Ingram because he's the fourth for GB cars, Rafael Abato 19th in the end, the first of the Portuguese cars, Jesse Crone will score points for Finland in 20th spot. Bytskavissa will be scoring for Team Netherlands down in 21st. Uh, Hendrik Krostad in 22nd. Francesco Mora, the second of the Portuguese cars. Jens Klingman, the second of the German cars, uh, down there in 26th spot. Uh, then Miguel Molina, 27th. Sage Karim, 28th. Daniel Morad, 29th. These are the cars that got caught up in various accidents. Alex Alcaraz for Spain in 30th position the fourth of the Spanish drivers. And the last, Alex Palou, Mike Rockefeller, Bent Viscal and Richard Vershaw. So no Team Austria, no Team Switzerland, no 
Team Brazil. And uh, also missing Callan O'Keefe from South Africa. So that's a bit of a shame. But either way, we had good entertainment from our first race at Spa. And now you have to comp all of our drivers are taking their GT3 hats off and resetting their brains. And we reset ourselves because we're going into a very, very different beast. The Aussie V8 is an incredibly difficult car to drive fast. And we're placing it on probably one of the toughest tracks on iRacing right now. Beautiful, but really hard and very new as well so that's why the beauty gets even more magnified but i think the standing start will make things hopefully a bit better there's going to be a lot of confusion about how to use the various tools to get up to speed down into turn one a tricky braking zone and hopefully we can get down into the fountain without too much of a difficulty here yeah and that last corner as well if you don't get the line right it, you don't actually have the lock to get round it in some cars so uh, that will be also a challenge, especially if people are trying to dive bomb up the inside. It's a great overtaking opportunity, isn't it? But unfortunately, uh, it's uh, it's not a place where you can run side by side. You do need sort of compliance from both ends. Yeah, very much so. It's also a, a kind of track where it might suit these cars a bit more than if we brought the GT3 cars here, because you can, might be able to get away, Ben, with a bit more door banging, a bit more contact. We saw a lot of that in the first race of these group stages. I'm expecting the same here in race number two. Yeah, and to be fair, the Aussie V8s do race on plenty of street circuits, uh, less and less now, unfortunately, especially with the pandemic last year, but they have street circuits in Sydney, uh, Adelaide, unfortunately no longer, uh, obviously the Gold Coast, and they also uh, had a recent one in Newcastle, which is about three hours to the north of Sydney. Um, so a car that is designed to go street racing, if you like, but perhaps not in America, uh, although, actually, iRacing should go go and have a long extended holiday in Australia uh, and uh, and go and sample some of those tracks because that would be, be I think it'd be fun for the guys at iRacing and uh, and it would give us some amazing tracks because especially Gold Coast is an amazing place to go racing. Let's have a look also... at the track map then. Go on, Jana. No, there I was going to say, I'm also partial is. to the bend. It's a very nice track down in Australia, but this is a really fun challenge as well. 1.968 miles, not that many turns, Ben, and very tight and very twisty. Yeah, you're going to have to be forceful in the way that you overtake around here, and you've got to have to be compliant as well. You really have to uh, understand. But you can see why that last corner is such an overtaking spot with two left-hand turns. If you hold it to the left-hand side as much as... Uh, which is what you want to do to get a good slingshot, then you're opening the door to somebody to dive up the inside. So uh, watch out for overtakes there. Uh, but actually, a lot of the track does lend itself uh, to overtaking. Uh, th there is also, amazingly, considering it's a street circuit, there are a couple of places where you can get off tracks as well, aren't there, Arjun? Yeah, and you can also get slowdowns as well if you try and cut the course a bit too much, maybe try and uh, minimize the distance. But I think ultimately, this really is going to be a battle of survival. Uh, for someone like Fuldenez, who was able to dominate that first race so easily, I have no doubt that this is not going to be the same type of race. Cars already slipping and sliding a lot here in practice. On cold tires, these professional drivers, Ben, are really understanding just why this is the top racing challenge in the land down under. So they get a little bit of practice. They will have been practicing before. Uh, so they will have good knowledge, but this is obviously the official practice session before we go into our qualifying session. And uh, there is that last corner. It's gonna be a beautiful representation of this long big circuit with the, the low sun. Make our lives difficult because we won't be able to see the uh, liveries as well. Uh, but uh, that's okay. Commentators don't matter is one of our production guys said a little bit earlier on. Uh, and as you say, one of the newest circuits on the service. So taking the very latest technology uh, to be able to really beautifully replicate how it looks in real life. Yeah, and I haven't had the pleasure of visiting this track yet. It is on my bucket list, but they've done a great job. It used to exist in this point cloud kind of form where you drive through a very kind of alien kind of an environment. Now you've got this beautifully realized 3D environment that alive around you, Ben, and it's really just such a fun place to drive around. You've got as well the added noises from PAs from a lot of the RaceBot team as well. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, and uh, such a beautifully, as you say, replicated uh, track 
uh, very hard on your system. If you if you don't have a decent graphics card, then you're going to struggle with this place. Um, but looking at some of the the runs that we're getting, I can see you know, cars in the background. It doesn't look like they're having too much trouble. It looks like they're they're okay right now uh, with this track. When we go into racing, it could be a different story. I think it's mainly the the cold tire situation. Once they build up the temp and pressures, they're getting a feel for the car. But take a look then, Ben, at these group standings. Very interesting picture here. Group B really going to be the one to watch. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we really tipped uh, USA to be the ones to watch. And they have ended up second off that first race because it was a very strong showing from Team Australia. Uh, so those two are really going to be the, the, the fights because actually uh, Brazil and Austria are not represented. So actually just three teams in Group A and Portugal not looking very strong. So a two horse race, if you like, uh, for Group A. Group B, though, much, much more competitive. Uh, just what, 14 points separating four different teams, Spain, GB, Finland and South Africa. Norway a little bit off the pace. Didn't really talk too much about the Norwegians uh, in that first race in Spa. And then Group C, uh, their Canada leading Team Germany. Netherlands not really having a very strong run of things. Expected more from Team Netherlands and unfortunately no Team Switzerland this evening. Uh, so we should mention that unlike the first VCO Cup of Nations uh, for the Sim Drivers where we did eliminate countries, we are not eliminating anyone this evening. It's But the top three, and correct me if I'm wrong here, go through to our pole race and fight it out to get themselves a decent qualifying position for our three races that happen later on the season. Yes, that pole race sets the starting grid for the first nine cars in each of the finals races. So there is some value in the group B to making sure you're in the top three. However, like you say, all the teams in that group will advance to the finals. They have a chance at winning here. And, and you did mention something there with Team Finland. We saw one of their drivers, Jesse Crowen, having a very, very bad run at Spa. The other driver, though, Elias Sapanen, with a much better performance. It seems like, Ben, you could end up in a situation where one driver has a very good result, the other doesn't, and you make it through to that Super Bowl race. So it's anyone's game here in what is going to be a very wild uh, 15 minutes in Long Beach. And let's not forget that the Super Bowl race... Um, number one is being held on the off-track dirt uh, hell world rallycross course. Uh, two, it only requires one driver from each nation. Uh, so you, as, you, as you rightly say, you could be a one uh, driver team effectively scoring all the points like uh, Sepainen has done for Team Finland uh, on that first race at Spa. But then, how good is Sepainen when it comes to a rallycross car? It's a completely separate ball game, uh, and uh, you know, we know that Team USA from Group A will go through because only three teams go through, and all three uh, in Group A that are competing will go. So you can expect Sage Karam to be shoe in basically for that pole position, even if Team USA score no points in this next one. Exactly, 100%. And that's where his real-life Rallycross experience will come in handy. Talking of real-life experience, though, I've just remembered not many drivers will have too much experience in a V8 supercar. A lot of these competitors today with open wheel and GT experience. One driver in particular to watch out for, he had a good run at Spa, Matt Campbell. And guess what, Ben? When I was doing my research last night, I found out that he shared a car at the Bathurst 1000 with Shane Van Gisbergen. They finished in fifth position. He's got experience handling this type of a beast. He might be the one to watch out for, just like Denez was at Spa. And that's a very good point, actually. Where is Team New Zealand? Um, because absolutely, Van Gisbergen, one of the very strongest uh, in iRacing, and he would be uh, he would be able to get a very strong team, actually in the very first lockdown when New Zealand itself was locked down totally as a country nobody could move anywhere Team uh, New Zealand put together a, an online championship uh, Chris van der Drift I think was involved uh, quite heavily in the organisation of it and they got themselves sponsorship from local businesses that also couldn't open because uh, of the lockdown so they, it was a way of kind of making people aware of the various local businesses and New Zealand's not a, not a particularly large place it's 
know. Is it smaller than uh, England? I think it could be smaller than the UK. Uh, and so they did a fantastic job of promoting different businesses. They would go, uh, they would do oval dirt and then they'd do a street race and they'd play around with all kinds of different things. But it did mean that New Zealand as a whole have some pretty tasty iRacing drivers. Um, so that's one for the bucket list for, for the next round of, or the next edition of the VCO um, Cup of Nations to get themselves a, a team New Zealand and, and perhaps a team France when Romain Grosjean stops uh, visiting his new team because I think uh, he would have very much liked to have represented France uh, as he has done at the Race of Champions in real world um, but unfortunately he's over at Dale Cone racing at the moment uh, doing his doing his seat fit for when he becomes an IndyCar driver. Yeah, he'll be testing at the Barber Motorsports Park tomorrow in the uh, IndyCar for the first time. Don't think he'd really be anywhere else in the world right now, but yeah, we're right. fine. <laughs> Almost halfway done here, and I'm taking a look at these times. Fildenaire, Sage, Karam, two and three. So Team USA, with that sim experience, rising to the top once again. They'll be hoping, though, that this event be a little less uh, dramatic than that first race was. Now, the other thing that uh, definitely should have happened is all of the Formula E drivers right now are locked in their hotel rooms uh, over in Saudi Arabia, getting ready for the very first Formula E race of the season. And they're all having to do their mandatory um, quarantine period. So if we'd have managed to get a couple of sims out there for the various drivers, we could have had the likes of Antonio Felix da Costa, who's been so strong in iRacing. And I know from a photo that we saw today, uh, he's out playing Call of Duty uh, on his laptop with a load of the other Formula E drivers. Uh, so Robin Fryan's, I think, another one. And they're all in the same hotel, of course, stuck in their rooms, so they can't do anything uh, other than play games online uh, and uh, do a little bit of exercise and, and try and keep themselves fit and ready for the weekend's action. But if we've got some Sims over there, we could have had a couple more Formula E drivers, but uh, that's for next time. Uh, Portugal definitely could do with Antonio Fitz da Costa uh, as they sit at third in their group and quite a way off. Team USA and Team Australia. I will say though, that car looking splendid. iLiveries and, and Juan have done a great job to outfit every single nation with a, a unique uh, livery for this event. And I must say, each of them has their own little unique stamp on them, a uh, tribute to the country. And it's a really nice way, Ben, to celebrate uh, the 14 countries that are comp competing here today. Yeah, really, really cool. Uh, always amazed at how these liveries um, just look so stunning on a variety of cars and of course it's not the case that they've just um, had to do one livery they've had to do uh, the livery for all the different cars that we've got this evening and effectively whilst they've got the same base um, they do all need to be retweaked for every single car so huge work from the guys to get the uh, liveries ready uh, and they do look wonderful and the same team as well that does a great job with deliveries for the VCO Pro Sim as well, which you've had the pleasure of commentating so far. And we've got a bit of a couple of weeks off here, Ben, before we head into the final two rounds of that championship. And as a part of the back-end production team for that one, I'm very excited about a championship fight in that as well. We've got the pro drivers here, some more pro drivers competing in the iRacing service in a couple of weeks alongside the best in the sim world. Yeah, and there was, a, there was an article that came out the other day, rumours of a, a small mini uh, IndyCar series uh, on iRacing. I'm not sure how official that is, but certainly the news came out yesterday or the day before. Um, and hopefully everyone will behave themselves and there'll be a, a proper <laughs> race director that will slap their wrists if they do anything naughty. Uh, I think it is actually official official because I saw an article, maybe the same article that you're thinking about and, and got word from some of the community that that's happening. That will be fun. Uh, you do reference some of the uh, drama that happened at Indianapolis last time out, but I think there is a, an appetite to see real life drivers having some fun, uh, not out on track because, you know, there are realities to uh, how much track time that we can get with these real drivers. It's just an opportunity to display a little bit more of their personalities as well. Right, we're on to qualifying then. Lone qualifying for race two of the VCO Cup of Nations Pro uh, in the supercars around Long Beach. And not many. Or have we already had it? Have I missed it totally? Is that the grid? I, we're not... A couple of cars still circulating. I think more just getting practice laps under their belt. But I think that might be the final grid uh, in just over 60 seconds time. Yes. 
Okay, so that's the grid then. Um, Matt Campbell, as you suspected, showing his strength in a V8 supercar and grabbing the pole position ahead of Sage Caram. Phil Dennis uh, dropping to third after getting pole in the Audi R8. Alex Palou will be really hoping that he can get himself a good result after looking so strong in the early stages uh, and then uh, at Spa having various issues. Raul Hyman's stronger uh, in this than he was in the R8, which is a bit of a surprise. Uh, we interview Raul on the VCO chat show, which is every Monday night at eight o'clock. And uh, he loves this kind of thing. He loves the idea of jumping into different cars, cars that you would never usually have the opportunity to, to experience and drive. Uh, and one of the unique things that sim racing offers, not just us as laymen, but even professional racing drivers who effectively are all just massive fans of motorsport. You don't really find racing drivers these days that are, or ever, that aren't fans of the sport. And you're talking about Roman Grosjean. I know that uh, he's spent a lot of time on iRacing, building up for his barber, t uh, you know, test prep. But here we go then, starting grid for race number two. Campbell for Team Australia, ahead of Sage Karam for USA and Phil Dennis for USA, uh, battling over Group 1 honours. Alex Palou for Spain in fourth position, a very, very competitive Group B. And then Raul Hyman for South Africa and Bart Horsen up there again for Team Australia. Daniel Yukandela down in seventh position for Spain. Marin Zug, eighth for Germany. Richard Vershaw, ninth for Netherlands. He retired out in the first race. Morad, the first of the Canadians in tenth. Then Stefan Wilson for Team GB in eleventh. Alessa Payne, and only in twelfth position, the first of the Finnish cars. Alex Elise, the second of the Canadian cars in thirteenth. And Nick Foster in 14th for Team Australia. Will Stevens, 15th for Team GB. Job Van Eicheret, again, not showing the pace that he has in other platforms. For Netherlands, 16th spot. Jack Crawford, 17th for Team USA. And Jens Klinman did qualify this time, get himself 18th for Team Germany. Rafael Alberto, again, the best of the Portuguese drivers in 19th. Christian Kroenis is the best of the Norwegians in 20th. Then Tom Ingram, 21st for Team GB. Henrik Krustad is the second Norwegian car in 22nd. Bradley Philpott, the fourth British car in 23rd, I think. Mike Rockefeller for Team Germany, the third of the German cars in 24th position. Still pretty competitive, though. Still pretty close to times. Alex Alcaraz for Spain, 25th. Bert Viscal, 26th for Team Netherlands. Baitska Visser, 27th for the Netherlands. Then the second or the third of the South... Second of the South African cars, 28th. And Manuel Alves for Portugal, 29th. Ayla Agren in 30th, the third of the Norwegian cars. Jesse Krohn, Robert Wickens, Miguel Molina and Francisco Mora did not get a time. So Wickens, from being the best point scorer for Canada in Spa, has got a lot of work to do on a track which has walls in either side of it and could well be very, very tricky to pass. Robert Wickens is going to be one to watch. I think this is going to be one of those races, Ben, where you just have to try and find a way past. If you see someone blocking the track in front of you, don't force it. Wait for your opportunity to get through. This will be a race of attrition, despite the fact it's only 15 minutes long. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the thing is, if you spin here, just the lightest spin or running wide, you're going to hit the wall, you're going to bend your steering. And if you can limp your car around for the rest of the race, then you'll do that, but you'll end up at the back of the field. Um, and if you need to go into the pits to repair, you might as well retire out the race because um, we've only got a 15 minute race to, to establish the result here. Very, very tight. We are ready. We've got the cars on the grid. It looks like we might have a car missing. Late entry. Uh, I think it was Marius Zug jumping at the last minute. And that means we can go racing once more in the second race, the second of our group stage races from Long Beach with the V8 supercars waiting for the lights to go green. And we're racing, and it's a very good start from Team Spain. Alex Palou has really got traction going into the first corner. Where is that Spanish car? I think he may be blocked by two USA cars as we go down into turn one. So far, so good. And in fact, yeah, Alex Palou really hasn't made up any ground whatsoever. On the outside line as well, he might get mugged by a Team Australia car. We've got a GB car facing the wrong direction. That was Will Stevens, who's nailed into Nick Foster. And there's a third car without a front bonnet as well at the very tail of the field. 
Oh, and there's more stacking up going through the fountain as well. Track blocked as well. A couple of cars will have to reset to the pit lane. But out front, Matt Campbell, Phil Dinez running away from Alex Palau and Sage Karam. Uh, it's Alcaraz right at the tail of the field, unfortunately, so could well have been him we saw uh, facing the wrong direction. And with that track blockage, we're going to have a big spread from the head of the field further back. Uh, Ellis Sapanen up to sixth position. Great start from Sapanen, considering where he, I think it was 12th position he started. So the finished driver ahead of Bart Horston, uh, even. We've got Campbell leading, Phil Dennis second, Alex Palou ahead of Daniel Morad Sage Karam dropping positions here side by side with Sepanen trying to go round the outside giving him the inside to the last corner that's not going to work for him but is there damage to Sage Karam oh and Karam's put him in been put into the wall the first man to go into that last turn wall it's not working Ooh, out no, well sorry. for Sage Karam Ben there is a track blocked at the hairpin right now I think about 12 cars have been rolling end over end as well we saw oh, and you can see the tail end of the issue here and it's still continuing on as cars make their way through uh, well that is very much what happens here at Long Beach it's exactly why uh, lots of people have kind of avoided public races at Long Beach so far because it is unless you have major compliance a bit tricky so understeering horribly from the 57 British car and he's really not got very much steering what's going to happen through here is he helped around oh oh the car in front got around and then everybody else just nailed into them so the 57 that we saw running slowly uh where is he is he still running can't see him on my timing screen maybe it wasn't the 57 at all well I'm trying Jesse to Crone, Sorry, Ben, I'm trying to look at my timing screen. I'm seeing seven cars on the pit lane right now, and then about eight more cars out there on track running around 30 seconds back from the race leader right now. Out front, there's some really fun racing action going on. It's a little bit more chaos further back in the pack. Yeah, so it's 67, which was Stefan Wilson, uh, who has pitted and now back on track. Bites Kavita also the same. Robert Wickens has done the same thing. And Jesse Crone, Will Stevens, Raul Hyman. Raul Hyman, he's qualified so well. And he is in the pits making repairs, uh, as is Ben Viskel and Marius Zug, who didn't take the start, now comes out the pits in 32nd position. And actually, that might be uh, a half-decent uh, thing to do, because at least he'll stay out of trouble and just pick up the positions for all those that have had issues. There's not many cars out there that are running clean. That is a very messy Spanish car. And I was just trying to take a look at what happened to Raul Hyman because he was really impressive in qualifying. Something that drivers are going to have to watch out for, Ben. You can blow your engine, and that's what happened to Raul Hyman. He's down on the pit lane getting a brand new engine fitted into his car. That will be his day done in this race. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to take far too long for him to uh, get a new engine before the race is up. We're watching Danny Yucadella, by the way, the 93 Spanish car. Serious damage to the left-hand side. So he's been in the wall. He's now in eighth position. Uh, but as I say, many, many cars looking a bit worse for wear here. Campbell leads by just half a second ahead of Phil Dennis. Alex Palou for Spain, third position. Canada with Daniel Morad in fourth. Ellis Sapanen in fifth for Finland. Bart Horstein sixth for uh, Australia. So Australia still looking strong. Richard Vershaw for Netherlands, who retired out of the race uh, that we saw in uh, Spa Frankelshaw. He sits seventh now ahead of this. Well, there he is, in fact, just ahead of Danny Yukandela. Then it's Alex Elise with a very damaged Canadian car. And then we got side by side action with a very, very sorry looking Norwegian car further back. Not sure exactly who that is, but that car has got a lot of damage right now. A lot of these cars actually have that telltale sign of smacking the left-hand side against the wall. And you can see there, it might be affecting the steering as well. Point situation updated on the left-hand side of the screen as well. Very interesting then in Group B here, Ben. Yeah, looks like South Africa just missing out on points uh, to get that top three split. As we have a change of position there, that's Bart Horston ahead of Elias Sapanen for fifth position. A good pick up there from our director last minute. And Bart Horston has been locked with Elias Sapanen throughout the whole of the Spa race. And now he finds the same man on a very different track in a very different car. And Bart Horston's busy day in the simulator. He was competing in the uh, Porsche Esports Carrera Cup Great Britain just a couple of hours ago. Now here in the VCO Cup of Nations, great scrap with Elias Sapanen.
across the stripe. Frenetic action here at Laguna Seca. Just a one, uh, Laguna Seca, Long Beach. Just a one minute 20 lap in these very high powered V8 supercars. Uh, they have a fixed rear axle, which is a bit of a strange one. So they have very weird ge geometry that basically lifts the rear wheel up like you have in a, in a go-kart. Um, and it does mean that is why you see the V8 supercars sliding around a lot and why usually they have horrible understeer unless you get them, get really get the scruff of the neck. I remember talking to Andy Prio about when he went over to the Gold Coast. They used to have a fantastic two-driver race where they would have the, the season regulars joined by uh, international stars. A lot of IndyCar drivers would go and touring car drivers and Prio did a few years and it really took him a long time. Though he had experience with rear wheel drive to get the best out of these cars. And he said the first time you drive them, they are horrific because you drive them normally and the thing just plows on everywhere. You need to really pick them up, hustle them through the corners. And that's also why you always see them jumping over curves because if they can lift one of those rear wheels up, then it turns a lot easier. I guess the most natural comparison would be, you know, a NASCAR stock car where a very simple, but these are a bit more sophisticated than that, Ben. You also have a lot more in-car tools, the front and rear ARBs. I got the opportunity to compete in one of these uh, virtual V8 supercars races. It's a super tough car. And Danny Yunkadea right now is getting the grips of that car down into turn one, slots back into line. But you can see that car moves around under braking, moves around under throttle. It's never settled and it always requires the drivers to be on, fo on foam. Now, of course, I mentioned uh, Team South Africa uh, not picking up very much points. Well, of course, they've only got two drivers. Raul Hyman is one of their drivers and is in the pits, so he's picking up very little points. Uh, their other driver uh, is this man, Gennaro Bonafede, who is the head of BMW M for South Africa. Oh, he's about to take, well, he's inherited one position. I think he might inherit a second position in a moment because there was a car in the wall very heavily in front of him, although his car is looking horrible as well. There are not many straight V8s out there uh, uh, without some kind of damage. I think it was Mike Rockenfeller into the wall and you can see the damage. He's pulling to the side of the track, trying to let all the cars go around his outside at this point in time. Big drama then, and you were mentioning there for Gennaro Bonafede. Uh, he works now for BMW M Motorsport. That seems like the perfect job for a racing driver, doesn't it, Ben? Drive cars fast, both in the real you know, racing track and then on the streets as well. Yeah, absolutely. Represent, represent all the time. Uh, and he's had a good run of things. Now, I did see a change of position for eighth spot. Canada ahead of Spain. So Danny Yucandello has dropped down to ninth behind Alex Elise. I don't know how that affects things in Group B. Um, but as I say, I don't think there's much of a challenge coming from South Africa. Yes, Bonafede has made up, made up one position. Uh, but honestly, reliant upon Raul Hyman, who blew his engine, you're just never going to pick up enough points when you've got other teams around you that have a full quota of drivers. Although, uh, Elie Sapainen, again, being heavily relied upon because... Jersey Crone is down in 26th position for Finland as Rocky takes himself to pit lane. He was, though, the third of the German cars, I think, Mike Rockefeller. Uh, so that's not a disaster. Yeah, not a disaster. I'm looking right now. South Africa tied with points on Norway. The Norwegians have been very quiet in these opening couple of races. But as you head into the finals here, Ben, you need all your drivers to be performing. You can't have, in the case of a Team Finland, one driver near the front, one driver suffering in a lot of the mid-pack chaos that's unfolding. It'll be interesting to see exactly how, as we go into the final, where the races are a bit longer, maybe a bit more ordered in terms of the grid, how they exactly play out. Yeah, so from, T, from Group A then, Team Australia uh, and Team USA and Team Portugal, they will all qualify because the other two teams didn't show up. Uh, so in Group A, we have, basically, we don't really have a fight there. All of them will go into our rallycross. Uh, and then in Group B, that's really where we had the question marks, but uh, it seems to have sorted itself out with Team Spain, uh, Team Finland and Team GB uh, in the three qualifying places. Group C is uh, very clear because Team Switzerland are not there. There were only four in that group anyway, which means Canada, Netherlands and Germany, even if they are not having particularly good days, um, they will go through anyway. Now, I did actually click on a link which combines 
our teams. Team Australia, the best of the teams if we didn't have any group stages. The worst of the teams is Team Portugal. Uh, and because they're in Group A, they will go through. The only teams we won't see in our pole race, therefore, would be Team South Africa and Team Ordway. And it'll only be one driver from each of those nine countries that get represented as well. So that would be an interesting kind of a mix-up. This is the battle, by the way, for third. Daniel Morad for Canada. A big incident uh, at Spa in the bus stop just a few minutes ago. He's reset himself. Now at Long Beach. Very impressive drive. He's gapping Alex Pillow, an IndyCar driver who does have familiarity, of course, Ben, at this track. Yeah, absolutely. Has raced in a single-seater and that discipline very much do not touch the wall and then you will definitely break something at least you've got a little bit of bodywork around you here that you can do some rubbing and even this team canada car uh, has seen the wall daniel morad and actually looking very strong very interesting to have morad uh, up it in such a strong position considering how well how difficult his spa race was uh, he's definitely got the handle of this V8 car and look how he's throwing it around. The car's moving around underneath him uh, and he's driving it spectacularly and that is how this car works. We're into the last couple of minutes of this race. Not too many things to sort out to be honest uh, and certainly unless we have a big disaster I think all of our groups are established now. Yeah, I think so. I think we, we kind of know the situation. There are gaps forming between some of the cars. I would just want to correct myself as well. Of course, Palou uh, would have raced at Long Beach, but with the race being cancelled last year, he wouldn't have had the chance to experience uh, himself at this track. Daniel Morad, by the way, has also signed with Mercedes AMG as their official simulator works driver. So as we talk about sim racing becoming increasingly professional, these pro drivers taking that opportunity as well. Yeah, and more and more they find themselves aligning their real-world programs with virtual programs. There's certainly uh, many series now in the virtual world that require a pro driver. And more and more the, the, the lines are blurred. And the VCO is all about that, actually. That's very much what VCO stands for, the blurring of real and virtual worlds uh, and trying to combine the two um, in the... D digital NLS for instance you have to have a professional racing driver I don't know how they decide on a professional racing driver whether you have to have a, a, an international license or a, a, at least a national real world license but uh, certainly one championship that springs to mind where you have to have a real world driver uh, and that's where suddenly these real world drivers like Daniel Morad like Phil Denez are finding a second career and, and the prize money continues to increase three wide is never going to work on a street circuit oh and that got very very close this is down in 10th position uh, tom ingram at sage Karam, the two that were kissing and they were trying to get past jens klingman who is in the german car and p10 considering how badly his spa race had panned out this is good run of things for team germany yeah very much so these are some well needed points the defending champions after the team led by Maximilian Beneke took the win in our Sim Racers Cup of Nations. Hasn't started so well for them just yet, but as we head into more conventional races, it may turn in their favor. Sage Karam hard into the wall, though. More contact for Sage Karam. Team USA pointed in the wrong direction. <laughs> oh, Tom Ingram doing a proper touring car move there. It looked, it looked as though he was going to be touring card, and then Sage Karam... Uh, gave a little bit back and that car looks horrific now completely lost its uh, rear wing I don't know how it's uh, handling and yet Sage Karim is still in 12th position now he, is there two American cars in front of him there's Phil Dennis for sure but I think he actually is scoring points there uh, in 12th position so he needs to keep the car on the uh, on the black stuff yeah, Jack Crawford a couple of positions further behind, but yeah, <laughs> just a kind of an interesting day. I, I was trying to tip, obviously, Team USA very early on. Phil Dinez proving me right. Sage Karen struggling a little bit more. Now, Tom Ingram is the best of the Brits because Bradley Philpott's down in 19th spot. Uh, Will Stevens, 27th spot. And who is the other in that car? Bradley Philpott, 18th. Um, so, yeah, Tom Ingram, who definitely is the least experienced of all of those drivers uh, in iRacing, is holding the flag for Team 
GB and he needs to because if he retired out of that race he may drop behind South Africa that uh, Team GB may lose enough points so that South Africa go into the pole race and Team GB miss out uh, which would be a big shame it would be, but white flags in the air, and Matt Campbell already coming through turn eight onto this back straightaway. It's going to take a very comfortable win from Phil Dinez. There's still some fighting, though, through this turn eight corner. Yeah, just a bit of lappery going on, clearing some of the slower cars uh, further back. Uh, or no, hang on, that was, uh, was that Bart Horstein and Alex Palou fighting? I think it may well have been. Uh, so that was a change of position. Uh, team... Australia up to fourth, Team Spain down to fifth. Matt Campbell, though, comes round the final corner and he takes victory for Team Australia. Australia looking very, very strong. Uh, at least it's not too early in the morning for them this time. Matt Campbell beats Phil Denez by one second. Our race one and race two victors there. Daniel Morad in third. Bart Horstein for Australia comes home in fourth ahead of Palou so lots of fighting and Tom Ingram's been put in the wall again by Sage Karam. Sage is driving very very uncleanly I think is the right word and Ingram is going to lose a couple of positions waiting for Ingram to come across the line he drops behind Karam and Christian Krones and in the end picks up 13th spot so that will be less points we'll wait for our group standings to sort themselves out uh, there is South Africa and Gennaro Bonafede will finish in 18th spot. So Ingram is still taking more points than South Africa anyway. Uh, Bonafede, the only scorer for South Africa. Where is Callan O'Keefe? I hope you're watching, Callan. You're very, uh, you should be here. Uh, does a lot of training, actually, on iRacing. And... Um, well, Ben, just a quick update there. I think I was monitoring the uh, Discord channels earlier today. I think that Callum O'Keefe's rig had a failure, and because he doesn't have access to a welding equipment, is unable to get himself back up and running for this uh, competition. So, unfortunate to uh, not see Callan here today, but uh, sounds like there's a very good reason. Yeah, welding equipment. That's, uh, <laughs> that's pretty serious, isn't it? Here are the results then. Matt Campbell, one second ahead of Phil Dennis. Daniel Murray, eight seconds back in the end, but good points for Canada. But Horstein for Australia in P4, strong points in total for Australia. First of the Spanish cars is Alex Blue in fifth, then Alice Sapanen is the, uh, really, the man flying the flag for Finland uh, in sixth. Second Canada car in seventh, so good points for Canada, Alex Elise. And then Richard Vershaw, the first of the Netherlands cars in eighth. Dan Jukandela, the second of the Spanish cars, and then Jens Klingman picking up points for Germany. First of the point scorers for Germany in 10. Further down, Sage Karen for Team USA picks up points for 26 seconds back. Christian Krone is the first of Norwegians in 12th position, and that's good points for Team Norway uh, in their fight in Group B. In fact, they end up ahead of Team South Africa, although it doesn't mean that they'll qualify. Tom Ingram in 13th position. First of the GB cars, then Rafael Labato first of the Portuguese cars. Jack Crawford does not score points for Team USA as he is the third car. Manuel Vares for Portugal in 16th spot. So two good finishes for Portugal. And actually that puts them, well, puts them third anyway, because there's nobody else in that group. Henrik Krostad, the second of the Norwegian cars. The lone South African car of Gennaro Bonafede. And then Bradley Philpott, the second of the GB cars. Alex Alcarez for Spain, a minute back in 20th position. It was really a huge battle in just 15 minutes of racing. Outside the top 20 then, Stefan Wilson, 21st spot. But Skavissa for the Netherlands, that's the second Netherlands car, 22nd. Jesse Krohn, the second Finnish car in 23rd. Nick Foster uh, in 24th position. Francisco Mora in 25th. Robert Wickens. Unfortunately, not scoring points and qualifying at the back of the field, so got caught up in all kinds of mess. Will Stevens as well. Ben Viskel for the Netherlands, 28. Then Mike Rockefeller will pick up points for Germany, even though he's three laps back, because Maris Zuger lap further back, and Germany not having much fun of things. In fact, only beating Team Netherlands in the end by a single point in the group stage. And then the rest of our runners, just the last four. Alian Green, Job Van Oetreit retiring, Miguel Molina retiring, as did Raul Hyman with a blown engine. Now we do have 
kind of a human race control, don't we, Arjana? So we are looking at various incidents, especially with the, some of the stuff that we saw on our screen and some of the collisions. Yeah, we'll get a look at uh, some beautiful shots of the Long Beach circuit as the race control guys work in the background very, very hard. Sounds like there's a few incidents under investigation, uh, notably Sage Karam and Tom Ingram, which of course we saw that uh, fisticuffs on the last lap of the race there. We'll see what happens. I don't think it will have any type of indication on who competes in the pole race. Just mean those final standings may be slightly different. Just at the very, very back of shot, Jack Crawford being turned around even before they got to the braking zone. Uh, it be interesting to see exactly uh, who he was involved with there. But look at this. Understeer, understeer, as as we was talking about, and that was was that Sage Karam's first of many accidents in that race. Alex Palou coming through for Spain and uh, nearly being tagged by Bart Horsten in the Australia car. A lot of the brake, the brake lights going on, going out of the corner, not something you would usually expect. And that was a Team Netherlands car, I think, the 96 car being turned around. And then the South African car going into the wall. That was Raul Hyman being very, very much bullied. And unfortunately, after that, with the damage that he occurred, he ended up blowing his engine and that was race done. Team UK GB car also very much offline as they came to the fountain. And now you mentioned that there was a bit of contact at the fountain. Oh, this is, so this is now Jack Crawford, middle of shot. It's uh, Nick Foster in the Australia car to his right. And yeah, Nick Foster didn't have anywhere to go, did he? Why did Jack Crawford come across in there? And they then collected the 51 car, which is the Team GB entry. And look at that. They're not even in a braking zone and they're already spinning. I have a feeling if we wanted to show these uh, glamour shots of uh, incidents from this race, Ben, we might be en end up here for like a, an entire day, potentially. There was a lot of stuff. And just like in Spa, I don't think we really showed much of the action on, on the broadcast. but very much uh, enjoying the amount of commitment that these real life drivers are showing they're not just here to make up the numbers they're all pushing hard they've been practicing hard in the build-up as well and here you can see just how close they're racing with one another now is that ha Raul Hyman I think it may well have been being turned around by Ellis the very very early stages of the race We've also got in there Richard Vershaw in the Netherlands car and then John Bronotri in the with the pink wheels barging his way through. So that was the first bit of contact that Raul Hyman experienced. And then he's, I think, still a little bit loose. And that's the second bit of contact, actually, because we saw him earlier on in the wall. And this is a bit later on in the lap. But then the car looking rather bent and it may send itself into the wall, actually, at this point. Oh, and Certainly you can not. see... Sorry, you can see in the background, Ben, cars going around, one of the Spanish cars, and a Portuguese car pointing itself towards the wall. Big contact about to happen. And there we go. Another car spinning in the background. Being taken out by a Portuguese car. We should have... Have we got any... We've got some single-seaters later on, haven't we? Because they just need to stop. Uh, if we've got open wheels, that will deter them from hitting each other um, in a way that we've seen... Oh gosh, we've got Rallycross next. I mean, like that's got to encourage even more contact. We we, we need to put them in put them in a Formula Three car around hell instead. That'll stop them from hitting <laughs> each other. <laughs> that sounds like a very terrifying prospect. Our final race, though, will be the Williams FW31 at Monza. The way we closed out our sim racing Cup of Nations a couple of months ago, Ben. It's a really great way to end this off, and that classic F1 car where it's just raw power, lots of downforce, maximum commitment. Can't wait to see those cars on track. Yeah, definitely fast. If you've ever tried to drive one of those things, I stupidly tried to drive it around Alton Park the other day, and uh, they are crazy, crazy fast. It does take your brain quite a while to, to readjust to the speed to make sure you're... Uh, and also the braking. The braking baffles me because you there's such little amount of braking needed. Uh, and the braking zones are so small uh, that they really are quite a challenge to get the best out of. Just uh, waiting still to get our points up, but of course we can't get points until we get the results cleared. And although, honestly, in this group stage, the results don't hugely really affect anything, especially for Team USA, for instance. If Sage Karam was given a penalty, then he would 
lose points, but there are only three cars in Group A, so they're still going to qualify into our pole race, um, unless there's something buried in the regulations where they, the race control can actually stop them from doing that, in which case that would be very, very interesting for uh, Team USA in our actual three races that we have later on this evening because they would actually have to do some serious work. So this was contact number one, Sage Karen versus Tom Ingram. So Sage puts Tom into a slide. Tom masterfully, almost front wheel drive corrects it. But as he does so, Karen then comes across him and there's contact for a second time. So that puts Karen into a slide. Now Ingram's got himself back under control and Karen can't hold on through the fountain. He slides to the outside, nails the wall, and that's where his rear wing then ends up. And then this is the last corner. Ingram's got it all very horribly wrong. I don't know if that was helped or whether that was just on his own. And then, hmm, okay, and then there's contact even in the braking zone there. So we just need to see that replay a little bit earlier to see if the first slide was Sage Karam or whether Tom, I mean, he's completely offline. He's not going to get round the corner starting his, cor his turn from there. I think it's also fair to say, Ben, that first incident that we saw at the fountain, very much a, a, a racing incident. Like you say, a bit harder to tell from this angle what we think of this. This onboard might give us a better look, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Sage Karam coming in hot unstabilizing Tom Ingram's rear end and uh, Tom nearly holding it all together and unfortunately losing a couple of positions. Either way, Team GB still third in the group standings. Uh, so they we just miss, for this race, we just missed two car teams. Norway and South Africa being in Group B because there are there is actually a full quota of teams in Group B, they finish fourth and fifth therefore will not participate in this pole race, but we will see them come back for the finals. It will just mean that they won't be in the first nine grid positions for the first couple of races. It will compromise them a little bit more, but we've got longer races in the final three. It will allow them the opportunity to work that momentum up. Now we wait to see who exactly these teams will nominate in this pole race. An RX race rally cross at Hell Lankan Band, one of the best rally cross tracks on the iRacing service. And already a bit of a surprise here, Ben, because I'm seeing Phil Dinez in the session and not Sage Karam. Well, I wonder whether Race Control have said that Sage cannot participate in this race because of that contact in the last race. Um, I don't know how detailed the regulations are, but that would certainly be uh, one way of punishing them in a way that they couldn't be really punished any, in any other way. Give Sage Karam a, a 20 second penalty in that race and uh, USA score a little less points but stay in second position so wouldn't really have an effect uh, whereas telling me can't race in his preferred discipline different story uh, so um, if you've got the session in your in, in your view then we you can uh, run us through the, the the chosen drivers yeah we're just waiting for the final confirmation i saw one driver from norway join the session and he's just been asked to to leave uh, he won't be participating so <laughs> for, team, for team usa it will be phil Dinez, and in group a it will also be uh, rafael lobato for portugal then matt campbell slinging the, that car around the dirt for team australia in group b uh, for spain it will be miguel molina with the finnish representative of jesse crone and then for Team GB, Tom Ingram, of course, involved in some contact just a few moments ago. Group C, Canada, Robert Wickens with his hand controls will be slinging it around the dirt with Germany, represented by Marius Zu. And for Netherlands, the young hotshot, Job Van Oytert. Now, there's a couple of surprises there for me. First of all, Miguel Molina. We actually haven't spoken about Miguel Molina all evening. Um, Spain have chosen Miguel. And actually, he's already done, according to my timing screen, 25 laps. So did he retire early out of the last race so he could get, get into this session early? Uh, he's done a load of laps in practice. Um, Marius Zug, yeah, okay, he's uh, he's been not too bad. So here are the uh, final points then. Australia, USA and Portugal qualifying group A. And they were actually, in total, Australia and USA were the strongest two nations uh, if you combine all these groups. Spain, Finland and GB qualify. Norway, South Africa missing out. South Africa really should have been in there. Raul Hyman unfortunately blowing his engine. And then Group C, Canada, Germany and Netherlands with no shows from 
Lelo and Louis Delatraz. I think Lelo probably is still coming back from um, Asian Le Mans series, which was over in Yas Marina. Or if he if he is home, he's only just got home. Um, and so maybe girlfriend, wife, not sure which one, has told him he's not allowed to play tonight. Um, I keep telling my wife, this is not playing. This is very serious. This is racing. And, uh, and but she always tells, says I'm going off to play. Uh, right, qualifying is as per usual, lone qualifying. So we will not see lots of cars on the track. We are only going to have uh, ten, nine vehicles on the circuit, of course. And we are in the Subaru WRX. My actually had one of these, not this particular model. I had the the, uh, the short-tailed two-box one, but uh, what a car! Oh, it's a great car. You owned one. The first car I ever drove uh, must have been 10 plus years ago was my dad's Subaru STI, the 2004 model. I remember it very well. I'm so glad we have one on the iRacing service because it's my preferred rally car uh, of choice. It's a very interesting one, longer wheelbase, and typically in the world championship ranks, that's meant it's very strong on a fresher track, a little bit weaker as the track evolves and more dirt gets slicked around. But here with just the one car, let's see how it fares. Now, how many of these drivers have got handbrakes? Presumably, that would be one of the reasons why some of these drivers have been chosen. The likes of Jesse Crone, for instance, certainly the weaker of the two drivers in the finish lineup. But perhaps Elias Sapanen doesn't have a handbrake. And a handbrake is something you very, very much need uh, in this discipline. Because if you don't have one, it's all about understeer all the time. Well... I'm going to hate to be a little bit of a downer there, Ben, because I, okay. I had the opportunity to commentate on one of the iRacing World Championship Rallycross events, and I did a lot of talking to some of the teams. There's only one track on the 10-race schedule for the iRacing Rallycross World Championship where a handbrake got used. That's at the Atlanta Motor Speedway, and only at one specific corner. A lot of the professional sim racing rallycross drivers like to try and find other ways to rotate that car, and a lot of well, them do it by really maximizing the track width. One thing you'll see here at Hell is you can really climb up onto those curbs, and if you run very interesting track lines, you'll find a lot of time. Okay, very, very interesting. Uh, and certainly something that Petter Solberg would be uh, very unhappy about. He loves to get his <laughs> car all sideways. Um, we've been watching Phil Dennis, by the way, driving. Uh, no... Official confirmation from Race Control that they prevented Sage Karam from joining this session. Um, they've been given an official warning for driving standards, but uh, interesting that Phil Dennis has been chosen to represent. Oh, and he loses the rear end. Just about saves it, but that will be a slower lap time. Matt Campbell is only a tenth slower than Phil Dennis. And it, it, the, the field spread is a lot larger because really finding the sweet spot in Rallycross is incredibly, incredibly hard to find. And once you nail it, the time tumbles. And I think part of what goes into that uh, point on the handbrakes I was just making and the disappointment that, uh, that Petter Solberg might be feeling is the tires <laughs> that we simulate here is the American Global Rallycross spec tire that they used to run on this side of the pond. In the World Rallycross, they have a slightly different tire compound. You can drive the car a little bit differently. And sometimes, at least if you ask me, you can't go as sideways in this model as I would like to be. We saw in Dinez, for example, through that hairpin at the bottom of the hill, just how much momentum he scrubbed off by yanking on the handbrake and sliding that car sideways. So you just have to find the right way to coax the car around the track. Very impressed, though, with Matt Campbell. Here's Robert Wickens, and I always think that the one, the biggest challenge that Robert has in his rig is braking, because he's doing it with his hand. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, what happened? Uh, <coughs> what happened there? Um, and by using his hand, you don't get the same feel that you would through a pedal. Uh, it's working very hard to try and make it as good as possible, but then to jump into a rally cross where braking is so important to rotate the car. Very impressive. And he didn't qualify last. Here is the track map then. Joker lap, of course, which helps uh, mix up the grid. Just a kilometre in length is this hell track in Norway. And what a festival atmosphere it is when they go racing in the World Rallycross uh, here in Norway. A new promoter for the World Rallycross for 2021. They'll be aligning with WRC promoter, who obviously promote WRC. Um, and now we'll have a joint responsibility alongside the FIA to promote the World Rallycross 
uh, for this coming year. I don't know what's happening in the in the world of rallycross in America, though, Arjano, because it, they've had various iterations that have never really worked very well. Well, there's a man that you might be familiar with, an uh, action star legend, uh, Travis Pastrana. He's uh, innovating with Nitro Circus. They'll be doing a, a full season coming up very shortly. That'll be interesting. Just to talk about this track, though, here, Ben. You'll notice the Joker lap. It is a longer lap here, as is common in the European Rallycross type of a circuit. Expect to see some cars starting on the outside. Go to that on lap number one. Just to split it up, because what you don't want to be doing is being held by anybody else up front. So, Phil Dennis has the pole, Matt Campbell alongside, Job Run Oterate for Netherlands in P3, just four tenths off ahead of Jesse Krohn for Finland. So very much preferred uh, for Jesse Krohn here. Miguel Molina for Spain in fifth, Robert Wickens for sixth, uh, for Canada in sixth, I should say. Point eight back. Could be a nice little fight between Spain. Then Tom Ingram, 1.2 back uh, in for Team GB. Portugal, Rafael Labato, 1.3 back. And Marius Zug, the last of our qualifiers in ninth. Ignore Hendrik Kostad. He entered the session. He was not allowed, so he's been told to go away. This basically establishes the grid, the top nine positions in our first race of the finals session. That is all that this matters. The points that we saw in the group stages have been thrown away, and this is effectively qualifying for our finals. Netherlands car with the handbrake on. Suspension squashed as we race down towards the first turn. And Australia bouncing all over the place. Finland's gone round the, already. Side by side, Australia and the Netherlands on its outside. Finland recovering, but we've got cars, of course, ahead because they did not take the joker lap all over the place. In fact, four cars absolutely everywhere. And Australia and America splitting their strategies as Van Oetre dives down the inside and really disturbs Matt Campbell. Not been a good lap, uh, first lap for Matt Campbell. He's even behind the Portuguese car, which makes a mistake. Does it collect the Australian car? Yes, it does. Contact then. Rabato is off into the wall, but more crucially, there was contact with him and the Australian car and the German car of Marius Zug also facing the wrong direction. I think he got held up or caught up with Robert Wickens. And it's actually put Tom Ingram there for a moment into second position. But now Spain come through. Miguel Molina up to second. Phil Denez leads. He still has to take his longer joker lap though. A poor Matt Campbell there, unfortunately, Ben. He got punted down into turn number one. Jesse Crone with that little love tap, forcing him to look into the Joker. Then more contact with John Van Oetert, not just in the Joker, but through turn number three as well. Matt Campbell down to fifth, and he finds himself in that battle with Phil Dinez to try and get that prime pole position qualifying for the finals down in fifth position. Was that the sensible thing to do? Take the joke lap on lap one, puts you into the slower traffic, and then you have to really wait for the slower traffic to get um, out of your way. I think Tom Ingram has taken the joke lap because he's now fallen into the clutches of Netherlands and Australia. And here comes Jesse Crone down the inside and more contact with Matt Campbell. He's being mugged. And still side by side. Oh, look at that Netherlands car. Job Van Oetert sliding the wrong way up the grass there. He'll have a big slowdown penalty to serve in just a few moments' time. If he can even get it sorted out, you'll see he's trying to figure out which way to go. But Matt Campbell down the inside, down into turn one. Looking down the inside, but then he got very, very loose. And actually, Tom Ingram going for the joke lap now. So he must have made him an error, Tom Ingram. And now comes back onto the usual circuit, but lost a couple of positions. I've never seen Tom Ingram driving a rallycross car before, but uh, he looks like he's relatively adept to it. Jesse Crone tucked underneath him, took the joker lap at the same time. So those two together, we still haven't seen jokers from Team USA or Team Spain at the head of our field. Be interesting to see now that Matt Campbell has got clear track ahead of him. We know how much faster he was in qualifying, about half a second a lap. He can easily, easily close down the gap he needs. Now he doesn't have cars around him. Matt Campbell sets the fastest lap of the race. Molina down into the Joker though. Where is it going to feed him out? He's right behind Campbell. So Campbell up into second with clean air. So all of that contact hasn't hurt his chances too much. Ingram down the inside of Jesse Krohn though. Here comes Job Van Oetert onto the back of this train down the hill into turn three. Really, really entertaining and respectful driving between these guys. Not too much banging like we saw with the V8s at Long Beach. This is much cleaner and much more entertaining racing. 
Uh, Van Oetrecht with the pace for sure to get past these guys, but will he be able to find a way through? Ingram throws the car sideways. That was a bit of handbrake and it hasn't worked out for him. He's opened the door to Finland and for Netherlands and loses two spots. I'm not sure if that was a handbrake or more contact from Jesse Crone. He's loving rubbing his racing here in Rallycross. So a couple of laps to go halfway through this race. Big puff of smoke. That looks like some handbrake being yanked. There's Team Finland. Fourth position right now. And really, it's only Phil Denez at the head of the field for Team USA that still owes us a joker that matters. Well, I'm not quite sure further back if we've got jokers from everybody. Um, but certainly... Uh, we're not going to see any guys further back uh, make too much progress. Portugal ninth, uh, Germany in eighth position, Robert Wickens in the Canadian car in seventh, and now Ingram drops down to sixth position. And we still wait. Phil Dennis this time sets the fastest lap of the race, faster by three tenths of a second than Matt Campbell as Jesse Crone gets very, very sideways. Here comes the momentum of Job Van Oiterit. Well, I, did Matt Campbell just take the Joker again? I'm very confused at what's going on on track right now. He's still about three seconds behind Phil Dinez out front. So first and second, not really a contest. Krohn and Oitert still scrapping it out very, very hard. Some great racing here then in Rallycross today, Ben. Well, it's a 10-lap race. So race control could have said two joker laps. Um, usually a Rallycross race would only be about five or six laps. Uh, so that is possible. But uh, my producer tells me that I'm wrong. Uh, it's set to one simple joker, so not quite sure what Matt Campbell's doing. But either way, he's got six seconds to the good over the Spanish car there. And Jesse Crone fancies himself a... Well, he's got a second row start already, but he fancies himself a third position. Remember, this is the way that will set the grid for race one. Then we'll put the other two cars that we didn't see in this race on the tail of that. And then we'll repeat that same rotation again. And again, for the nations, because of course, this isn't about driver by driver, this is nation by nation. So effectively, they are holding up the, the qualifying for the whole team. Phil Dennis not qualifying for himself here. He's qualifying for where his teammates could potentially qualify. And it's a bit more complex than that as well, because let's say you're <laughs> Team USA. Jack Crawford's had a bit of an up and down day. He's had some pace, but just been caught up in some of the mid-pack uh, chaos that we saw in the first couple of races. He's going to then be starting at the front. Contact, by the way, between Job Van Oyten and Jesse Krohn as Oyten forces his way up into fourth position. So that this is going to be very interesting. The lowest point scorer on your team, Ben, starts the furthest forward. Okay. Oh, yeah, so that really mixes up the grid as well. Oh, Job Van Oyten getting into the side of Jesse Krohn. Big contact that time. Oh, Van Oyten was too deep on the brakes going into the first turn. The flag is out. There was more contact again. It's getting a bit dirty there, but Phil Dennis has had a very, very easy and clean run of things. No challenge from the Australian car, and Dennis takes a victory by a comfortable margin and throws a great drift in for us. Oh, look at that. Jesse Crone. He's dropping down the field. Oh, it was such a good run from the Finnish car, and now he's been overtaken by the German car as well. This could be last position for Team Finland. Unfortunately, well, fortunately for Crone, Rafael Lobato has already pulled it back to the pit lane, so that will be 8th position. In fact, no, Robert Wickens with a post-race penalty down to 8th position. Jesse Crone still holds on to 7th. So Wickens maybe didn't take the joker uh, and gets a post-race penalty dropping a position. And let's have a look at some of... Well, this was what... The, yeah, okay. Van Oetro needs a penalty as well because that was um, blatant. It was so clean before. Oh, and Jesse Crone oh. taking out Rob, Rob Wickens as well on his re rejoin. And then Rob just says, get away from me. Um, that was kind of fair in a retaliation way, if you like. Uh, tit for tat, if you will. Uh, you tit hit me, I'll, I'll hit you. Yeah, exactly. So race control have got some more sorting out to do. Uh, before, because of course, this is an important one. This sets the grid for the next three races, and so we need to make sure it's fair. Phil Dennis has the pole position then for Team USA, and it will be therefore Zach Campbell who will be on the pole. If I'm if I'm correct, uh, Matt Campbell second position for Australia, then Spain third, Netherlands fourth for Job Van Oetrecht. So far, the Netherlands were well, they were eighth in the group standings, so that's a good strong run for Job. Then Tom Ingram for GB in fifth, Marius Zug for Germany in sixth, 
Crone in seventh position for Finland. Robert Wickens for Canada in eighth. That will be a lot of work for either, um, for the Canadian drivers throughout our three races. Then Portugal ninth, and then we'll have Norway and South Africa. And the update from Race Control, Ben, is that Netherlands are penalized two positions for that contact with Finland. So Job Van Oytert drops then to sixth position. They'll start a couple of positions further back. But now we get ready then for our three finals races and to see who can dethrone Germany as the Cup of Nations champions. Now, I'm seeing sexy slow-mos of Formula One cars. Uh, I'm, I don't know if that's throwing me, but we will be seeing the Formula One car uh, a little bit later on. That's our final race of the evening. The first race of the evening will be the Audi R8 at Le Mans. So we've already seen the Audi R8, the GT3 car. And actually these days GT3 cars do race at Le Mans as part of the Le Mans Michelin Cup, uh, which is kind of the feeder series to um, the proper race, the proper 24 hours, if you like. Um, so they, in the Michelin Le Mans Cup, they have LMP2s, LMP3s, and GT3s, not many of them usually, because obviously you can't race a GT3 in the Le Mans 24 hours. And you have to go into GTE. Um, and so it's not a big field, but it's certainly a cost-effective way of being part of the uh, Le Mans package, if you like, because they are basically raced every weekend. If you're a team that have uh, a, a GT3 car, you can race it in different championships every weekend all you need to do is relivery it and stick different tires on it uh, and that is the beauty of both gt3 and also tcr as well in a similar built to a similar regulation spec to allow the same car to be used in multiple different series well as you know global gt racing undergoes a bit of a transformation as well ben you know gt3 machines now going to be at the forefront of gt competition in the imsa weathertech sports car championship how long before we see GT3s returning to the 24 hours of Le Mans? Not sure how long that's going to be, <laughs> but 40 minutes of racing action. This is more, almost triple the race length of the group stage races. This is our longest race of the, the day as well. This will be the main race that I'm looking at to see how cleanly we can get through it. And there's a clue of the one race we haven't really mentioned yet. Oval racing at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. I love oval racing. I love commentating on it because I think there's so much more to it than simply the uh, being the fastest car. You have so much to think about in terms of strategy uh, in slipstreams and, and playing around with that. And I love a race that makes you really, really think. And the Indy race uh, will do that. It's only going to be 20 laps, so there won't be any kind of pit stops or fuel saving or tyre degradation really. Um, but that will be our very entertaining second race of the evening. Now, Arjuna, I've tried to make sense of how the grids are going to work. Uh, perhaps if you explained it, uh, I, I will understand a bit more. We'll try it again, because even I'm getting a bit confused. And I, obviously, <laughs> race control has to manually set these grids. So they have to go in and tell the iRacing service to organize the cars properly. That's what they're doing in the background. We'll get into the race in just a few minutes time. But the pole race sets the top nine spots. So Team USA will have the pole position for each one of our three races. And the lowest scoring driver of that country will start on the pole position. So that will be Jack Crawford as Sage Karam and uh, the other driver who has... Uh, Phil Dinez, who of course has been very strong today, will start further down. Uh, as I understand it, USA will start in 1st position and in 10th position, Australia will start in 2nd and 11th. And you repeat that all the way down from 10th onwards to the final car in the 34 car grid, and that will set our grid order. I think it's just as confusing though as I was trying to explain it before then, Ben. Well, one thing I think is different to that is that we had 9 cars in the pole race, I believe that the two cars that we didn't see, or two nations that we didn't see in the pole race, will make the tenth. Uh, will be eleven. You know, will be tenth and eleventh on the grid. I don't think they get all put to the back behind all of the pole race cars. I 
thing. Ah, uh, okay, that so, would also make a bit more sense. So, I'm, I mean, race control can correct me. Um, this is what was written on my format briefing. Drivers are reversed for the grid. So as you've mentioned, the least performant driver for that particular team will be far in the first position for their nation. So the top nation has its top point scorer from the group stage starting last. Therefore, the least point scorer starting first. Pole position will be the lowest scoring driver of the highest scoring country. That actually kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, um, so, as you say, that is Team Australia, uh, Team USA, but it's Zach Crawford. Therefore, it would be um, Phil Dennis who will start in the third placed Team USA car, which will be down somewhere in the 20s. Yeah, probably um, like 28th or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Then when we go oval racing, the grid is the same order as race one, but drivers are not reversed. So that's where we'll see Phil Dennis on the pole position. There is no qualifying for any of these three final races, by the way. Uh, so pole position will be the highest scoring driver of the highest scoring country. Um, now that will be... Uh, now, will that be Phil Dennis or will that be based on the points from the first race. I'm not so sure about that. Lots of questions to be answered. <laughs> you have to wait until race two to have them answered as well. And then race three, the grid is exactly the same as race two. So once again, the fastest driver of the fastest team will be on the pole position for the race at Monza. So basically, it's just this Le Mans race, which will have a kind of reverse grid, if you like. But it's the longest race, so plenty of time for our fast drivers at the tail of the field to get through the pack. Very much so. I just want to highlight something as well when it comes to the second race at the uh, the Indianapolis uh, Motor Speedway because for those who watched uh, the Sim Racing Cup of Nations that we did a couple of months ago, uh, the oval race that happened at the end of day one at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway has kind of gone down in infamy. We had caution laps not counting and it kind of led us into this infant. I talked to race control in the build-up to this one. It's going to be a 20-minute race. No cautions will be thrown at all. That will be very interesting, Ben, because you cannot afford then to get caught up in any sort of incident. Now, we'll have to see if there's a fast repair at the very least. Um, otherwise, basically, if you do crash, then that's your race done, isn't it? Um, no chance of really repairing in a 20-lap race. If I remember, a lap is about 40 seconds, 35 seconds? Uh, yeah, about there. 38 seconds in qualifying. High 38s. Yeah, so we're going we're gonna to have a very quick race. It's going to be um, done and dusted very, very quickly indeed um, with just 20 laps. So a very long Le Mans, which is the usual because that's how it should be. Um, and a very short Indy 500. And then a kind of a normal Williams F1 race at Monza. Nice 30 minute sprint for race. The grids to be built. As was... Well, yeah. I was just saying, Ben, the, the finals, a nice 30 minute sprint race. And for a lot of the you know drivers in this competition who have come up the open wheel ladders as well, that will be a race distance. Maybe the car is not too familiar to them, but they know what it's like racing for 30 minutes in a sprint scenario. It'll be, you know, uh, being careful with my words here, they're going to be pushing all the way till the very end. And that might be one of the most entertaining races we have over the entire day. Well, what we can guarantee at Le Mans is that we will not really see anybody particularly running away with things. Such are the long straights. The effect of the slipstream has been upped quite a lot, I feel, by iRacing over the last build. And so the cars will, I don't think, be able to run alone. I think there will end up being one long pack. Um, throughout our 40 minutes at Le Mans and overtaking will be very easy so the guys fast at the back of the field will be able to make their way through I think yeah. nobody's going to dominate I would say and that's a similar situation for the Indy, Indy race although being such a short race you can probably I oh know you can't do anything with the fuel or can't do it fixed setup so you can't do anything really no so that will be a, that'll be a stuck together thing as well 
It depends on what the weather settings are in India. Someone who likes to race an Indy car on an oval, depending on how warm it is, it can very much become single file. The cooler the track temps, the more type of pack racing you get. You do have the adjustments of the ARBs and the weight jacker as well. Someone like Sage Karam going to be very familiar with how to use that to optimize the performance of the car. Just talking about that race one though for a second here, Ben. Phil Dinez will be starting all the way at the back with 40 minutes left to work up through the field. I think it's going to be very hard not to count Phil Dinez as one of the favorites to win another race today. Now, I would gu I'm guessing that we, we, what we do know is that the points that we saw in the group stage have now been canned. So everybody's back to zero. I presume that we still only have two drivers scoring points, even in these final races, because therefore, otherwise it would skew towards the teams that had more cars, wouldn't it? So it must be points only for the top two drivers. Yeah, that would that would make sense as well. Drivers do have a 10 minute practice before each of these sessions, even if there is no qualifying itself. Uh, so they will be able to have a little bit of a feel. Um, Audi R8 at Le Mans for 10 minutes. Yeah, you're about, you'll get probably two laps, maybe. Um, I would su suspect it's going to be a four minute lap for the GT3 cars. And uh, we will soon at least open the server so we'll be able to see the cars on track although i'm still very much enjoying these super slow mos especially the rallycross and now that you've told me that you don't need um a handbrake i'm going to do more of it because i i basically used that as an excuse for not doing any rallycross racing because i just thought oh i'm gonna need a handbrake and i haven't got one well, I use it as an excuse for why I'm so bad. My instant desire <laughs> to always yank it up and uh, pull the car sideways. But I really enjoy Rallycross. It's such a different type of a, a race to what you can try and feel like on, on the road courses. There's more contact. You have to really optimize how you get in and out of the corners. Because, of course, with four-wheel drive, Ben, you can't turn and, and accelerate at the same time. It's one or the other. And it'll be very interesting. Uh, if some of these guys, they do all of these fun things in the simulator, they try them out, some of them might decide, you know what, like Sage Karam, I want to go do some real rallycross as well. I'd like to do some pro lights. That, that's, when that came into the iRacing server, that was the, the thing for me. I'm really hoping the next round of the VCO Pro Sim, we have some pro lights racing. I don't know quite how we could get 40 cars in it, but... Um, I just love it. I think it's nuts. Uh, and even the slower ones, even the is it the the fours. Pro Light is a is a Pro Light four or two. I can't remember what you start with in iRacing. I think the Pro Two is what you start with because it's yeah. real wheel drive only or something like that. But you know uh, what, Ben? Right. Okay. How about doing uh, the Pro Two trucks or the Pro Four, uh, Pro four trucks, whichever one you want, at Long Beach? That's a quite fun combo on the iRacing service. Lots of fun can be had there. Uh, I think that would be. In terms of a fun race, uh, that probably would max out. I don't think anybody else would ever, ever be able to win. That would be a bit like um, Robbie Gordon's stadium super truck racing that they actually did race at Long Beach, didn't they? They did. And you know what? If iRacing's listening to this, if you want to just throw a couple of jumps onto uh, some yeah. of the tracks on the iRacing service, you've got a new series ready to go. Yeah, that, that would literally be Robbie Gordon's uh, kind of philosophy, wouldn't it? Just massive jumps and uh, stick them on road courses and i mean can't believe that the last time i saw those guys was in mexico on a race of champions track which was so narrow and yet they still were it brought 12 cars along and they were still able to race uh i think they raced four cars on the on the particular races. they did a, almost like a little rally cross thing and just just amazing machines so cool very very difficult to drive very very unique um, but uh, and far more unique than the um, the Pro 2s and Pro 4s, which are, they're not stadium super trucks, are they? They're, they're a very different way of, of racing, much more open in the um, in tracks built specifically for that. I'll be honest, I'm not exactly sure. I like to watch. I don't necessarily count myself as an expert in that kind of racing, but that's the great thing about iRacing as well, right? Every day is race day. You can try all of these different things. I found myself, you know, finding new avenues of motorsport that I never even watched as a kid growing up and finding passion for it, you know, understanding what oval racing is all about. But now it's all about Le Mans. Let's take a look at this fantastic track. There we go. 
Interesting uh, names for the chicanes in, in their French, in their native language. Obviously, the Mulsanne Strait, the part of the track which is public road, all the way to Indianapolis, public road, and actually beyond it uh, until you get to the Porsche Curves, those little wiggles uh, just before the start finishing line. That's the, that's the bit where the public road ends and the racetrack starts again. Um, used to be called the Maison Blanche uh, Short Circuit. And actually, Porsche, I think of now rebuilt it so you can do Porsche track days at the mall uh, but you only use basically that part up to the Ford Chicane you don't even go across the start finishing line um, and then of course you've got the Bugatti circuit which is used for the 24-hour bike race and also the MotoGP um, but we are using the proper Le Mans 24-hour circuit chicanes and all of the goodness that comes I don't you know I'm going to say something very controversial here I don't really find it that much fun to drive them it's not necessarily the most technical challenge especially compared to my favorite track the uh Nürburgring Nordschleife but, but it's yeah. got it's got a certain appeal as you work your way through the night uh, work your way through traffic especially in the LMP1 machines the magic of hitting that button the the batteries you know forcing that energy into the wheels propelling you forward down the straightaways it's a Historic race, Ben, and I know you've had the pleasure of being here on a number of occasions. One day I'll do the very same thing, and I can't wait to try and stay up for all 24 hours. Yeah, and commentating on the 24 hours last year with no fans was just the weirdest experience because it's such a vast place. And usually it's almost claustrophobic because there's 210,000 fans that are lining every car park and every um, campsite. And to be able to drive in with nobody blocking your way, with no cues to get into the track, with no issues with the gendarmes. Uh, it, was, it was weird in that sense, but then you know, the, the racing with a, a lack of that grandstand buzz that uh, echoes, it echoes from grandstand on the right to grandstand on the left, and just an amazing place to stand, especially of an evening when it's dark and you've got the just the lights flashing past and the different noises, the Corvettes and the Aston Martins come back, come past grumbling. And then you get the whine of, uh, well, back in the day of the Lola had a beautiful engine note, uh, the Aston Martin Lola. And then you can go out into this part of the circuit and find yourself a little ditch to sit in. It's completely illegal, but walk through enough trees and forests. And there are little spots where you can be incredibly close to the track if you know where they are. Uh, and you can almost be at eye level to the cars as they blast past because you're standing in ditches which are uh, usually just the side of the road but uh, obviously this part of the track being a, a normal street um, there are there's even that little restaurant on the left hand side that's a great place for lunch on a, on a Friday afternoon well represented in the iRacing service as well is the KFC chicken that you can drive through at the track really? Yes, yeah, no, it is. We'll maybe get an onboard at some point. Uh, down the Mulsanne Strait, you look to yeah. the right-hand side, you'll find that I know KFC. Where it is. I've been, I have been into that KFC. I didn't realize you could do it on here. That's amazing. Well, I, you might need a bit of a big crash to be able to actually go and drive through, you know, go spaceship <laughs> status and, you know, find yourself there. But look at this shot down this long straightaway. I, I can't even imagine, Ben, when this used to be one long run all the way from the exit onto the straightaway, down into that very slow corner at the end of the straight. It must have been terrifying, a little bit more palatable now when you've got two chicanes to slow you down. Yeah, and of course, the lump that you can see uh, as the cars are disappearing just over at the very back of shot, that used to be a lot steeper. That was the place where the Mercedes would, uh, took off uh, back in the late 90s. Peter Dumbreck, the kind of the most famous of the crashes, but Mark Webber did the same thing and ended up upside down. Um, and eventually Mercedes pulling the cars out of the 1997? I can't remember which year it was now. Uh, but they, because of that, they, it, was a, it was a fault with the Mercedes car, but because of um, the safety implications, they also shaved off the hill. Uh, so it used to have a much bigger kind of the car the whole car would get light and you get this sort of light feeling in your stomach uh, now it's a little less but that is a cool camera angle which i'm going to take a photo of and send to the director at Le Mans because he doesn't have that one uh, but you guys do i was doing a little bit of digging into our camera packs as well in the build-up to a indy 500 race that i did a couple of months ago ben and when i totaled the number of cameras that i had not just uh, onboard cameras, because of course we've got you know, 12, 13 onboard cameras for every single car. 
I think I added up about 2,800 different camera angles that I had at my disposal. It's great that we've got <laughs> all of these tools. And there you go. There's the KFC oh, nice. drive-in complete as well. Yeah, there's, there's about three or four different um, things around there, uh, different shops. Uh, and right, let's find out how this grid looks. Um, I think we worked out bits of it, but we'll be giving confirmation in just a second uh, exactly what the grid looks like for this first race. Interesting. Sage Karam on the pole position. Okay, so we got it wrong. Uh, Nick Foster alongside him, so Karam is going to disappear. Miguel Molina third for Spain. Then Stefan Wilson hasn't had a very strong run of things. Miguel Molina should be fast. Mike Rockefeller fifth. Ben Biskill sixth. Those guys have been very, very much struggling. And then on to our next car. So GB fourth. Tom Ingram didn't finish fourth, but uh, maybe he did. That's interesting. Yeah, because of all the chaos, because Netherlands got uh, got sent backwards, didn't they, after their uh, after their collision? Jesse Crone seventh for Finland. Robert Wickens eighth. Be happy with that. Then Francisco Mora, Ali Agren. So then, yeah, Portugal, Norway, South Africa. Raúl Hyman in eleventh. He will go well from there. Jack Crawford. Uh, obviously scored more points than Sage Karam uh, and ends up in 12th position for Team USA. And we get that same pattern now. We'll have USA, then we'll have Team Australia next. And that will be uh, Bart Hosten, of course. Alex Alcaraz for Spain. Will Stevens for GB. Jens Klingman for Germany. Then Beska Visser, Beitska Visser for Netherlands. Alea Sapainen for Finland in 18th spot. So work to do for AS, who's been in the top five in both of the races so far. Daniel Morad for Canada 19th, Manuel Alves for Portugal in 20th, Hendrik Krostad for Norway, and then Generado Bonafede for South Africa. Then Phil Dennis and Matt Campbell, the two race winners so far, 23rd and 24th. Alex Palou for Spain 25th, Tom Ingram for GB 26th, Marius Zug for Germany 27th, then Job van Oetrecht for 28th for Netherlands, Alex Ellis for Canada 29th. Rafael Abato, the best of the Portuguese drivers, therefore he starts in 30th position. And then we have those guys that have got more than three drivers. So Norway, Spain, Danny Yucadella, 32nd. Oh, Bradley Philpott, 33rd. And Richard Verschel will start this race in last position. But only this race, remember, we are only doing the reversal of the drivers on this first one. Then we go to the conventional order for the second and our third races. It looks like they're going to get a decent amount of... Um, build up to this rolling start they are out so they're gonna go the whole Porsche curves aren't they before we're gonna go racing yeah it's a bit of a, a time and I love it when you come to start a race here at the circuit de la Sarthe. the jets rumble overhead as well and you get that sensation that feeling that this is a moment to watch out for and the cars will start rolling off they'll have a couple of minutes like you say Ben to build up tire temperature but as soon as you go through those final chicane it's on the throttle and up to racing speed yeah, so we're just about to come to the point where the uh, normal road, and I say normal road, a road that you can drive on every day of the year, splits off and we can become the full-on race circuit. And it's basically around this part. The painting on the road isn't quite... It kind of makes it look like it continues left, but actually the road is underneath our camera there and now we're on the racetrack. This is the part where uh, you cannot... But actually, this is this very small part is not used at all because it's not part of the Maison Blanche. This first fearsome part of the Porsche curves um, with the safer barrier now on the outside. They've actually changed uh, the profile of this part of the track now. And actually, iRacing has replicated it. So um, that barrier on the, the right-hand side has been pushed back a bit further. So there's, uh, this is kind of two years ago, the way that the... The barriers are set up and it's become a lot, lot safer with a gravel trap there. And then we come into karting, off-camera left-hander, horrible, horrible corner, always wanting to push you wide, always wanting to push you on those rumble strips. And there is the, oh, I can't remember what they're called uh, in France, but the traditional fly pass that you get at the start of the Le Mans 24 hours as the planes head over the start finishing line the only thing that's missing is bruno van der Stick screaming his head off over the pa
A rolling start will keep these cars very much packed up as they come into the Ford chicane now. Hospitality is on the left-hand side. That was one thing we didn't have in the 2020 version of the Le Mans 24 hours. And it looks like Sage Karam is going to try and get himself a little bit of a jump. He runs wide even on the first corner. But over the line we go and we are racing at Le Mans for a 40-minute encounter. Plenty of opportunity for the guys at the back of the field uh, to get through to the front. And as I said already, I think it's going to be a bit of a slipstream of this one. It's Sage Karam ahead of Nick Foster and Stefan Wilson. Oh, we've got two cars around. And that will be Mike Rockenfeller, one of them. And Bent Viscal was the second car. Rocky's got to be careful to rejoin safely, especially with really fast cars at the tail of the field. Tom Ingram has dropped down to 24th spot. Although, no, he started quite far back, didn't he? And uh, so the first three have got themselves a little bit of distance to Miguel Molina right now. There is a bit of space. And if you make a breakaway group and you have a slipstream, it could be quite hard for Miguel Molina to break away. He's sitting on his own and join this fa first fast pack. And a big game changer. It looks like in this fixed setup race, Ben, there will be a pit stop required. This setup does not have enough fuel to get to 40 minutes racing action too wide further back. And this is going to be a big game changer because now they have to think about the pit entry to get that pit stop done. Now, I wonder if everybody has realised that. I wonder whether that was even announced. Portugal's getting completely wrong. Nearly, nearly taking out a load of cars. And I think that's Robert Wickens in the Canadian car getting a little bit loose. But he manages to gather it up. And finally, they... Uh, is that South Africa spinning? It is Raul Hyman. Raul Hyman spins himself out and contact with the barrier and another car. And I wonder whether it was Hyman who jumped across the chicane or whether it was. I thought it was a Portuguese car at first. But Hyman having a big old spin and South Africa's day uh, is going from bad to worse because they really relied upon Hyman to get the points. You're right, it was Hyman that was flying himself through the grass and then lost it all by himself. But look at now, the front three cars, they've separated themselves out from the chasing pack by five seconds. This is like almost a Tour de France stage now, Ben, where you've got you know, a couple of cars out front and now the chasing peloton trying to hunt them down. Baitska Vissa facing the wrong direction as well. She raced in the uh, virtual 24 Hours of Le Mans in June, replacing the real world 24 Hours of Le Mans. Rumour has it, exclusive, that that might happen again. Uh, the Le Mans 24 Hours could well be delayed uh, and therefore they will run a virtual version on the same weekend. And that is how Baitska Vissa, through no fault of her own, ended up facing the wrong way. Spanish car with a bit of a connection issue there. Uh, I think that's Alex Alcaraz disappearing and reappearing. I wonder whether it was Alcaraz who got into the tail of Baitskavisa, just didn't really mean to. Not sure what's going on. I think it's Miguel Molina's uh, internet that's going on the fritz just very slightly further up in your field. Ah, yeah, Steph okay. Stefan Wilson up to third now, trying to break away from the chasing pack. These guys are squabbling very hard, Ben, and you know that if you fight through some of these slower corners at Le Mans, you lose a lot of time. They've now fallen off the tail end of the leading three cars by six whole seconds. Yeah, so uh, Molina sitting in fifth position was the car that was blinking. Um, and, but there is a second Spanish car, Alex Alcaraz, in tenth position. Uh, the guys who have really made up progress in that first couple of corners then, I think Bart Horstein uh, in fourth position has to be the biggest mover and shaker for sure. Uh, Daniel Cundella is down in 21st position, so he's done well. Phil Dennis is in 10th position. Uh, Francisco Mora for Portugal has had an issue somewhere. He's dropping down the field. There's, oh, oh, no, there's Dennis. chaos. Dennis down the timing screen as well. A bit of a commentator's curse there and Alex Alcaraz on his roof. So what, what happened, there is our American leader, but the people they were reliant upon to get the points, Phil Dennis has been caught up in something and dropped down to 24th position. Uh, we have a couple of cars in the pits, Jens Klimen and Mike Rockenfeller, both German cars are uh, unfortunately looking to be out of this Le Mans race on lap one. Alex Alcaraz has also reset the pits. And as the rest of them come across the line, we've got Daniel Morad in the pits, Raul Hyman in the pits, Will Stevens, Alex Elise as well. So Canada, Britain, South Africa, two Canada cars, in fact. Oh, and this is going to be an issue through the Porsche curves. Oh, oh track blocker. What could Phil Dinez have even done in that situation? 
And that's huge damage that he'll be carrying as well. He hasn't come into the pits to get it repaired, but his car will not be fast. And in fact, who's this? Karam off the road as well. It's turning from bad to worse for the guys that we tipped to win this one. Karam from the lead drops down and down into eighth position now behind Finland and Elias Apenen. And this draft train is very much getting broken up. We'll take a look at this replay. He's already lost some time, it would appear, to the rest of the uh, cars. Not sure if there was yeah. an earlier incident as well, but that's going to be damage for Karam throughout the rest of this race. Well, that was like that was him not paying attention. Trying to turn in on the grass it was never going to work. But uh, I'm curious, as you say, he should have been with the two Australians that are now one and two in this race, Nick Foster and Bert Horstein. He should have been with them, but he wasn't. I mean, look at the traffic further back, two Portuguese cars. Uh, together here for, um, well, it says 20th on the windscreen, uh, but uh, there's also a car in front of them that is, says 7th, so uh, not quite sure exactly what we're looking at here. Yeah, once again, we're in, I think that's Christian uh, Krognes in the middle of that, so this is 14th on back, I think. You see the Portuguese car. Uh, maybe even some lapped cars getting mixed in here, of yeah. course, Ben, because we have some cars that came down the pit lane for some heavy damage repairs. There is Christian Kronos in uh, with the windscreen saying 19th position. Um, and the car that had 14th on its uh, windscreen was Portuguese. Manuel Alves and Rafael Lobato, I think, two Portuguese cars running together. So it probably was that that we were looking at. Christian Kronos, so this is, this is mighty confusing. Windscreen says 19th because that's where he was when he came across the line. But there were probably cars in front of him that are pitted and therefore he's actually 15th at the moment. Um, yeah, so that's where those windscreens lead us astray. What we need is iRacing to implement uh, live updating things as well. Look at that further back as well. Robert Wickens side by side with uh, Bradley Philpot, I think that is. Some really good action. And once again, Ben, we're in this situation where we're seeing some of these best drivers in the real world as they go three wide in the background of this shot, really duking it out very hard. Oh, yeah, that's uh, Team GB, Team Germany and Canada. Uh, Robert Wickens, I think... Uh, Bradley Philpott and Marius Zug running three wide and it's uh, the Canadian car which wins out for the moment and then Marius Zug for Germany dives down the inside but it will still be uh, Robert Wickens who has the inside line going through Arnage and then uh, off towards the Porsche curves. Great battling down the field but incredible, incredible advantage for Nick Foster uh, leading this race. Okay, he had a great... Uh, position to start with but he leads by 1.4 seconds over his teammate would you believe Australia 1-2 right now and still Robert Wickens under attack from Maria Zug Zug has the inside line for the first part of the Porsche curves and Robert Wickens will be sensible now to just sit in the slipstream and wait until the track opens itself out again Bradley Philpott has Christian Kronos on the tail of that group um, and all those that went to the pits I have a feeling there is uh, possibly a fast repair because a lot of them are back out onto circuit. Um, Bonafede for Portugal off. Oh, and a big crash. Big crash for Team Netherlands. Tom Ingram also involved. Um, which Netherlands car was that? And another car heading off into the wall. That almost looked like a hardware failure. It just turned hard right. Uh, but Ingram and Phil Dennis at the back of the field. And this is what happened. And it was Bites Kavissa and Bent Viscal both separately involved. We'll see the contact here initially. Ooh, just a bit wide and... Oh, two completely separate incidents there. Yeah, the... the uh, this, and then there was another car flying in the background down there. Phil Dennis, by the way, has come to pit lane, as has Isla Agren. Uh, so Norway and Team USA. Now, Team USA has got Jack Crawford now as the fastest or the largest point scoring driver. Sage Karam. Uh, is just a couple of points back. So fifth and eighth for those two. But it does look like advantage at the moment. Uh, very much in Team Australia. Now, where is their third driver that would usually be the first driver? Matt Campbell's not made that huge ground. He's still 18th. Maybe carrying damage for Australia. Yeah, only up six positions so far this race. Might have got involved in a lot of the incidents that we've been working our way through. Oh, about 30 minutes left to go. And I wonder if some of those cars that have come down onto pit lane in the last couple of laps, Ben, have filled up their tanks of fuel and are good to the end of the race. They can get there on a half tank of fuel, as it were. It just sounds like the fixed setup wasn't containing enough fuel. Not exactly sure what the situation is. More contact further back, though, and here's the 47. 
Yeah, do we know how much capacity the fuel tank had? Is there a large window for the pit stop or is there a small window? Difficult to know. Taking a look right now, the uh, R8 GT3 has a fuel tank capacity of about 120 litres. The baseline setup has 60 litres. I'm not sure exactly what uh, the fixed setup was that they used, Ben. I'd wager that these guys have about a 10 second pit stop on the agenda. Yeah, so that would mean that usually the GT3 cars can do around an hour. Sometimes it's a little bit less, sometimes a little bit more. With the amount of flat out here, it's probably a little bit less. So that would mean pit stop around, you'd have to do a pit stop around the 25 to 35 um, minute mark uh, to, get your, to get to the end. Uh, if you pit too early, then you still won't have the capacity in the tank to be able to, to go all the way. Lots and lots of battle. Lots of very badly scarred cars out there. This is 12th position. So uh, this is... Is this Marius Zug who's got himself up a few positions now? Uh, 12th at the start of the lap, but 14th right now. I think it may well be. Uh, following the Finnish car. Is that the Finnish car of Elis Sapanen, who's very badly damaged in 13th spot? And that Team Netherlands car um, with the pink wheels, that's Job van Oytering. So Job down the inside of Miguel Molina, but Molina has the inside line for Indianapolis, giving each other a bit of racing room. And Richard Vershaw watching on. Vershaw might follow through here uh, into Arnage if there's enough space. Miguel Molina will try and shut the door, but he can't. And Sage Karam, even with a damaged car, is starting to draw onto the tail of this group. We still have groups though, it's good to see. And the classic Le Mans driving off track thing going on with the two Netherlands cars. And still Miguel Molina side by side with Richard Vershaw and a little bit of pushing, little bit of contact between the two. He was trying to bump draft him, I think. Well, I was hard in my mouth there because those two Netherlands cars were trying to work together to bully Miguel Molina out of the draft. And unfortunately, uh, Richard Vershaw trying to just bump his teammate up the road. Job Van Oyte able to hold on to that car. But that was another moment where four cars almost said goodbye. Van Oytere, I believe, class winner at Le Mans last year, if my memory serves me right. Um, one of the very, very fastest uh, silver drivers that were entered into Le Mans 24 hours last year. Uh, although he actually was a gold driver in the end, um, which will change his uh, chances of a seat um, as per the regulations in the LMP2 class. Uh, still Australia leading the field put by uh, the two of them by, by, uh, by 4.3 seconds. So Foster and Hartz, Hortsgen uh, can work together here to keep away from Stefan Wilson. Wilson's on his own. Jack Crawford is four and a half seconds back and he has Jesse Crone for company. So Jesse Crone, there are the, the two of them are, uh, losing a position to Jack Crawford, but being able to stay with him right now. And let's not forget, this is a long race. We've still got 27 minutes remaining of this race. So plenty of time still to sort positions out and you just need to be respectful and careful but behind them is Danny Yucadella. From the very tail of the field, through all of the chaos, the Spanish car is in sixth spot. And so I think something else has just happened to Sage Karen, potentially a slowdown penalty. He's had to uh, hold up, give a number of positions up. Now tucked up behind Christian Krognes with Robert Wickens right behind him. Interesting situation here for a number of teams. This will be another swap around there between Jesse Crone and Jack Crawford. Yeah, and these guys just almost working together, providing that slipstream, giving these both of these two extra speed. Now onto this straight, the slipstream is in the hands of Team USA, and therefore he will be able to draft past. And of course, by doing this and by not compromising their line too much, they are able to pull away from Team Spain behind. So Australia leads, amazingly, Team USA still in second position, but only a point ahead of Team Spain in third. And then Team GB in fourth position, just a couple of points ahead of Team Finland. Interesting to see just how far ahead a Team Australia is at this point in time. Still got two races to go, but it is definitely looking very, very promising when their strongest driver, Matt Campbell, down in 15th and 16th position, battling it out with the IndyCar driver, Alex Pillow. It's hard to now count against them. My bet for a Team USA maybe not looking so strong. Take a look at this, though. Here comes a pass against one of those Team USA cars. Yeah, that's just that slipstreaming going on again. Jesse Crone back ahead now. So Crone leads through the Mulsanne corner. It's a roundabout 
uh, most of the year. You can just about see the roundabout in the background. One of the best places, by the way, to uh, watch for free the Le Mans 24, uh, the Le Mans 24 hours because you are not within the circuit confines if you stand on that roundabout. You are, of course, um, definitely going to get uh, arrested by the gendarmes at some point, but um, it's a good vantage point. See, now Jesse Crone doesn't defend that. He just allows the momentum. He's put it... He has put Team USA on the outside line, so they run side by side and nearly contact between the two of them. Sensible from Jack Crawford to back out of that one. And uh, yeah, Jesse Crone probably could have been nicer there. We do need to work together to get away from Danny Yukandela. Otherwise, Yukandela 2.5 back right now. Remember that because in a few laps of time, I'm sure we'll be a lot, lot closer. We've got a load of cars in the pits just now. Um, actually, we've only got 24 runners on track. Alex Alcaraz, Raul Hyman, Phil Dennis, Gennaro Bonafede, uh, Hendrik Krostad, Baitskavissa, Isla Agred, and Bent Viscal all are in the points, uh, in the pits. Sorry. And for someone like Team Germany, two cars in the pits, they're effectively done in this you know, final stage. They'll probably come out for the final two races just for a little bit of fun. Interesting to note though, Sage Karam has dropped to 13th place, Ben. I think the damage that he's got, even in the draft, the triple draft of the cars that he's got in front of him, he's not really able to pull alongside in these long straightaways with that top end damage. He's going to be hurting now for the remaining 23 minutes. Yeah, just having a look to see the first effectively non-point scoring driver is Will Stevens in 18th spot. Everybody above him. Uh, sorry, Robert Wickens, actually. Everyone above Robert Wickens is still is scoring for their team. But Robert Wickens... Oh, hang on a second. That's not right. That's completely wrong. Uh, Robert Wickens in 10th. He's actually the best of the Canadian cars. Uh, I'm quite sure. I must have completely the wrong uh, spreadsheet open. Um, I'm not going to look at that ever again. It's leading me up the wrong way. Ellis and comes to pit lane. I would have thought this is probably the first legitimate pit stop. I would think so as well. Not sure if we missed something with uh, that other Team Finland car, because of course he has fallen down the field. There's three wide coming through this first chicane. Marius Zug is the big loser there. Alex Below slips it down the inside. Two wide as we plunge down the hill. Sage Karam back up into 11th position. Nice battling. Great entertainment going on out there and still so much time remaining. Oh, just a little bit loose and nice easy move from Matt Campbell to get ahead of Bradley Philpott. Philpott's really compromised and he's now, because he didn't have the momentum uh, out through the S's, he's now basically going to be gobbled up all the way until you get to the next breaking zone, which is the first chicane. So past goes Alex Palou and the next man will be Marius Zug in the Team Germany car. He pulls to the left-hand side and a nice little train of cars here running side by side. Uh, damage though, uh, to the Team America car that's in there. That's Sage Karam. Uh, so has Karam dropped back down, or is, he, is that a recovery? I'm not sure he was there before. It's a bit of both. He fell back, he came forward, he's falling back again now. That damage is really hurting him, and into that uh, first chicane on the Malsan, you could see Alex Palau looking to the outside, trying to make it work. Had to back out of it, but you can see once again the charge down the second portion of the Malsan. Sage Karam not closing on the car in front. Here comes that Spanish machine from behind. Three wide as well. Three wide. We've got Rafael Abato, the best of the Portuguese cars, trying to go around the outside. That's completely, completely failed for him. Bradley Philpott. Uh, dropping down the order. Now, Stefan Wilson is the man that's scoring points for Team GB up in third position, but the second uh, Team GB car would be Bradley Philpott. So uh, every time he gets past, he is losing points for Team GB. As we see, another change of position. Oh, but this time contact. Oh, no, and Jesse Crone into the gravel as well. It was working out so nicely between those two. Jack Crawford and uh, Jesse Crone, and finally the bubble has burst. I think Crone just pulled up a little bit late back onto the racing line and almost caught Jack Crawford by surprise. Here it is again. Yeah, he's on the brakes, but he's he's uh, expecting uh, Jesse Crone to carry far more speed than he did. And that's a real shame to see that little exchange end in, in that way. But plenty, plenty more uh, battles, groups forming all the way down the field. I think the good news, at least what I took from that incident, Ben, is it's good to see the professionals make mistakes just like I do as well when I get uh, out on track and do races. I've done that more than one occasion. It's just so easy to do. The car in front wants to try and maximize the corner. Who's that sliding, though, through this very slow corner? 
Yep, somebody facing the wrong direction on the inside line. Sage Karam it is. That car cannot feel very happy. He's uh, He was. Is he still scoring points? No, Sage Karam must now be behind. Uh, no, he is still storing points for Team Australia because, of course, Phil Denez is uh, basically out of this race uh, in pits waiting for his car to be repaired. Uh, and to be honest, looking, if he is watching Sage Karam, he'll think, actually, I probably could or should get back out on the circuit, although he's two laps down now. It may not be worth it. But Sage Karam is losing a lot of time. And here is Jack Crawford now under huge pressure. He's lost his buddy, his Finnish buddy, and now he's got a new buddy in Danny Yukandela. Now, Team Spain need points because at the moment they are in fourth position behind Team GB because uh, in that battle with Bradley Philpot is also um, the Spanish driver, or was the Spanish driver, uh, Alex Palou was in there, but I think he's now ahead. So maybe my timing screen hasn't quite caught up with itself, but it's very, very close. Team USA, Team GB, Team Spain, Team Netherlands separated by 10 points. Uh, so every point counts as we now have pit visitors. Sage Karam in the pits, Bradley Philpott in the pits and Manuel Alves. And I think uh, Bradley Philpott, by the way. Oh, Stefan Wilson. What just happened to Stefan Wilson down the timing screen from third? Oh, another issue through that very tricky corner. It's not a place you really should be spinning. He rejoins as a seventh and eighth places cars come past. But that's a disaster for Team GB. On that last lap, they had clicked up into second in the standings uh, because of the promotion of the various drivers uh, and movement in the field. But now, Karim uh, Stefan Wilson is losing huge points for Team GB. What happened? Let's have a look through the S's. This is easy peasy. Oh, just got a little bit of a slide on and kept it out of the barriers. Yee! Scary for Danny Yucadella there and Zach Campbell coming past. But at least he didn't pick up damage. And there are so many cars out there with damage. That will be a benefit. He's, he's now 21 back uh, from the lead. So I'd say he lost about 10, 11 seconds there. Uh, but all is not lost for Stefan Wilson. And he is still, somehow, the top Brit. I think that speaks more to the tough day it's been for uh, the Team GB in this first uh, portion of the finals. I will say, though... I wonder if that car got a little unsettled over that curb through the S's. We'll see if a number of other cars have similar issues. Sage with a very similar crash a couple of laps ago. Too wide, too deep, though, into this second chicane. Germany getting past Spain. Yeah, Sage's crash was a little bit later on. He was more in the turn in to Tetra Rouge, where he still had wheels on the grass. Whereas, as you rightly say, that one was more of a, an unsettling. There is a kind of... There's an on camber through the right hand side and as you come out of it you kind of pop out of it and it does it does almost go off camber and drags the rear end of the car around so stefan wilson having done five laps at that corner just been caught out on the fifth lap uh, by that particular section of turns it looks from a wide camera angle simple as but actually the road like like you would expect from a, a, a track that's had so many years of character it does do things to the car and there's lots of different camera changes all the way around this uh, Le Mans 24 hour circuit de la Salle. And what a great recreation we have on the iRacing service. It's uh, a version where a couple of years old like you did mention but all those details brought to life not just the trackside details as well but the little things out on the track curbs the, the various reference points as well. These are all things that when these real life drivers come on to the virtual service they learn and they practice these tracks as much as they can because of course you can't get the seat time in the real world so for all these drivers that have lots of experience at this track Ben I have a feeling it didn't take them long to get back up to speed yeah it's interesting uh, I spoke to the guys at iRacing uh, I think it was for the VCO awards ceremony um, and they were talking about uh, building new tracks obviously there's a, a couple of tracks that they've announced uh, that are in build uh, and for the European circuits, it's a different team of scanners uh, to the tracks that are built uh, over in America. So the iRacing in-house team effectively uh, do it uh, over in America. But because of the travel and, okay, as, as well this year with the restrictions, uh, they do have a, a team uh, over here as now everybody comes into the pits. Uh, both Australia cars 
from first and second into the pits. And behind them, Jack Crawford, job by Neutrate. Now, Danny Yucadella did not pit. So he is going for an undercut, overcut, whatever you want to call it. Everybody else in the top 10 has decided this is the lap. But Spain, Alex Palou also staying out on track. So Spain deciding they don't need to pit right now. I wonder if they're balancing this equation and thinking that the amount of time you get in the draft is not worth the amount of time. In particular, Alex Palou is seeing these groups of cars just battling with one another. Danny Yunkadea all by himself now has clean track then to set some very, very good lap times. You're seeing very quick pit stops as well. Cars already rolling back through into the fast lane. It looks like Spain trying to pull a little bit of strategy fast one here. Yeah, last lap for Danny Yucadella, a four minutes point one. Um, and I think it was his best lap of the race so far. Um, maybe not quite. Uh, but that would have been with the help of a slipstream from Jack Crawford, which now he doesn't have. And I questioned this when we were talking about the six hours uh, of wherever we were last out. A Monza, of course. Uh, and by not being in the toe, how much time are you losing to your best lap when you were in the toe if you were racing with somebody who was like, like Jack Crawford has been throughout the whole of this race, actually, pretty compliant with other drivers? Um, we, yeah, so uh, we're very interesting to see. Basically, everyone's pitted other than Team Spain, Daniel Cadella and Alex Palou, the top two in Spain, of course. Now, this lap, Spain looking very, very handy in the, all, in the uh, point standings. Uh, but they owe us a pit stop. Daniel Cudella was fourth when he came, uh, when that pit stop happened. Expected to come in this lap with 13 minutes remaining. Where will he come out? Probably unable to get too much closer to the two uh, Australian cars that lead. Now the issue for those guys is traffic. Have they come out to traffic? Are they being stuck behind slower cars? And the danger that that entails. And also, Ben, I've just realized 40 minutes here this is literally half of the racing action that these finals have and it's only one third of the points it's slightly misweighted if you look at it that way <laughs> and for some of the australian drivers they'll be very happy for the likes of sage Karam, not sure they'll be so happy so as we head into these next two races multidisciplinary that williams f1 car is going to be a big game changer just like that holden v8 supercar was very interesting kind of a situation being presented to these teams this is Stefan Wilson uh, recovering, obviously, from that spin. Jesse Crone just ahead recovering also from that spin. But they're in eighth and ninth position, so they haven't really lost out too much. And it's possible that Alex Palou would fall behind them when he comes into the pit. So uh, still a pretty decent result for them. But in that last lap, the U GB has gone from second in the team standings down to sixth in the team standings. So that's how important uh, the spin was for uh, Stefan Wilson and Wilson having the opportunity of course to start at the head of the field thanks to Tom Ingram's performance in the pole race uh, obviously Ingram at the tail of the field being the most performant of the Brits and getting caught up in all kinds of mess we've got Spain versus Canada Miguel Molina versus Bradley Philpott not there uh, so that is who's this Canadian car there Robert uh, Wickens it's Robert Wickens okay Miguel Molina and Robert Wickens therefore on the right-hand side and on the left-hand side, Stefan Wilson defending and, oh, a little bit of contact. Looks a bit like net code, to be honest. But uh, he then got moved out of the way. I think that was an attempt at a pass from Stefan Wilson, but just put himself in the wrong part of the track. Right, Danny Ucadella into the pits. And let's see if Alex Palau is going to follow him down. Where is Bart Horston and Nick Foster going to factor into this equation? They've been separated through the pit stop cycle. 2.3 seconds between the two teammates at this point in time. As we watch the finished car making its way through the Porsche curves, Danny Yunkader rolls into his pit box. Bart Horston was uh, second to Nick Foster before the pit stops, I believe. Uh, I don't think we saw them change position. So we have seen them change position in the pit stops. Here's Yucadella coming out of the pits. There is one uh, Team Australia car going past. And the second one goes past as well with the uh, bright green wheels. Where's Zach Crawford in all of this? Uh, not that one. Zach Crawford behind. So Danny Yucadella jumps Zach Crawford in the pits. And now Team Spain up to P3. 
I'm taking a look at these standings very close between some of these nations right now. Danny Yonkadea, only stationary in the pit lane there, Ben, for 10 seconds. He saved almost 5 seconds on Bart Horston. Jack Crawford somehow only spent 8.5 seconds stationary in the pit lane as the Team Finland car gets very loose through turn number one. I'm wondering if some of these teams have maybe miscalculated the fuel. Okay, that's interesting. A little bit of... Uh lift and coast and saving fuel then needed. Stefan Wilson needs to clear uh, Jesse Crone pretty quickly because he's got Matt Campbell coming up behind him. And at the moment, Matt Campbell's amazingly, his uh, points don't count for anything. Uh, he's the third of the Team Australia cars, having been at the very head of the field throughout this race. Such is the pace and performance of Team Australia. Uh, um, strength and depth, I think Nick Foster hasn't scored her points uh, for the team all day, but he's been solid out front uh, in that uh, second, well, it was the lead car, wasn't it? But he's now lost the lead to Bart Horsten. And it's a 1-2 for Team Australia. Uh, but I don't understand. Okay, we've got to wait for our team standings to update. But Stefan Wilson's made that move much cleaner this time through the chicane than he did when he was over at Arnage. And now he can set about chasing down Alex Palou, who is only, uh, well, there he is, just up the road, two seconds. And he's going to have to be watching in that mirror. I think Matt Campbell will get on past Jesse Crone potentially this very same lap and try to see if he can close in on Stefan Wilson. I will say, by the way, Ben, I only found out that I was commentating on this event yesterday. And so when I searched up Nick <laughs> Foster, I expected to find the Australian racing driver. I found the English racing driver instead. But Nick is a really quick GT driver as well. And he's showing that in the GT3 machines, where he has a lot of experience competing in the IGTC, can get very very comfortable and find a lot of speed yeah nick's had uh, all kinds of different uh, opportunities did some touring car racing i seem to remember before moving into gts and and gts is rare rare he's really been able to flourish uh, and obviously enjoy a much greater opportunity of um different racing disciplines and places to go as soon as you start racing gt3 you can race it anywhere jesse crone getting very loose there through Molsan and it's an easy pass for Matt Campbell without too much drama. Now, who's the next one in the queue? Is that Robert Wickings? No, it's not. It's a German car, so it's Mario Zug. Yeah, Mario Zug at the tail end of the queue right now. Matt Campbell trying to get past Stefan Wilson as well. Side by side, they work. Here comes Jesse Krohn as well. Ooh, three wide for a moment. This is getting very dicey, Ben. Yeah, well, as we're getting closer, just eight minutes remaining. Now this is starting to matter. And Stefan Wilson trying to go around the outside into Indianapolis. Oh, there's a bit of contact. And Jesse Crone gets spun around. That was a weird one because you'd expect it from another car. Yeesh, that was close. But uh, Miguel Molina and Robert Wickens avoid chaos there. Now, Jesse Crone was always going to hang himself out on the exit of Indianapolis. And I'm surprised that it was him that went spinning. It was almost like he got a little bit loose uh, and kind of ended up parking himself in front of Stefan Wilson. Yeah, a bit of a weird one. Maybe we can take a look at a, an aerial angle of this. It kind of seems like Crone washes out wide, but very close call then for Miguel Molina and Robert Wickens as they come on through. Wickens takes advantage as they've gotten past as well now. Here's that aerial look. We'll take a look at it here and watch at the exit then. Yeah, does the finished car get loose? There's a bit of movement, isn't there? It's a bit of a weird movement. It doesn't look like he's properly sliding. Ooh, Jack Crawford in the pits. Why is Jack Crawford in the pits for a second time? Disaster for Team USA. Well, he was stationary for only eight seconds, as I was saying. I now wonder if Danny Youngkadea has also spent a little bit too less time, uh, little time in the pit lane getting fuel. Jack Crawford drops now through the top ten. He's going to come out, I think, right behind Robert Wickens. And another Team Spain into the wall in the background. That would have been Miguel Molina, I think. He was battling with Robert Wickens and now is no longer. So uh, that's not looking very good for Team Spain. Although Molina actually wasn't scoring points for Spain because uh, Alex Palou is in sixth and Daniel Cadella is in third position. This is what happened. Did he do it all by himself? It's quite easy to do it all by yourself, especially over these curbs. Yep. Two tires into the gravel and the gravel bit back. Unfortunately for Miguel Molina, that was a really fun fight he was having with Robert Wickens. Like you said, not for point. Danny Yunkadea and Alex Palou having a very strong race here with six minutes left on the clock. Now, I'm not sure entirely if that's 
completely correct because of course we've just had a pit stop from Team USA but Australia ahead of Spain in second Netherlands third Netherlands oh yeah fourth and fifth Job van Oetroot and uh, Richard Verschoor that's been very quiet hasn't it but they've uh, got themselves into the third thanks to those two and then Team USA fourth I think they might be behind Team GB now but Team GB stronger earlier on than they are now uh, Bradley Philpott in 13th position Stefan Wilpen in 8th and uh, obviously a lot better when Stefan was up in the top three. Yeah, it's been a bit of a mix-up. This long 40-minute race has seen one team at the front, Australia, pretty much since the start of the race. And then that battle for second and third has been very, very intriguing. Germany now tries to get past Stefan Wilson in this battle. Uh, Elias Sapanen, by the way, has had an issue as well. So in that Finland car where, of course, Jesse Krohn was having a very good run, that team will fall down the order as well. Plenty of cars bailing out of this race, unfortunately. We have lost Raul Hyman and Gennaro Bonafede, so South Africa picking up no points at all. Elisa Peinen, uh, normally the point scorer for Finland, he is also still in pit lane. Uh, and obviously Phil Dennis uh, has been reliable, uh, but when he has to start at the back of the field, it's a dull different story. That was Stefan Wilson then ahead of Marius Zug for eighth position. And Wilson is starting to uh, make amends for his error all on his own and the S's and able to follow Matt Campbell behind and uh, amazing that, to say that Matt Campbell seventh position but the third best Australian car and I did shout out Team USA I probably should have shouted out uh, Team Australia as well because well Matt Campbell not necessarily signed up and affiliated with any of the sim racing teams but he has been participating and the main attraction, if you ask me, in the Porsche All-Star Support Series for the Porsche Tag Heuer Esports Super Cup. He's been, you know, a, a really nice competitor in that series, competing with some of the top sim racing influencers as well. Shown that he's got a lot of pace and today, Ben, very consistent across all of the disciplines he's been competing in. Now, if you're wondering who Bart Horsten is, uh, he is an Australian racing in the BRDC British Formula 3 Championship. Uh, so still pretty young, uh, born in 2002. So yeah, that's pretty young. Um, and although he is Australian, uh, like all Australians, uh, well, like every Australian I know, uh, he has dual nationality, so he's also Irish. Uh, so he could be racing for Team Ireland. Uh, but uh, just in his early stages of his single-seater career, uh, having done Australian Formula Ford, now moving across into the British series and he's picked up a couple of victories uh, in the British F4 championship before uh, moving on to British F3 and will be in British F3 for 2021 as well. So uh, representing Australia, although racing from the United Kingdom uh, and also with an Irish passport. Sounds like me, I'm, I'm, I'm nearly as mongrel as that. Oh, I, I can compete there as well. But interesting, <laughs> I actually didn't realize uh, I was commentating on Bart this morning in the Porsche Esports Carrera Cup Great Britain and trying to figure out why he was representing Australia within the iRacing service, but competing in the British National Championship. So that explains things a little bit more. Looks like Miguel Molina, by the way, has had another issue. So a disappointing end to this race for him, but another driver, Ben, that's really impressed me with some of his performances. Yeah, I mean, uh, he's... Uh... Unfortunately, he's not picking up points for Spain anyway. That was a huge accident. Huge accident. Um, but uh, he's been very, very strong. And here comes now for sixth position a change. Matt Campbell ahead of Alex Palou. So that's taking... Is that uh, is taking points away from Spain, isn't it? Even though Matt Campbell won't score points, it does mean that Spain will lose points because uh, there is a car in front of them. Well, talking about this points picture, Ben, there's just been a big update. Stefan Wilson at one point running in third. He's had a small issue down into 11th. Here comes the RaceBot TV replay as we take a look. And it's through the very same corner. He loses it very early. Rear end steps out on him, noses it into the wall. Stefan Wilson down to 11th. Oh, dear. That's more points lost for Team GB. They were looking so, so strong. It's 12th position as he goes behind Rafael Lobato as well. And he is still the highest scoring Brit. So suddenly, Team GB are looking very, very thin on points when it was looking so good before. Bradley's Philpot down in 17th position. Will Stevens, 22nd position. Tom Ingram, 18th. So 
really not looking good for them. But also, to be fair, not looking that great for Team USA. Okay. Um, hang on. Zach Crawford down the 13th because of his second pit stop. Uh, Sage Karam 19th and Phil Dennis retired. So uh, it's going to be a big change around when we go to Indianapolis in a few moments' time. And I'm taking a look at these standings. They are yet to be updated, so I'm not sure if we're going to pop them up on your screen at this point in time. But there's a tie right now for second. Team Spain and Team Netherlands tied on 155, 35 points behind Team Australia. Team Australia started off this 40-minute race looking very, very comfortable. But as we head into these dying stages, last lap right now, Ben, it's looking like Spain and Netherlands might be the main competition. I have, I've also managed to get my Nick Fosters confused as well, because uh, there is a Nick Foster that was, is a British businessman and raced GTs in the UK, uh, but this Nick Foster, as I think you were saying, is the one that races LMPs uh, in Asia. Um, and also, interestingly, took part in the SRO Championship on a Seto Corsa Competizione, so a completely different uh, platform, but... Nick wasn't looking that strong, to be honest, in the first couple of races, but he's really done a great job for Team Australia in this second race. Bart Horsten doing a lap of honour like you would do after a 24-hour race, being very cautious on this last lap. And yes, he had the benefit of a relatively good uh, qualifying position, thanks to his teammate. Look, they're going to they're gonna come across the line side by side. He's slowed down so they can formation fly across the line for Team Australia. Very, very classy, Bart. Bart wins ahead of Nick Foster in second position and a photo for all the Australians around the world. I love that. Well done, boys. Behind from the very tail of the field. Oh, that's not very kind. Um, Danny Yukundela comes over in third position from 26th on the grid, I think it was. Uh, and that will be very, very welcome points for Team Spain. Here is a recovering Stefan Wilson. And uh, he is saying that Stefan Wilson's in eighth position. I don't think that's completely correct. No, we're, st we're still waiting for that to be uh, corrected. So uh, his number in the windscreen will drop as he comes across the line. Oh, my God. Did he even get across the line? I think he was running out of fuel. He almost stopped on the line, but he drops to P12 in the end. And uh, another position lost from Bradley Philpot by the looks of things. Philpot's dropping down the order too. Over the line for Portugal comes Manuel Alves. And ahead of him, Alex Elise. Where's Bradley Philpot? Bradley Philpot's lost another two positions. He hasn't crossed the line. I think Philpot may have run out of fuel or had a crash on the very last lap. He comes across the line and it's more bad news for Team GB. Bradley Philpot, the second point scorer for Team GB. Only 17, only one position ahead of Tom Ingram. Philpot had to come down onto the pit lane on that white flag lap then, Ben. So that's why he's fallen down all the way into 17th position. Another car not calculating the fuel properly. Oh. Well, there you go. Just 10 laps around the Le Mans Circuit de la Sarte in 40 minutes. Bart Horsten and Nick Foster pick up maximum points for Team Australia. Spain picking up a third and a seventh with Daniel Cadella and Alex Palou. But Jobban Oitro and Richard Vershaw doing a quiet thing, uh, drive for fourth and fifth. So uh, Team Netherlands looking very, very strong when they didn't really feature at all in our uh, preliminary races. Uh, Team Germany, Maris Zug picking up some points for eighth position. Then Jesse Crone, the best of the Finnish drivers. And Robert Wickens, the best once again of the Canadian drivers in P10. Portugal picking up points for 11th, Rafael Abato. Uh, that's much, much better for Team Portugal. Team GB with their first points in 12th. Team USA's first points. 13th for Jack Crawford. In Norway's first points, Christian Krones in 14th position. Alex Elise, the second point scorer for Canada. And the second point scorer for Portugal is Manuel Alves. Bradley Philpot, even though he had to take another pit stop, still scores for Team GB in 17th. And then Miguel Molina, no score for Spain. Tom Ingram, no score for GB. Sage Karam does score 20th, 90, uh, uh, 1 minute and 38 seconds back in the end. And Team USA need a big result when we go to Indianapolis next time. 
Francesco Mora in 21st, Will Stevens in 22nd, Daniel Morad in 23rd, the second Norwegian driver is Ala Algren, Hendrik Kostad just behind. These cars looked as though they were retirees. Elias Sapainen uh, finished points, although he retired. Raul Hyman and Gennaro Buffedo both retired for South Africa. Then Phil Dennis being caught up in loads of accidents early doors, as was Ben Viscal. Fights Gavissa, Alex Alcarez, Mike Rockenfeller, points for Germany, but 33rd, Jens Klingman, 34th. It's been a horrible night for Mike Rockenfeller. Not a great day for Germany either. I mean, I expected maybe a little bit more, not because they have the most sim experience, but because they're very, very talented drivers. Here we take a look then at that photo finish. It's only fitting. You come to uh, the circuit de la Salle, you finish one and two, you might as well do it in the best way possible, Ben. That is super classy, right? I mean, Bart had a, an 18, was he an 18, 19 year old kid with a four and a half second advantage over your teammate. And he, I say on those last couple of corners, like he's driving this like at the end of a 24 hour race. He's so slow. And of course he was waiting for Nick to come across the line together. Super classy. Love that. And that will be a great photo from our VTO photographers uh, that are hunting for images to show exactly uh, the story of this competition this evening. We've still got two more races. We've got a 20 lap race at Indianapolis coming up for you and then a 20 minute race with the Formula One cars around Monza. Uh, of course, the Williams Formula One car because uh, really this is Williams's idea. Um, the head of Williams Esports uh, really came up with this concept and brought it to life. And it's a very, very cool concept, I think. Dare I say it, I think it works even better with these pro drivers than it does with the sim drivers. I don't know why. The one thing I know is this one day format definitely feels a lot more rapid. We're already now into the second portion of the finals. We're in this Indianapolis Motor Speedway race, about to get going. Cars are joining, heading out onto track, getting a bit of practice. I'm taking a look at the track conditions then, Ben. 46 degrees track temperature. Hot or cold? <laughs> Uh, I'm, let me do my C to Celsius to Fahrenheit conversions because unfortunately when you work with an IndyCar team uh, that's mostly based in America, you do it based in Fahrenheit, that's pretty warm, 115 degrees Fahrenheit. Usually the iRacing Indy 500 is around 119, so it's a little bit cooler, but it is not going to be easy and expect all the cars to need to use those in-car tools. All right, 190 points, full points for Team Australia with Spain and Netherlands on 155 each and then 79 back team canada in fourth portugal in fifth finland in sixth team gb down to seventh germany eighth usa ninth norway tenth about 100 points back and then south africa in last position coming into this race but as i say there are still that was just one set of points we've got another set of points for indianapolis and another set of points for the f1 so we are only a third of the way through our finals in terms of points, in terms of time, much less. There we go. There they are again. So really difficult to read into things too much here. It's very close mid-pack, but Team USA, Team GB, even Finland should have had much, much better runs. And I mean, look at that. Team Germany with two cars in the pits on lap one, still ahead of Team USA. Yeah, it's going to be a big uphill struggle now for Phil Dinez, Jack Crawford, and Sage Karam. Don't count them out, though. Of course, we now head to the track that Sage Karam is going to be the most experienced at. And of course, with fixed setups and no cautions, needing to manage risk versus reward, I wonder if Sage will be the one to stand at the front. Quickest in practice right now, though, Raul Hyman. It's been a fairly tough day for the South African driver. This might be the one race that maybe goes his way. Yeah. Wouldn't South Africa love some points? I'm not quite sure they're going to end up with a 1-2 like Team Australia. Remember, we do now go into a kind of more conventional grid. I've actually found my Excel spreadsheet that shows me what the grid's going to be. Phil Dennis is going to be on the pole position. Matt Campbell is going to be second. And Danny Yukadella third with Bradley Philpott fourth. So now we've got the fast guys back at the front of the field. So really, the only mixed up reverse grid type of a race that we had was that first one at Le Mans. There is the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, 2.5 miles, 4.02 kilometers. 
and uh, it's just it's just a circle, isn't it? <laughs> it's just a circle, but don't get confused. Each of those four corners of the racetrack very different, and when you have to deal with changing track conditions, the wind blowing into each of those corners. I can't tell you how many times I crashed in the build-up for last year's Indy 500, uh, Ben, but to try and illustrate it, let me try and talk about qualifying. You get a week of qualifying in the iRacing Indy 500, unlimited attempts. Everyone starts off with that coveted A license, and by the end of the week, I had found myself in danger of becoming a C license holder because I spent so much time crashing at this track, running by myself. It is not <laughs> as easy as just turn left and, and, and keep it as simple as that. There's a lot of strategy, a lot of c planning that goes into this. It's really interesting to see, you know, a lot of these guys, Max Verstappen, for example, finds himself on the iRacing service doing these IndyCar races because it's very challenging and very fun. I, I, and it really engages your brain in a way that circuit racing doesn't necessarily. You have to do so much more thinking. Uh, I was gutted that I was too busy to do the Daytona 500, which was kind of my target. Uh, and anyone who was watching the VCO chat show knows that that was my target for the, uh, um, for, the NAS, for the last week, wasn't it? And just ran out of time to get the license correctly, but definitely something I need to focus on. Right, here we go then. Bill Dennis on the pole, Matt Campbell second, Daniel Cadella, Bradley Philpott. They will be our front four. Marius Zug finished eighth last time in Le Mans, and Team Germany will be happy with that in fifth position. Sepainen will be looking to get a decent point score for Finland in seventh, Alex Elise in eighth, Raphael Lobato ninth, Christian Kronis in tenth for Team Norway, General Bonafede for South Africa in eleventh, Jack Crawford twelfth position for Team USA. Bart Horsten in thirteenth position, our race one winner, Alex Palou in 14th, Tom Ingram, then Jens Klingman, Jobran Oiterich 17th, Team New Netherlands some work to do, Jesse Krohn in 18th position, and then Daniel Morad, Manuel Alves, Henrik Krostad, Raul Hyman 22nd, Sage Karam 23rd, Nick Foster 24th, work to do, and then Alex Alcaraz, Will Stevens, Mike Rockenfeller, Bites Kavissa, Robert Wickens, Francisco Mora, and the last couple of drivers, Ale Algren, Melguel Molina, Stefan Wilson, and Ben Fiskel. Right, so how many of these guys have got oval racing experience? There actually is quite a few there. Stefan Wilson for one, for sure. Uh, Alex Palou, I would have said, has got oval racing experience as well. Um, Robert Wickens, of course, I think this could be Robert's strongest race because he doesn't have to worry so much about braking and all that. Um, out of that, uh, in real world oval racing, I don't see any other names that I would recognize. I think the biggest challenge though, Will, uh, Ben, is 25 laps, no cautions, keep yourself clean. You touch the wall, even by yourself, you'll find yourself 10, 20 kilometers an hour down on these straightaways. And with 25 laps, you do not have the time to come down, get any type of repairs, and head back out onto track. So for someone like Phil Dinez out front with Matt Campbell, this is the prime opportunity to score points for their team. And remember, those teams that have more than two drivers, they almost can use that third driver uh, as strategically, let's say. They could do something with that third driver to disrupt the other person. There's so many ways to impede another person's performance by blocking them, by henning them in and, and creating a box situation that so many things can be done once these guys sort themselves out at the moment of course they're all split uh, across evenly away from their teammates but as we go further into this race we may see that strategy start to form how will phil dennis deal with the start of this race sometimes as soon as that pace car goes in the guys floor it. It means that the field spreads pretty quickly. Some others like to hold it a bit tighter. It's pretty tight at the front of the field. And the green flag flies at Indianapolis. We've got just 20 laps to get this race done. And already the squabbling begins. And at the front of your field, single foul. Oh, no, no, Phil Dinez has lost it all by himself. And the new damage model is about to take no prisoners. 
Oh, Bradley Philpott also being spun around. He got caught just at the last moment there. There's chaos. There's a South African car definitely with bits hanging off it. But it, you rightly say Phil Dennis lost the rear end of his car. And when the leader loses it in front of a pack of 35, all chaos ensues. It split the pack up massively. Sage Caram's in the pits. Bradley Philpott's in the pits. Elias Sapanen's in the pits. Raphael Abato's in the pits. Christian Cronin's is in the pits. Jack Crawford's in the pits. Alex Palou's in the pits. Tom Ingram's in the pits. Oh, we've got about half the field that have not made it through turn for race for lap one. And I think out front right now, it's Australia versus Spain. Danny Yonkadea versus Matt Campbell. Two drivers with no oval racing experience at all. Battling it out up front. Single file throughout the rest of your field, though. A number of cars. It looks like about 15 or so, Ben, down on pit lane. Yeah, I reckon we've got... Um, I reckon we have got uh, 16 cars in total. Oh, the second South African car into the wall. That's Bonafede. Just a little touch there uh, with Jesse Crowen, I think it was. And that sent him hard into the wall. Miguel Molina from third position also in the pits. And this is going to be a battle of attrition. I think we've got, well, we've got well over half a field now in the pits. They will be wanting to carry on. Because if they actually retire out of this race, there's potential, there's potential for another whole different race, a couple of laps down, picking up significant points for their teams. Uh, such is the amount of cars that are in the pits right now. And they do get one free fast repair. So I would expect, like you say, all of these teams to come down onto pit road, take advantage of that fast repair. Out front now, completing lap number three, Danny Uncadella tucked in behind Matt Campbell. And this is where, Ben, you start to do the testing. You try and figure out where you need to place your car out of turn four to get the run to beat the other car to the line and get to the checkered flag first. This is where Danny Yonkadea has to start downloading the data to start processing it for the end of the race. Yeah, so the guys are now starting to cut out of pit lane. Those people who got caught up in that first accident. Here is the replay. Phil Dennis losing it all on his own and then just gets collected and collected and collected. There was actually another car uh, flying behind him on his own so a second accident uh, but most of the cars are now heading back out onto track albeit two laps down we do very much have two races on our hands and indeed we're gonna have a real mixed up field and there's gonna be traffic for these guys to contend with i think later on in the race team australia lead team spain oh and a car further back in the wall i think that was Marius zug it is zug for germany making a mistake on his own as well and into the wall so ignore that live points because that's going to change again uh team australia team spain team holland and there is team germany having a large accident all on their own and he's going to have to be towed back to the pits and that's what's going to take the time there it's alex at least for canada in fourth then australia in the fifth position so again australia first and fifth jesse crone for finland sixth job brown Oterate, seventh for team netherlands we've got two netherlands cars still running Manuel Alves is the best of Portuguese cars. Then Hendrik Krostad for Norway. Stefan Wilson for the UK. Bent Viskel for, for Netherlands. And Francisco Mora for Portugal. So basically Netherlands, Portugal and Australia are the only cars that have got two cars running on the lead lap. And it's absolute chaos right now. A couple of German cars into the wall. A couple of Spanish cars into the wall a few moments ago. Now Jesse Krohn on pit exit uh, with couple of left side wheels dangling from his car 11 cars now on the lead lap ben that is it everyone else is at least one lap down and i can't even figure out what the point situation is actually looking like that was richard Vershaw just making a little bit of contact uh, with marius zug it was enough to just push marius zug into the wall so he did not lose it all on his own and zug is now getting his car serviced but he's still in 15th position so it's still not that bad especially for team germany uh, who have rocky in 23rd position and jens klingman retiring straight away out of the race so official word and official uh, damage counter if you will from race control 20 cars lost in four laps that's the extent of the damage here at the brickyard and as we tick away the laps it's now danny yonkadea with the clean air bend and as we work through this green flag run with only 25 laps to work with those tires will start to fall off later in the run at what point do you want to make sure that you're in front of your competitors behind well also can you not if you are a single driver without any help out there like we see for team spain Danny Yucadella could get onto his, the radio 
to one of the drivers who are a lot further back, the likes of, uh, uh, who is it, Alex Palou, he's still in the pits, Miguel Molina's also in the pits, so his teammates are in the pits way down. Get one of those guys to get back out on the circuit and to help Jan Junkadella out. Bring him into the position where you can then tow him away from this team Australia car. And, you know, Spain at the moment, they came into this equal in second position. And now he goes to the lead, they're third at the moment, because Netherlands have got two, three drivers on the lead lap. Yeah, a bit of swap drafting out front, as you usually see here at the Brickyard. Taking a look at the live point situation, though, Australia building up a bit of an advantage. The Netherlands coming into the equation, Spain starting to drop off. You mentioned Miguel Molina and Alex Palou having some issues, Ben. They don't need to just get back onto track to help their teammate in terms of this battle out front. They need the points as well. Expect yeah. to see those Spanish cars pushing very hard. Yeah, absolutely. Bart Horstein, by the way, fastest lap of the race, sitting there in fifth position because he's got a nice, heavy slipstream from uh, the Canadian car of Alex Elise ahead of him uh, and Richard Vershaw. So there's a three car. And we've got a Team Germany car uh, heading into pit lane there, I saw. I uh, don't know how many Team Germany cars are still running. Uh, Marius Zug is there. Um, and Rocky's actually out on track. So that must have been Zug getting himself back to pit lane, although albeit three laps back. Phil Dennis, by the way, 12th position for Team USA. So even though he made that massive error and crashed, oh, he's back in the pits. Oh, no. I was just about to say he was picking up decent points, but he's not any longer. Sage Karam is 24th, and it's just fallen apart for Team USA. Take a look at this onboard look. Not sure exactly what's going to happen, but you can see 3-4 wide on board with Jens Klingman. I would have to assume this is turn number one. Ooh! Just the... Team GB car loses it in front of him. Klingman has nowhere to go and end over end goes the German. Yeah, and that was on lap one. And then he basically bailed out straight away. It was Mike Rockefeller who's now gone into pit lane and retired out the race. Phil Dennis has retired out the race. These are guys who are having their second accidents of the night and they no longer have that fast repair and they just think it's not much point going back out in the circuit. There's going to be a lot of them that are doing that. And it does mean that all of the USA cars are out. They're not just out in pit lane. All three drivers have left the session as well. Those three cars will not be taking back out onto the track. And the team that I picked at the start of this one to be your strong contenders, Ben, as we head into the final race of today's action, out of the count. Junkadella still leads, but look, by swapping uh, positions, it's been a very good couple of laps from Richard Vershaw. Uh, in the Team Netherlands car. He's now almost dragged up to the tail of our two leaders, and this could become a three-way fight. And suddenly, when it's a three-way fight, it's much more complicated to kind of predict and to strategize. It'll be interesting, that final run as well. We're approaching this halfway point. The tyres must start to be feeling a little bit worse for the wear. Down to the inside, Matt Campbell goes once again. Richard Vershaw, though, might be in this situation, Ben, where he can just save those tyres, maybe try and roll around the corner with as least uh, you know, scrubbing as possible and try and save the tyres for the last couple of laps in the race. Would tyres be much of a thing, do you think, in a 25-lap yes. race? Yeah, OK. Yes. With uh, clean air being so important, especially with the aero screen, Ben, it raised the center, the weight of the car. It made it much more difficult to work through dirty air. You scrub the tires off much faster as well now. Your fuel window in a regular Indy 500 race is between 32 to 35 laps, so we're almost looking at a full green flag run here. Oh, Tom Ingram losing the rear end and being collected there by a Team Norway car. Ooh, nearly comes back and collects more. Ingram losing, just losing it on his own, but it's, it's proving exactly what we said at the very start. It's not just a circle. And I think a couple of the drivers have realized as well that if you get below that white line down onto the apron and you touch the curb, as Phil Dines did on lap number one, turn number one, there's nothing you can do. The car goes from underneath you, and even a very experienced driver who's competed on ovals on the road to Indy ladder found himself being caught out. So this is the battle for seventh position, Krostad, Alves and Wilson. Best of the Norwegians, best of the Portuguese and best of the Brits. A lot of weaving going on. It's going to be very, very hard to pass. And actually, 
uh, on this particular lap, Stefan Wilson bails out of it and just uh, hangs back a little bit, uh, inviting Viscal, the second, no, third of the Dutch, actually, uh, to pit party. And there's a car parked up on the right-hand side. That could have been Alex Ellis. I think it was Team Canada losing one of their protagonists. And Ellis drops down the, the order uh, in the pit lane. Where's the next best Canadian? Oh, Daniel Morad, Robert Wickens, where are they out on track? Wickens in the pit lane, and so is Daniel Morad. So the only point scorer for the Canadian team finds himself now having to regroup Ben and head back out onto track. Everything rests on Alex Al uh, uh, Elise's shoulders. He just set the fastest lap of the race as well. Uh, and this is what happened all on his own again. It just breaks away. You is know that what that looks again? like? It, it, not line that looked like a little bit too much weight jacker yes there's a fixed setup ben but they have the adjustment for the weight jacker and the arbs that weight jacker helps move the weight around from you know one side of the car to the other you can pitch it a little bit more through the corners and it looked like there that was just set a little bit too aggressively for the car perhaps something that alex ellis won't necessarily have too much knowledge about we're still watching this Fantastic battle for seventh position. This time Alves to the inside, pushing Crossdad to the outside. Crossdad goes all the way around the outside. Is it going to work for him? Uh, where is Stefan Wilson here? So Wilson's dropped behind Viscal, uh, so he's lost a position there, even though that Dutch car isn't scoring points because Vershaw and Oiteret are ahead. It's going to be another good run for, for the Netherlands, just shy of the Australians. The Australians have got two cars in the top five, the Dutch have got two cars in the top uh, five positions as well, actually, yeah. And we'll have to wait for these point standings to be confirmed and official at the end of this race. But as it stands right now, it's going to be a three-horse race heading into the final. Team Australia on 370 points lead the Netherlands by 55 points, with Team Spain a further 12 points back. So three teams in contention as we head to Monza for our final race of the day. Uh, and you would definitely have, at the start of the day, put Australia in there. Uh, and it's just amazing. And I, I would have put the, some of the teams that haven't turned up as well. Uh, but it's just uh, just amazing to see how badly it's gone for Team USA with such strong drivers. But uh, that, is the, that is motorsport, I suppose. That's how it works out. We've nearly lost half the field. We've certainly got less than half the field on track. There's still quite a few people sitting in pit lane. Uh, and he, Nick Foster at the moment sits in 33rd position. Now, he's not needed because he's uh, Team Australia. But if he did go back out, he would instantly gain 15 positions because of the guys ahead of him who have actually retired out the race. And it's the same for Bradley Philpot. He's 23rd right now. Go back out onto circuit and he would be up to 15th. I'm wondering, though, by the way, Ben, just in the leading shot we saw a few moments ago, Richard Vershure has fallen off the back of those front two cars. I'm wondering if the Dutch driver has gone up into the wall and is now riding around for a very comfortable third position. Seven laps to go, and oh yeah, he hit the wall hard coming out of turn number four, and he's down a lot on his top speed. Oh, that's going to be disastrous, because if he hands another position to Bert Horsten, then it's Australia benefiting even more. A first and a second in the first race at Le Mans, and now potentially on course for a first and a third here. Who would have thought Australia would be the dominators of this VCO Cup of Nations, the first pro edition? And it is very much going Australia's way. It just seems everything is clicking as Raul Hyman visits the pits and therefore drops down a position or two. We've got both the South African cars in pits, but in the top 15. <laughs> Well, we've got 10 cars right now on the lead lap, and I think that should explain just how much carnage we had. 34 starters, 10 cars on the lead lap. Bit of connection issues here. Is this Bart Horsten with a connection issue? Uh, we were looking. I just looked at the timing screen. He disappeared for a second, then, then reappeared again. And that will be concerning, especially in an oval. You really need to have a solid connection. Most of all, because of the guys around you need to know where you are when you're racing. And racing in speeds of, you know, excess of 200 miles an hour sometimes as well. So for Horsten, he's still clear of Job Van Oetert. And for Team Netherlands, this is another opportunity then, Ben, to, if they can get past Bart Horsten, they'll close up that gap going into that final race and it'll make it that much more interesting. Yeah, Richard Vershaw now is just at eight tenths of a second ahead of Bart 
uh, horse den and he's only six tenths of a second oh and the Dutch car goes into the wall he wasn't gonna earn any points but Viscal has gone into the wall hard keep it off the track don't collect anybody else it's a big accident and again just got into the wall and threw it all away at least it hands points to Stefan Wilson even if he himself wasn't taking any points and Viscal is out New damage model looks pretty good, doesn't it, Ben? Very realistic, <laughs> and it really doesn't let you get away with anything at all, does it? Uh, absolutely. Lots and lots of work being done on the damage model in iRacing over the last couple of years. Lots of work across 2020. So much feedback coming back from all these pro drivers into iRacing that they had so much information to reprogram. We were getting updates weekly, weren't we, And uh, in the height of kind of March, April uh, last year when when the, the likes of the IndyCar grid, the NASCAR grid, uh, the IMSA WeatherTech Pro Series uh, Invitational was happening as well. They were all feeding back to iRacing saying, it's, it's like this, you should be more like this. And, and we really saw a massive wholesale change. A bit of a change again at the end of last year for the, the update that we have now. Slightly going the wrong way for me on tyres, but uh, ultimately progress, huge progress made across the whole of 2020. We are on to well, coming up to the last lap, where here is Matt Campbell. Has he broken away from Danny Yucadella? Has he made enough of a gap? I don't see the Spanish car. Yeah, not quite close enough to do anything, is he, Danny Yucadella? And coming over the yard of bricks, we're on to the final lap. I think that tyre wear is proving to be crucial. You can see the gaps extended to six tenths of a second as they dive their way down into turn one for the final time. Yankadea unable to really maintain that momentum. And now, it, interestingly, I'm watching further behind. Looks like Job Van Oytert and Richard Verschur are closing in on Bart Horsten. Horsten up into third, Ben. And in this championship picture, heading into the final race, Australia on top. Australia getting another position past the damaged Verschur. Van Oytert would probably just sit and protect his teammate to the end so they can get a fourth and a fifth. But they really, really need to dominate the F1 race in Monza. They've got any chance at all to disturb the Australian domination. Campbell it is who takes victory in this second race after Horstein took victory in the first. A 1-3 for Australia here at Indianapolis after a 1-2 at Le Mans. It really is going all the way of Matt Campbell, Bert Horstein and Nick Foster right now as the remaining cars that are still running take the chequered flag. The Dutch get a fourth and a fifth. Richard Vershaw surviving even though his pace was pretty poor at the end of the race after damage. He stays ahead of his teammate Job Van Oytrecht and it's a fourth and a fifth for the Netherlands. I love Andy car racing. It's just so entertaining and it's such a great kind of crescendo of excitement every time you do an oval race. And that was a really fun one as well. We did have the uh, big crashes at the start, but there was a lot of dynamic elements throughout the race. Matt Campbell takes the win. Yep, Campbell ahead of Junker Dele by half a second in the end. Horsten on that last lap up to third. Netherlands fourth and fifth. Hendrik Krostad holding on ahead of Alvarez. We saw that great battle of Krostad, Alvarez, and then Stefan Wilson for GB in eighth. Portugal, not bad. Seventh and ninth with Francisco Mora, the last man on the lead lap. And then the second Spaniard was Alex Alcaraz. He's really figured all night, but uh, he actually survived, unlike the rest of the Spanish contingent. These cars, at least one repair job. Rafael Labarto for Portugal, Ben Fiscal, Netherlands, four laps down, still P12. Uh, Marin Zug, the first of the Germans, six laps down. The first of the Finns, Elias Sepain in 14th. Christian Kronos in 15th. Raul Hyman for South Africa, 16th, with his teammate in 18th position. Is that the first Canadian car in 17th spot, Alex Ellis? Then Phil Dennis is the first of the USA cars. 17 laps down in 19th position ahead of Ayla Algren. And then those that got heavily involved in early crashes, Tom Ingram, Beitzkevisa, Bradley Philpott. Tom Ingram scoring points for GB down in 21st position. Jesse Krohn, then Robert Wickens, the second of the Canadians. Mike Rockenfeller, the second of the Germans. The second USA driver, Sage Karam, 27th and 19 laps back. Still scoring points, though, for Team USA. Daniel Moride for Canada, and then Will Stevens for Team GB. 
And the last of our four drivers that really didn't turn very many laps at all. Miguel Molina and Alex Palau, just three laps in the books for them. Nick Foster uh, out after one lap. Jens Klingman, well, we saw he didn't make it really round the first corner and bailed out straight away. He probably should have stuck about because he would have had a fast repair. All he needed to do was tow back to the pits. That would have taken him two minutes. Okay, he loses a couple of positions, but he didn't even try that and uh, got straight out of the session. It's been a horrible night for Jens Klingman. I've seen his name at the tail of every result sheet we've had so far. Yeah, and I mean, it started off poorly just in qualifying for that first race at Spa, not really uh, even getting a qualifying lap under his belt. But here we go. We have got one race left. Three and a half hours have all built up to this. A 20-minute sprint race at Monza with the Williams FW31. And Ben, it's Australia versus the Netherlands versus Spain. And we've got that grid again where we have the fastest drivers at the head of the field. So not too much chaos with reverse grids, not too much chaos with the unusual oval nature. But we've got the first chicane to contend with at Monza and cold tyres. We'll see how it goes. Uh, the last time we came here for the final race of the Cup of Nations with the Sim guys, Turn one went well. The rest of the race went just as predictably as uh, you would assume. Lots of chaos, lots of action, and the championship coming all the way down to the wire. The gap's a bit bigger as we enter here. Looks like 65 points, the difference between Australia and the Netherlands. But nevertheless, Australia in the driver's seat being chased down by a couple of countries behind. Just giving everyone a few seconds just to have a look at the graphics. Here they are. Team Australia leading by 65 points over the Netherlands with a slender seven points ahead of Spain. And really, those are the three for the win. Portugal in fourth, amazingly. Norway in fifth, also amazingly. Uh, GB down in sixth position. Canada in seventh. Finland in eighth. Germany in ninth. And then USA. Nip penultimate position with South Africa in last spot. So, can the USA fly that flag at least at half-mast? That will be the aim for Phil Dennis, for Sage Caram and for Jack Crawford. And considering how fast they were in practice, how impressive Sage Caram is generally in his iRacing world, this has been a disaster. An unmitigated disaster, if I'm being quite frank as well. And I will be talking to Sage this coming Wednesday on the RaceBot podcast, Talking Tent. So I will be asking just a little bit about this experience because I know the Team USA guys, Ben, were very excited about this. It was their opportunity to compete against the best in the real world. And all three of them with that sim experience felt fairly confident. But this, I yeah. think, is going to be a total game changer. Not sure exactly how they're going to take to Monza in the FW31 car. Currently, though, they're one and two in practice. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's a weird one, isn't it? The Formula 1 car doesn't get as much love as, as you really would expect. And so the World Championship at the second half of this year will be turning itself to the iRacing Dallara uh, kind of imaginary car, if I'm allowed to say that. Um, and we will see a single-seater World Championship uh, put together. Of course, this car, previously used uh, in the World Championship, and, well, you have to use a Williams when we are conceptualised by Williams at the very core of this event, and it's just a pure, raw racing machine. There are three world champions who won in this car. One of them, Gregor Hutu, very well known. The other one, Martin Kronke, also very well known. The third one, my boss, Hugo Luis, who founded RaceBot TV about seven years ago. The car has evolved very slightly since he won his world championship back in 2011. But the reality is, Ben, it's still raw. It's still visceral. It requires the driver to manage the car over the course of the race, not in the same way a modern F1 car does, this one, you have to manage yourself, how hard you can push from the start of the race all the way to the checkered flag. Got the full slick tyres on, you've got the, the skinnier rear wing and the larger front wing. And there are no driver aids, I seem to remember, is that correct? Yep, no driver aids, of course. Well, it's an yeah. F1 car, you don't need driver aids. These are the best drivers in the world. No, but... Unfortunately, for many a year, Formula 1 did have silly driver aids, um, traction control and all that rubbish, but uh, these, this is a proper, pure, pure racing car. 
and uh, therefore they're going to have to be so careful so careful on that first lap with cold tyres uh, into the first corner cold brakes as well and that first first lap is just going to be tiptoey until everything gets up to temperature and then they can start to push and I imagine that's what some of the guys in practice right now are experiencing um, seen a couple of big accidents just in the back of shop, um, even in practice. But it does look beautiful, and uh, once again, the paint jobs are looking stunning on the chassis. Yeah, we'll give another shout out to iLiveries for all their hard work across the VCO uh, series that they organize. You also mentioned some of the photographers, the virtual photographers that work with VCO. Shout out to the likes of uh, Sam Cobb and uh, Elliot Roberts as well, because they do a great job of documenting these races and those photos now are publicly available on the VCO. I don't know what the exact word for it, Ben, is, but there's a fish, an official photo database that VCO has now. Yeah, and that's part of the offering that VCO uh, give to all of the events that come under their umbrella. Not only do they have uh, media facilities, it's basically like you would have uh, in the real world. They make sure there is press releases, uh, there are race reports, there is media assets to offer, uh, both in photo form, in video form, and in uh, article form. And as you say, all of these, all these guys will be able to uh, pick up those photos and stick them on high res on their backdrops. And I tell you what, that Team Australia photo from Le Mans is gonna be amazing uh, if these guys win it. Here is the track map now. I, the, when we had this track map the other day, we had different names, I'm pretty sure, on the chicanes. We had the proper names, um, Betafilio and uh, all of those. We just got first and second chicane today. Um, the Roggia, the Ascari, and the Retafilio, I think it's called. And then you've got two Lesmos and Curva Grande and Parabolica. It's quite simple, really. It is deceptively simple, you know, Ben. <laughs> As a young F1 fan, I always used to think that this was one of the, the easier tracks, but then you get here, especially now that they've kind of tightened and cracked the whip on track limits here. You can't run so wide through the Lesmos and carry as much speed without getting dinged by the iRacing steward. One very difficult corner though that I didn't appreciate until you really get out there is the Parabolica. It's so key, that long run down into the first corner. You carry so much momentum through that final corner as well. Get the line slightly wrong, you compromise the start of another flying lap. Yeah, exactly. It's completely, completely the key corner to the track. Everywhere else, you're not spending, not carrying lots and lots of speed for a long period of time. But because also the braking zone into the first chicane is so, so heavy, if you are just that slightly bit slower through the parabolica, you're offering yourself up to be absolutely robbed down the start finishing straight into the first chicane in a way that it's not quite as bad anywhere else. Maybe out of Ascari, and Ascari being such a high speed chicane now and, and the need to run curbs, but without running them too much. It's, I noticed that these Formula One cars uh, missing that sausage curb in a way that if you watch a Porsche Esports Super Cup race, they'll be mullering that curb. Um, but you don't want to be as wide as those two cars were. You want to be kissing it so that you can straighten that line as much as possible. And to find that balance, to kiss the curb, but not run over it so you break suspension or get an off track, that's the kind of the key to, to certainly the Ascari, maybe less so in the slower chicane of the first chicane. The second one, probably middle ground, because again, you do have the sausages. I'm now trying to think what's the over under for the number of cars that didn't go flying over that sausage curb. It's very easy to do because speeds through these chicanes are so high, especially Ascari where you could really hustle the car all the way through eight in towards 10. I've seen it on a number of occasions in, in a GT car where the car takes a bit too much of the sausage curb. I think an F1 car might go flying if that happens. Yeah, I think it kind of bottoms out, doesn't it? Uh, you can see how they can really ride the sausage curb do that correctly and it's a beautiful feeling the car floats over it but there is very much a technique to hitting curbs correctly um, you need to have the car unloaded on the inside before you hit it if it's loaded up and it bounces whereas if it's unloaded it just kind of drifts like you've seen those guys uh, doing just a moment ago um, not so easy through the first chicane the first chicane's for me, it's clumsy. It's just really annoying. 
Whereas the other chicanes are much more pleasurable to really get it right. That's the entry to Ascari. So you can see it's a flat curb on the left, although there is, I remember, an off track there. Uh, then, uh, actually, where is that? Uh, I think that was interesting, Ascari, yeah. Um, and yeah, and then you don't want to hit the curb on the right hand side, but you want to stay as far right as possible to open out the exit of the Ascari. You know, I'm just thinking, Ben, about that first corner. You, you know what makes it so tricky? It's the fact that not only do you have to nail the braking zone to slow down in such a short amount of uh, you know, time and space to get the car slowed down, it's also that you have to nail the turn-in point because if you can use as much of the first part of the curve, it sets up that second left-hander and the run through Curva Grande down into the Roger. It's a very frustrating and slow corner, but when you get it right, it is one of the sweetest feelings that you can have. Yeah, race uh, the uh, director there just showing us that it was the second chicane and not Ascari, but that's okay. We're generally talking chicanes. That's a bit of a talking point when you're at uh, uh, when you're at Monza. Uh, as is the pizza, by the way. That's epic. Um, there is the second chicane. See how much more. If you end up in the middle of the road on the right-hand side through the first part of Ascari, you really compromise yourself through the last part and then down into the Parabolica. So you're trying... Whoa, where is he going? He got that very wrong. So you, you want to try and stay as far as you can around the Ascari on the left, like the Netherlands car there. Much cleaner. And then you then have a much cleaner, wider line for the last part to get the power down. You can see how challenging this is. These are pro drivers that have spent years going around the circuit and still all the lines are slightly different everyone is missing just a little bit here a little bit there and that is your tenths and hundredths of a second right uh we have finished practice we're about to go racing phil dennis by the way was fastest in our practice session by half a second here is the starting grid then and he will be on the pole position for Team USA, who need points massively. Matt Campbell second. Daniel Cadella for Spain in the mix of things for this championship. Bradley Philpott for GB, not really much of a chance anymore. Team Germany also missing. Netherlands have got a shot. They need a really strong result. Richard Verschuren sick. Get through the first chicane with no issue. That is important, especially for these guys further down the order. Finland with Elias Sapanen in 7th, Canada with Alex Elise in 8th, and then Rafael Lobato in 9th, Christian Kroners in 10th. South Africa with uh, Gennaro Bonafede in 11th, and then the first, second of the USA cars in 12th. Bart Horst in 13th, Alex Palau for Spain in 14th, then Tom Ingram for GB, Jens Klingmann for Germany in 16th, Job Van Oetre in 17th spot, needs to make progress. Jesse Krohn 18th for Finland. Then Daniel Morad for Canada in 19th, Manuel Alves for Portugal in 20th, Henrik Krostad for, for Norway in 21st, Raul Hyman for South Africa in 22nd. Sage Karam for the USA in 23rd. Damage limitation now for Sage Karam. Nick Foster, the backup man in 24th for Australia. Alex Alcarez scored points for Spain last time out in Indianapolis. Will Stevens for GB in 26th. Mike Rockefeller, 27th for Germany, bites Gavissa for the Netherlands in 28th. Robert Wickens, 29th for Canada. And then Francisco Mora for Portugal in 30th. And the last four on the grid. Ali Agren for Norway. Miguel Molina for Spain. Stefan Wilson will start in 33rd. Bent Viskel will start in 34th position. Very much the backup man. Netherlands have four cars. They only need two to score. Just waiting for the last cars to get themselves into the grid. We're still waiting for Matt Campbell. That's the missing car on the left-hand side. Hasn't yet entered the grid. Just making everybody just wait a little bit longer. Daniel Morad's not there either. Neither is Sage Karam further back or Robert Wickens. Tense times, hard work needed, staying out of trouble from all of those guys racing for Netherlands, racing for Spain. They are doing the chasing. They need to score at least 65 points in the Netherlands case, more than Team Australia. 
in this last race. And what about the USA? They've just failed to score all night. Is this the race for them to elevate themselves from that lowly 10th spot? It's almost, almost embarrassing at the moment. All the cars are in the field and it's a really quick one. It's not a very good start at all for the Australian. We've got one car in the wall in the back of shot already. I think that might be a German car, but being swallowed up is Team Australia. Don't know what he's done there, whether he's bogged down or not. And there's contact. Finnish car goes around. Team Netherlands have got through. We've got British car leading by the looks of things. Bradley Philpott leads. Alex Elise is second. Richard Bershaw is third. Chaos at the chicane. Phil Dennis is only fifth. Matt Campbell is seventh. What happened to the front row? They really, really lost out, but we're still in the early, early stages of these tyres. They need to be super careful. Brakes and tyres are not up to temperature. Tiptoe around this first lap until everything is working. But Bradley Ellis, uh, well, checking out at the front of the field. Where's he gone, actually? Is he still there or have we lost him? I think we may have lost him. I think Richard Vershaw is now leading ahead of Alex Ellis and Bradley Philpott has disappeared according to well, I don't see him the timing screen says he's there but I don't see him I think that's the UK car that was fighting it out with Alex Ellis so, uh, side ah. by side through Ascari they go fantastic stuff but on that race start though uh, Ben the front row just didn't go anywhere Phil Dinez Matt Campbell swarmed by the chasing pack and they're now down on the edge of the top 10 well not good news for Australia at all Matt Campbell seventh position Bart Horston tenth position as the Netherlands move into the lead of the race. The uh, GB car, I don't know why I was not re re recognizing that as a GB car, uh, ahead now of losing a position to Alex Elise. So the Canadian car up into second position. Bradley Philpott looks to the inside line to take that position back in fourth spot. Bradley Dennis way later on the brakes and it's side by side. I think Phil Dennis is gonna take himself up into third position ahead of Bradley Philpott, he does. So not a very good start, but we know that Phil Dennis has the pace. And if he stays out of trouble here, it could be on for a good result. But for the moment, Richard Vershaw needs to check out. Team Netherlands have a first and a sixth, a ninth right now with Jovran Oitroit. Australia have a seventh and a tenth. Oh, look at that for Jack Crawford. He goes spaceship status. And then the biggest crash we've seen all day, still flipping end over end. Uh, a rather big impact there. Going back to the championship points though, Job Van Oetert here, Ben, needs to get up into the top five. The gap between Australia and the Netherlands, as things stand, 29 points. Vershaw out front, now just been passed by Ellis, still needs to hold on to these valuable points because with 17 minutes left to work, it's still Australia in control. Phil Dennis has made a mistake. He's dropped down to sixth position. He was in the top three. There is the contact. It was actually Spain, wasn't it? So that's the hopes of Spain going down the drain. It was Danny Yucadella down to 15th position who got into the tail of the Finnish car. And so it's Alex Palou who now holds uh, the Spanish flag, as it were, in fifth spot. He's looking to try and get passed by the looks of things, or being passed, sorry, by Phil Dennis. But last lap when we saw Phil Dennis at the chicane, he was in third. He's now, well, he's up to fifth, but he went over that line in sixth. And just having a look at the split times, where was his may his error was in the second sector of the lap. I think he may have run a bit deep into the chicane. Uh, he went right wide at the Roggia, but I've just seen the two Australian teammates touching with each other. Matt Campbell is already looking quite slow at this point in time. He's going to get passed around the outside down into the second chicane. Great side-by-side -side action. Campbell holds on, but he's got a hurt car and he's been turned around. Australia in trouble. Oh, Matt Campbell, what's happened? It was a very slow start. He wasn't up to speed. Maybe just not really with the confidence. And now he has to wait for the field to go past. And it, the, the virtual driver almost shakes his head in disbelief. This is what happened. First chicane, Dutch car, Dutch car of Job van Oetroy getting a nail from Bart Horsten behind. And then uh, it was Matt Campbell that went into the tail of him. And uh, now we've got a Norwegian car behind coming into the second chicane. And that Norwegian car is going to run side by side. No, lets him through. Oh, dearie me. That's dreadful driving from the Norwegian car. Uh, what? Ooh, that might have been Christian Krones, but uh, just absolutely awful. We've got a change for the lead. We've got a car off there on the left-hand side. who's uh, bites Kavissa, I think. But Alex Ellis has got ahead of Richard Vershaw and demoted the Netherlands down into second position. Canada now lead. 
and I'm waiting for uh, Race Control to give us that life point situation because as things run, Bart Horston, the first Australian back in eighth place, We've got the Netherlands drivers second and seventh right now. The gap between Australia and the Netherlands then, Ben, 16 points. It's going to come all the way down to the wire. 15 minutes of crazy racing action. Can Australia hold on? So many famous uh, Netherlands drivers, uh, Dutch drivers, sorry, uh, that also are so strong on iRacing, the likes of Max Verstappen, for instance. But these guys don't need Max today. They are starting to get very close to Team Australia. Nick Foster 16, Brett Horst in 8th. That is the Australian points picking up right now. We drive on board with uh, Phil Dennis, who's behind Lobato. So a really good run of things for Rafael Lobato. It started slowly for Team Portugal. We're up into 4th position and then 5th, therefore, in the championship. Australia still hold on to the championship as it stands but only by 16 points over the Netherlands right now. And Job One Oterit does have the ability to get up a couple of positions here. We've got Palu, Lobato and Phil Dennis squabbling ahead. I'm just taking a look at the race picture right now. Where are the rest of their teammates as well? What type of points would they be getting if the competitors up front have big issues? Matt Campbell has dropped down to 21st. Where's Nick Foster? He's only in 16th. Right now has a bit of clean air. If Foster can get up into you know, the tail end of the top 10, Ben, that will make Australia just that little bit more comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. Although if any of our Dutch drivers have an issue, there is not really a uh, reserve driver sitting in the wings for the Dutch. Uh, they uh, have, just trying to see where the rest of them are, to be honest. Uh, I think, well, Bicekevisa has retired, as has Jack Crawford, we saw that. Uh, so that's one of their Dutch drivers. Who is the fourth Dutch driver? Uh, ben Fiscal, who's in 23rd place. That would be their other point scorer. So way down. He's had to actually come down onto pit road as well. So like you say, Netherlands don't really have that backup support. No, they don't. But at the moment, they are in a relatively strong position. And there's really aggressive defending here. Uh, I think Job van Oetrecht knows the score. He's got an Australian car breathing down his neck. And he knows that he has to try and keep him behind and hassle and make it as difficult as possible for Brett Horst in to get past. Brett needs to play the safe. He doesn't need to overtake. Get the team oh. manager onto him. Don't overtake. You're okay. We're still winning this championship. Don't make it too hard for yourself because if you do spin and lose those points, it will then go the way of the Netherlands as Van Oetrecht runs deep and wide through the Parabolica and Brett Horstein gets ahead. But this is the, the beauty of the Cup of Nations, uh, Ben. They're fighting for seventh and eighth positions, but this is the battle for the Cup of Nations, the World Cup in effect. Horsten slides deep under braking. He's going to have a huge slowdown to serve here. Wait for Job Van Oetert to slip on past again. Uh, and more so, not just him, but we're going to have uh, the Spanish car probably get past. And Marius Zug as well in the German car. Zug is the first one to have a go. He's going to go around the outside. And now you see Brett Horsten is in trouble. Manages to carry enough speed into the second chicane to keep uh, the position. And Marius Zug now is going to have to be patient because really the Lesmos are not places to run side by side at all. In fact, Zug goes into the gravel just that little bit, dips the wheel into the gravel. This is a really pleasurable corner as well. But again, scruffy from Marius Zug. And in fact, Danny Yucadella will take advantage of that. Spain are on the back foot. They're 50 points back after that horrible start from Danny Yucadella. But we've still got plenty of time. We've got about half the race still to go. And Yucadella starting to make progress here. And with Palu up in fifth position, if any of these Dutch or Australian drivers have any difficulties, that opens the door for the Spanish contingent once again. On board, though, with Verschur through the final corner. You can see he's tucked up behind the Canadian driver in front. Just four tenths of a second separating them at this point in time. Eleven minutes left to work in this race, and they're clear of Fildenez by one whole second. Yeah, now the points are... 100 points for the victory and 90 points for second. So if Richard Vershaw can get ahead of uh, Alex Ellis, that would then put them just eight points shy of Team Australia. And with Australia potentially struggling, especially with Danny Yucadella desperate to get past uh, into eighth position, okay, that is a, a five-point deficit. So yeah, that, that would then um, just leave them very, very close indeed. So really nothing is yet done we saw for sure lead and uh, it was taken away by a mistake so that alex ellis promoted himself 
Here is that second incredibly important little group. Yeah, very, very important as well. It looks like it's single filing itself out very much now throughout the, the the group. There's not really too many of those battle packs that we saw in that first race at Spa, for example. One of the few examples up on our screen right now, 18 points between Australia and the Netherlands and a further 26 points back to Spain. It's still wide open. Final 10 minutes then of this competition. Cool little battle also in terms of the championship between Portugal and GB. Uh, Portugal with Lobato in sixth, very, very strong, but Bradley Philpot uh, has points for fourth and Will Stevens has points for 12th. So if Stevens can get himself up a couple of spots, it would put GB back into fifth position uh, ahead of Portugal, who really, at the start of the night, you would have said were nowhere Portugal in those qualification races. They really struggled. Uh, but Lobato has been uh, doing better and better, and now Stevens does get ahead of Daniel Morad, and so that may change things and put GB ahead of Portugal in the standings, but still behind Canada. So when I was doing my prep for this uh, broadcast today, uh, Ben, I, I searched up the various Portuguese drivers. I couldn't find any details on one of them. And for the other two, I could only ascertain that they had a lot of TCR experience. Great to see them, though, stepping up to virtual motorsport and really enjoying themselves. They're proving to have a very fun battle on screen. But look at this side-by-side -side action right now. Richard Verschur has to defend from Phil Dinez. Yeah, and, the, and Phil Dinez goes through into second position, and that was all because Ellis was really weak through the Lesmos, and uh, Verschel was unable to make the deal done, and therefore lost a load of momentum, uh, and has allowed Bradley, uh, has allowed Phil Dinez to go up into second position. So it's more points lost for Team Netherlands, and that is not what they needed. Danny Cadella still hasn't managed to get past Horsten either. And this is Team Spain versus Team UK. Uh, so who, where are we looking at now? This is Bradley Philpott and Alex Palou. So Philpott, great start. Started in fourth position, got himself up onto a podium position, but now it's losing spot. Oh, look at that weaving as well. That Spanish car really tries to pinch Philpott to the inside. Ooh, side by side, they make it work. Philpott loses out. And now look at the queue of cars forming up behind as well. Yeah, that's good points for Spain but they need a uh, they need a lot more than that to get themselves up into P2 uh, in our championship in our standings and now a lot of defensive work and the more he defends the more he pushes everybody into that following group so Lobato's there Oiter at Horsten and Danny Yukadella it's a nice healthy group of cars but with the closeness of the racing comes jeopardy as well and there are people there are cars in there Job Van Oiter Brett Hoyston, who are very important to the destination of their nation, with only seven minutes remaining now. Job Van Oyter down the inside. He tries to take advantage. He's going to go through the gravel at Ascari. Watch this rejoin. Oh, that was very close. He'll now have to hold up and watch a number of cars make way down his inside as well then. Ellis and Dennis change positions. So Phil Dennis finally at the head of the field where he should really have been all day. Team USA getting the win by the looks of things, although he still has to hold on for seven minutes. Here's Job Van Oetroit, who now is behind uh, Australia. He needs to get back past. He needs to be aggressive with this pass as well. He knows to scare the Australian. Horsten to the inside, but they're still side by side. Is there going to be contact? No, nope. very clean driving between the two of them they're still side by side still side by side tension ramps up and there's the portuguese and spanish cars behind watching this bradley fullpot's checked out that was potentially some of the most aggressive defense i've seen horston has to escape through that shortcut he tried to block off job van Oetert all the way down and now with a slowdown continues to hold up the pack here big drama in front as well who's that around uh, Horsten drops down and oh and there was a car off on the left hand side that's the Portuguese and British so that's Will Stevens and Lobato they were fighting of course for fifth in the championship Portugal and GB Will Stevens recovering it to not lose too many positions but uh, yes there was a car ahead and it was Ellis that we lost Alex Ellis from P2 the Canadian has disappeared 
So he's down to six then. Phil Dinez inherits the race lead. He'll take this race win if he can hold off Richard Verschur. Here comes the race spot TV replay. Side by side, down into turn one. Trying to get past Phil Dinez. Locks that inside front and goes for a bit of a ride. But then, uh, obviously, by jumping across the chicane, had a massive slowdown because he dropped all the way to sixth position into this battle. So uh, that means Job von Oetreit has been promoted. Horsten, uh, after his issues, has dropped down. There's a Canadian car, I think, making a, having a bit of an issue. Alex Ellis with the same mistake down That's into Ellis turn number one. further positions. Yeah, whatever he's done to his tires here, Ben, uh, he's obviously overcooked them, just driving a bit too hard, still clearing a slowdown penalty. Ellis from the race lead is now down in P8. And now Junkadella gets ahead of Horsten. That's very important. It's so aggressive here. That was a really late move. Uh, and I think that was uh, another spinner further back. Oh, this is a replay, isn't it? It's a replay that's not a replay. Because um, that's Will Stevens getting into the tail of uh, somebody further back. Unless that was a completely exact the same crash than we saw before. We're not replaying? We are replaying. I'm confused. Not replaying. We're in live pictures right now. Oh, wow. So that was actually Will Stevens uh, having an accident that he had three laps ago in exactly the same place. Amazing. Um, so Lobato down to 14th now for Portugal. So I think GB actually will jump uh, Portugal, as will Team USA with Phil Dent at the head of the field and Karam in ninth position. Sage Karam carving his way through the field now, just uh, less than a second behind Alex Ellis in the Canadian car in eighth spot and I wonder whether he might be able to take some points out of the Australians as well. I still feel like this is not over with just a... Alex Ellis looks to the inside of Horston, can't find a way through there but suddenly I was saying that he did, Brett needed to drive within himself but suddenly I get the feeling that he needs to start pushing and attacking. Very much so as well. The points differential between the Australia and Netherlands is down to 19 points. And Spain on that fight back. Danny Youngkadea up into six. 36 po points back from Team Australia. It is still wide open. Richard Verschur, Job Van Oetert for Team Netherlands. They have to hold on to second and fifth. And still try and get some positions to challenge Australia while defending from Spain behind. Yeah, I see, that's the thing. Verschur's not going to have the pace, is he, to really get past Phil Dennis unless Dennis makes a mistake. Whilst Vershaw was leading, it looked like they were able to do it. Team Netherlands had the opportunity, but that 10 missing points by being P2 rather than P1 could well provide crucial. Though they have a huge deficit to build up. Uh, but again, kind of coming from nowhere, Team Netherlands. Uh, really a big surprise, both the Australians and the Netherlands tonight. It's not going their own way for Team Australia in this one. Matt Campbell down in 22nd position now. Waiting for the live points to get updated one more time. Just over two minutes left on the clock as Phil Dedez makes his way down in towards that second chicane for the penultimate time. White flag should wave next time around and Spain and Netherlands getting very, very close. Job Van Oetert and Danny Youngkadea. You can see on the right-hand side of the screen, Ben, the live point situation. It's still Australia in control, but one lap to go. Yeah, they still have the control 19 points the difference and really don't see how they can find those 19 points unless Phil Dennis makes a huge error he's taken two seconds out of Vershaw on that last lap alone Phil Dennis is flying at the head of the field and it's allowing Team USA to be P4 ahead of Team GB at the moment one of our t one of Bradley Philpott uh, or Will Stevens needs it's just a single position to get himself ahead of Team USA and get them into P4. That's kind of the best they can really hope for. And Spain still trying to now take points away from the Netherlands as well. Danny Ucadella in sixth. Job Van Oetreit going defensive, moving around. You really at the completely the wrong moment. That's going to compromise his entry. It's going to compromise his exit. It's going to compromise his speed all the way down the start finishing straight. And Danny Ucadella will uh, be very happy with that and he goes to the inside line rather than trying to go around the outside that allows him to that break that just a little bit later and claim the apex and there is a bit of contact between the two and Danny Yucadella goes around oh beautiful recovery hardly loses any time at all 
very nicely executed 360 where Bart Horston scampers his way down the inside and this will effectively secure Australia this title. Can he defend from Job Van Oyt at contact between Netherlands and Spain as they battled out hard? Australia then in the driver's seat. Yeah, Horsten lost, uh, sorry, Oiterit lost some positions as well. He didn't turn around, but as you say, Horsten up into fifth, Karam up into sixth. So that takes uh, the USA uh, a little bit further, uh, further up the championship order. And they will now have more of a comfortable uh, P4 and GB will drop down to P5. But we are on our final lap. So yeah, Phil Dennis has just got a couple of corners to go. He should have taken many, many more victories than he has done tonight. It has not gone the way of Team USA. But finally, on the last race of the night, Monza F1, Phil Dennis for Team USA takes victory and clouts the pit wall in appreciation. Waiting for the battle behind. It's going to be Spain, I think, the pick up P3 behind Netherlands in P2. But it is Australia who are going to win the Cup of Nations for 2021. It's been an up and down kind of a race for Bart Horsten. He took the victory at Le Mans. He had a third position at the Indy 500. And now he's taken a fifth in Monza in the F1 cars. That's pretty impressive. We need to see more of Bart. Definitely get him on the VCO Pro Sim Series. He really has flown the flag for Australia to allow them to take the victory. And uh, a very, very deserving victory it was too. Just waiting for a few cars to come across the line. Daniel Morad uh, still to finish. And Stefan Wilson now goes over the line. Ben Biskel really hasn't contributed too much to the uh, campaign for Team Netherlands this evening. Francisco Mora, Portugal, uh, ends up in 20th position. And what about Matt Campbell? Matt Campbell, the star of the show, really, for Team Australia. But for this race, only a 20-second finish. And in fact, we're still waiting for him to come across the line. Uh, he was nearly, nearly lapped by his teammate. But it is Team Australia. They were so comfortable in their victory at Le Mans. They were able to do a formation finish. A bit more frenetic here in Monza. And Bart Horsten throws the car around in celebration he's got uh, he's got himself an orange helmet like um uh like a powerboat racer always they have by regulation have to have orange helmets so they're able to be spotted if they do end up in the water uh, little fact for you phil dennis takes the victory ahead of richard vershaw doing all he could for the netherlands but just not quite enough alex palu in third for spain bradley philpot will be very happy with p4 for gb but Horsten recovers to P5 just ahead of Sage Karam, which uh, had a great drive from the back of the field. Then Jabra Neutroy and Daniel Yugdela, Rao Hyman in ninth, Alex Ellis, P10. And first of the Canadians. 20 seconds down in the end. He was leading in the middle of the race. Jesse Crone for Finland and then Will Stevens, the second of the GB. Nick Foster in Australia. He picks up points for Australia in 13th. Rafael Labato. In 14th, Ayer Agren in 15th. Robert Wickens for Canada's 16th ahead of his teammate Daniel Morad. Then Stefan Wilson, Bent Biscal, and Francisco Mora. Such was the challenge of those drivers. We only had 22 cars on the lead lap. Matt Campbell was the last of those cars. And then Marius Zug, who visited the pits after damage. Manuel Alves uh, and Tom Ingram. Germany just having a horrific night. Miguel Molina, Alex Alcrez, Alex Sepanen, Mike Rockefeller. He retired again. I think he retired out of every single one of the races. And it crossed out in 30th. And then the very unlucky Jens Klingman. He did do one lap uh, in this race and then retired. And finished in 32nd behind Bites Kibissa. Jack Crawford and Gennaro Bonavede uh, retired after the first lap. Uh, we saw that huge accident for Jack Crawford and there was no coming back from it. Well, that has been frenetic and incredibly enjoyable. I loved it. I mean, you take that two-day format, Ben, compress it down to one, get the best real-life drivers that we can find who don't have prior commitments as well. And I can't wait to go back and watch it all again because I was expecting to be watching from the sidelines. Paul Smith, a little under the weather, had to step out. I'm in. I suddenly have to watch some of these great guys dueling it out. I've really enjoyed spending my Sunday here at the Cup of Nations. 
Yeah, you did a great job. Really great to commentate alongside you. And uh, really, really well done to all the organization um, who have put together a, a very complicated format, but a format that ultimately we all understood, the pro drivers enjoyed, and they have, in most part, played along pretty fair. We did see the touring cars uh, coming out a little bit uh, in the early stages, a little bit too much rubbing perhaps. But when it came to the single seaters, there was nothing that they could do other than clean and race fair. And to be honest, a surprising champion for me. Uh, I don't know about you, uh, but certainly I was not expecting to see Australia take the victory. I predicted Team USA, and I guess I've got to sit here and uh, eat the bit of humble pie. What a performance then from Matt Campbell, Nick Foster, and Bart Horston. Right away from race number one, Ben, they stood up. They were one of the fastest cars on track, and competing with Team USA in that Group A for the most part, they beat them and really set the tone for the finals. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, obviously Joshua Rogers hopefully has been uh, following this a little bit and seeing his Australian flag being flown once again they are really becoming quite a force in sim racing in a way that the Netherlands were for many years. Uh, but now Australia, very much number one. Ojana, you've got uh, some drivers to interview. Let me just see if I want a copy here. Oh, there's some celebration going on. Uh, some very loud music going on there. We'll try and just uh, follow up with uh, the Australian team in just a few moments. Not sure, can uh, Ben, if you heard all of that noise going on. Uh, yes, that was uh, uh, in my in my noise cancelling headphones. That was noisy. Um, that was very very noisy. We are actually waiting for the the final points as well. Um, so we uh, wait for the race control to make sure everything is official. And let's go back to our job. So I'm standing by with your Cup of Nations Pro winners, Matt Campbell, Nick Foster, and Bart Horston. Mega, uh, mega congratulations, guys! And I'll start with you, Matt, because. I didn't necessarily expect you guys with relatively less sim experience compared to some of the other teams to really stand up there and be at the front for the entire competition. But it was you guys at the front, you guys setting the pace and a well-deserved victory here in the Cup of Nations. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, uh, I think we've got lots of experience over the, the previous lockdowns over the, over the past months and years. But uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun obviously joining Nick and Bart. Uh, it was the first for me taking part in, in the Cup of Nations and uh, you know, it was really enjoyable. We put in a bit of work in the last couple of days. Tried to do as much work as we could leading up to the events and uh, I think it really paid off. You know, we were consistent, uh, always up in front in all the races and, uh, you know, trying to stay out of trouble as much as possible, which was uh, difficult at times. And Bart, for you, it was a, a day where it was a bit up and down, but at the end, it was your drive that really helped secure that championship. Uh, battling with Job Van Oytert, how tense was it for you knowing that you couldn't really afford to be involved in any type of contact there? Yeah, uh, exactly right. It was uh, not a good feeling when I saw Matt go uh, falling down through the field because I kind of hoped that he could be in the top five, top three, and then I didn't have to worry about uh, finishing too high up necessarily. Uh, but yeah, I couldn't really defend that aggressively in that because I obviously I knew if if he hit me, then that was possibly game over. So yeah, I had to take the escape route a few times when perhaps I wouldn't have in other situations. But you know, in the end, I think just keeping the car on the racetrack was uh, all it really took. And final question then for, for you, Nick. It was not a bit more tough, I think, for you. You got involved in a lot of the mid-pack chaos that we didn't even let, uh, get to feature on the stream. But you're called the Apex Hunter. You didn't necessarily get to hunt too many Apexes. But what do you think is so special about the iRacing platform and this ability for drivers from around the world to get together and to have events like this where drivers from different disciplines come together for some really great racing action? Yeah, thanks, mate. Um, yeah, I was definitely the the anchor holding the team back and missing apexes out the back. So uh, only the one race I started at the front, we did any good. So that's all right. Uh, but yeah, the, I mean, the platform itself is mega, honestly, um, for the opportunity for all of us guys who, you know, uh, are quite a big spread of, of people in terms of, you know, drivers that probably don't usually race together. We all know each other from around the traps, but, you know, you got IndyCar guys racing with uh, Junior Formula guys and, and us GT guys. So, you know, it's really cool to be able to do that. And then, uh, obviously, through, you know, VCO and through some other platforms, we, um, we're doing the pro sim stuff. So, you, you expand a lot more. So, you know, the whole environment, the whole sim racing over the last, you know, 
probably probably more like three or four years, but it's only become really mainstream the last two um, has been really, really cool. So yeah, and it's awesome. Like absolutely stoked on this massive um, well done to, to Bart and Maddie. They sort of real carried it and uh, I just snuck a couple of points in there when we needed it. And uh, this, is, this is pretty cool. Well, congratulations, guys. I'm sure you guys all had a fun little weekend here and you'll go off and get ready for 2021 and the racing action ahead. Thanks for taking part and hopefully we'll see you in more VCO competitions soon. Cheers. Thanks, mate. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. So your race winners there and Ben, you could hear uh, some excitement there as we entered then and the music's in celebration. Nick Foster, I think, despite the uh, bad luck he had today, still enjoyed that very much. You always... Uh... Whenever you talk to an Australian, they seem to have a great time. Even if they're having the worst day of their lives, they're always seemingly happy and, uh, and just kind of a pleasure to chat to. So uh, really cool to, to hear the enthusiasm from these pro drivers in this sim world. And that's exactly what VCO and the Cup of Nations Pro is all about. The crossover between the virtual and the real, taking real world drivers, sticking them in the virtual world for a good time. I suppose in Australia, it's Monday morning right now. Uh, but for the rest of us, it's been a fantastic Sunday night. <laughs> yeah, it really has. And hopefully we'll get those final points up on your screen. Race Control still working to try and confirm them. I think here they are, though. Australia with 502 points. The Cup of Nations 2021 Pro Champions, Netherlands in second and Spain in third. Yeah, in the end, 35 points, the difference between Australia and Netherlands. So they did lose out a little bit. They were as close as 16 points in that last race. Spain were as close as about 30 points, but they also lost out with Dani Ucundela spinning. USA beating GB. Uh, that was a bit of a fight with Portugal dropping to sick. They were fourth mid of that race. Norway didn't really show their hand too much. Canada, disappointing, to be honest, with some really star names. They'll be uh, frustrated with eighth position. Finland in ninth. Germany. They need to get some better uh, better team members in there for the next one. Uh, and really a horrible night for Jens Klingman and Mike Reckenthal. I think they retired out of every single race and Maris Zug, the only man to pick up any points. Uh, South Africa, again, Raul Hyman. It would be nice to have had Callan O'Keefe. I think they would have had a very different night if South Africa had had Callan alongside them as well. Well, you notice, Ben, the two teams that only had two drivers further down the order, and I guess it's just because in this type of a format with so much action in the mid-pack, if you get caught up and drop to the tail end of the field, if you don't have a teammate that's ready to be there and take a nice healthy chunk of points for you, you're always going to struggle. And as we look forward to more of these events in the future, because this will not be the last Cup of Nations, I'm sure the event organizers are looking at tweaking this event format even more. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, a big thanks to Williams Esports, to VCO, to Racebot TV and to everyone behind the scenes because there's a big team of people to get all these drivers organised uh, throughout all of the different races and platform, uh, race control and uh, of course Williams Esports for coming up with the idea in the first place and VCO for promoting it. If you want any of those photos, by the way, do head over to the VCO website. They are available for free. Once again, a massive thank you, Arjana, for, for joining us this evening uh, as a commentator. It's been a real pleasure to commentate alongside you. Uh, and uh, uh, I hope that uh, everybody will enjoy uh, the next edition, whenever it may be, of the VCO Cup of Nations. Germany, the first victors for the Sims, and the first pro victory has gone to Australia. G'day, mate. <laughs>